Graphic Audio. A movie in your mind. Graphic Audio presents Marvel's Planet Hulk by Greg Pak. Copyright Marvel. Narrated by Richard Rowan. With performances by Bradley Smith, Ken Jackson, Kara Novak, Scott McCormick, Bruce Allen Rauscher, Kimberly Gilbert, Zeke Alton, Lolita Horn, Peter Holdway. Alejandro Ruiz, Jason B. McIntosh, Chris Genabach, Jeff Allen, Lily Beacon, Terence Aselford, Jacob Yeh, Michael Glenn, Christopher Sheeran, David Jordan, Dylan Lynch, Evan Casey, Eric Messner, Thomas Keegan, Eva Wilhelm, Drew Kopas, Nora Ashradi, Katie Karkoff, Thomas Penny, Marnie Penning, Michael John Casey, Angie Cornett, and Greg Pack. <gasps> the puny human opened his eyes. He lay in a crater in the middle of the desert, chest bare, pants shredded. He couldn't remember a thing, but his muscles tingled, alive and burning. <laughs> he knew what had happened. He'd smashed. He could still feel the sting on his knuckles, the tight thrum of joy in his heartbeat. It had been glorious and violent and entirely out of control. An image of shattering stone and glass flashed through his brain. The thrilling, vertiginous disorientation as twenty stories of concrete and steel twisted, swayed, and crumbled. He toppled buildings, destroyed a block, maybe even a city. Oh, oh God. Had he finally killed someone? He spun, rising to a crouch, as dust and sand swirled around him. A piercing ray of sunlight reflected off a curve of titanium and burned his eyes. A shuttle descended before him, engines blazing, turning sand to glass as it touched down. Its hatch cracked open, and a tall, thin figure shimmered into existence, his long arms impossibly extended, swirling around his body. This was the age of heroes, when humans and mutants and gods walked the Earth with unbelievable powers. Fantastic, amazing, uncanny, and strange. They had banded together to save the world, time and time again. A holographic projection of Dr. Reed Richards, the smartest man on the planet, with the ability to stretch his body impossible lengths in all directions, gazed down at the puny human and smiled gently. Bruce, how are you? Bruce Banner stared up at his old friend. Reed, what happened? What did... what did I do? Ah. Bruce's heart plummeted into his gut. Reed was brilliant, but he never could hide anything he was thinking. It's not your fault, Bruce. What the hell are you talking about? What happened? A rogue general tried to take you out, hit you with the Gamma Massive Ordnance Air Blast a mile outside of Vegas. You rampaged, tore into the city, smashed some cars, ripped up some streets, and then he hit you again. Wait, what? He bombed Vegas. Three buildings fell. Thirty-seven people died. Bruce stood in silence, swaying slightly. His head felt light, his skin cold. He was going into shock, about to pass out, or worse. Bruce, Bruce, listen to me. It wasn't your fault. You didn't bring down those buildings. You're not a murderer. You never have been and never will be. Bruce turned away and stared out over the desert. Thirty-seven people. He pictured their bodies. Imagined their relatives in the morgue, coming to identify them. Their faces breaking, their terrible grief flowing like blood from an open wound. And what about kids? Babies? <laughs> it didn't matter who pulled the trigger, who dropped the bomb. If he'd never come to their town, 
if he'd never entered their state, if he'd never existed. Bruce, we need you to get on board this shuttle now. There is an emergency in orbit. There will be time to mourn later. Right now, an alien artificial intelligence is taking over a secret Hydra satellite that controls 10,000 nuclear missiles. Do you hear me? We need you, Bruce. Reed's hologram stepped aside and gestured toward the shuttle door. You're the only one with the technical know-how and the brute strength necessary to handle this threat. Bruce blinked. His brain ran over Reed's words a thousand times in an instant, but he couldn't wrap his mind around them. What was Reed offering? Cracking open the door, filling the room with light, with hope? Thirty-seven people. <gasps> Bruce squeezed his eyes shut. Bruce, listen to me. You're a hero. You always have been. Now get in that shuttle and save the world. Reed smiled gently. Then his image shimmered and vanished. Bruce stood alone in the desert, staring at the gleaming shuttle. He felt the hot sun on his back. A hundred miles behind him was Vegas. Mayhem and blood and death and guilt forever and ever. But cool air from the shuttle's interior drifted over his face. Screens inside glowed with images and data streams of the threat in the stars. His brain had already begun to manipulate the information, puzzle through the code, find a solution. The door in his mind creaked open. Light filled the room. Save the world. A broken smile trembled on his lips. Amadeus Cho, a 16-year-old Korean-American super genius with a coyote pup tucked into his oversized army jacket, raced down the highway on his Vespa. Banner! You gotta get out of there! Now! He screamed into his headphone mic, his heart pounding with righteous fury as he stared at the sky. But high in the sky, the sun caught the shuttle's gleaming hole with one final wink. Then the engines fired, and the shuttle disappeared, blazing up into the stratosphere. Amadeus screeched to a halt and pulled a small tablet out of his pocket. He focused hard, staring at the code, puzzling through it. And his brain did what his brain did, and kicked into high gear like a rocket catching fire. Amadeus grinned. Inside the shuttle, Bruce blinked, confused. Banner! Can you hear me? You gotta hook the heck out and rip through the hole right now! It's all a trick! You've got 30 seconds before you hit the exosphere and... Reed's hologram shimmered before Bruce. Three other solemn shining heroes stood behind Reed. Iron Man, Black Bolt, Doctor Strange. So righteous, so just. I'm sorry, Bruce. I know it's not your fault. Like I said, you didn't kill those people in Vegas. But they're dead. Time and time again, your anger and power have endangered innocence. Someday someone could use you to threaten the entire planet. Bruce hunched, clenching his fists, feeling the blood surging through his veins and muscles. Amadeus had told him to hulk out, to let out the monster, to tear this stupid shuttle to pieces. But Amadeus didn't understand. He'd only met Bruce a year before, just after the Hulk had saved the boy from secret agents and black helicopters in the desert. They'd bonded for an instant. A puny teenager and a green giant, who shared impulse control issues, seemed to terrify everyone else on the planet. Amadeus loved the Hulk, thrilled at his righteous anger. But the boy had no idea what Banner was really capable of what the Hulk could do if he ever really... Banner pictured the Hulk tearing through the hole, tumbling through the sky, hitting the sand in a shower of fire and debris, and then grinning darkly and bounding east across the landscape, heading for the stupid puny heroes in their shining towers. He'd tear them to pieces, rip them out of the sky, and smash, and smash, and smash. <laughs> Banner fought his racing heart, fought the anger welling up in every cell in his body. Um... He scrambled through the countless mantras, prayers, and wards he tried over the years, all adding up to little more than one eternal word, echoing in a thousand different ways. No. I have always thought of us as friends, Bruce, so I am truly, genuinely sorry for the trickery. But for your sake and ours, we're sending you away. It's the only way we can be sure. I know that you must hate us, but I believe in my heart that this may be the greatest opportunity of your life. We've picked your destination carefully. A lush planet full of vegetation and game, but no intelligent life forms. 
There will be no one there to hurt you, and no one you can hurt. You always said you wanted to be left alone. May you finally find peace. Goodbye, Bruce. But Bruce Banner was gone. <laughs> Hulk stared at the stupid, puny humans on their stupid, puny screen. They talked and talked and lied and lied, and soon he couldn't hear their thin, buzzing voices over the furious pounding of the blood searching through his veins. <laughs> but he didn't need to hear them to hate them. Their floppy mouths opened and shut, and their moist eyes blinked, and he reveled in the titanic contempt and rage that filled him at the sight. <laughs> he smashed through their dumb, glowing faces <laughs> and tore through the hull of their stupid shuttle. Navigation errors. Life support failure. Cascade system collapse. The icy cold of space burned his skin, and he welcomed it because it made him matter. And the matter he got, the stronger he got. He felt the shuttle creaking and spinning. Red lights flashed, indicating navigation errors. Good. The stupid humans couldn't tuck him away on their stupid prison planet. He'd make it back, and when he got his hands on them, blazing light hit him, and suddenly he was burning. Were they shooting him into the sun? His heart leapt with fierce joy. <laughs> yes. Now he was even angrier. But then the fiery light split open and spun in a great clockwise torque, revealing its dark eye. And the shuttle tumbled into the yawning portal. Hulk felt his body stretched and pulled across light years in an instant. And then he was tumbling alongside the falling shuttle through pink clouds, sweet air filling his lungs. Hulk blinked. Giant pink tentacled creatures floated around him in the clouds. He bared his teeth, but the nearest alien just raised the tip of a tentacle and gently angled its long, squid-like head at him. For a split second, Hulk's heart slowed. Reed had said they were sending him to a peaceful world with nothing to hurt him. But then the Hulk crashed into the debris field beneath the portal hovering in the sky over the alien planet. A dozen yellow-shelled, six-limbed, insectivoid humanoids clattered their mandibles. Hulk grinned as their mismatched spears and blades bounced off his hide. Stupid bugs, just like the humans. Picking a fight, they'd never win. He could tear their crummy world in half. They couldn't stop him. They couldn't even hurt him. Then an insectivoid raised a battered blaster. The Hulk felt a searing pain in his hand. Green blood oozed from his knuckles. His eyes widened with shock. Huh? Now that he saw his own flesh sliced open, he felt it in his bones. Something had happened to him in that portal. On this planet, he could be cut, he could bleed, he could die. So he grinned again. Good. Governor Denbo of the Imperial Wukar province of the planet Sakar stroked the thin fleshy tendrils dangling from his chin. He stood on a bluff over the debris plain, watching as the huge green alien plowed through the pack of chittering Hiver scavengers. It was late afternoon, the hottest time of day, and the governor was uncomfortably conscious of the sweat trickling down his crimson skin beneath his helmet and armor. The green creature was one of the biggest aliens he'd seen fall through the great portal. It could bring a decent sum at the market. But the governor's head ached. He was a red-skinned imperial, a member of the dominant species on the planet. What's more, he was an oligarch. Stuck in the sticks, maybe, but possessing four chin tendrils and the rich crimson complexion of the best blood. He shouldn't be sweating like a fool in the field. He should be back in the mansion, soaking with his mistress in his peace pool, sipping chilled egg nectar. Kill him. Kill them all, sir. <sighs> oh. Never just a nice quick yes sir around here. Always the sir, with that little pause afterwards. It was Denbo's own fault. He was too kind, encouraging discussion, hearing out his subordinates. This is the first one I've seen who could even stand after passing through the portal. He might prove valuable. Hmm. The governor pursed his lips and narrowed his eyes, trying to focus. He'd noticed the size of the green thing himself, of course. He considered sharply informing the lieutenant of that fact, but then thought of how magnanimous it would be if he didn't. He listened to me, the lieutenant would say at the bar. He actually listened. 
The other soldiers would raise their eyebrows, then slowly nod. The governor smiled. Heat waves rising from the ground distorted the governor's view of the monster as it swung its huge fists, knocking a few hivers into the air. The monster reared up. The governor felt something shift in the pit of his stomach, and his eyes widened as he recognized the emotion. Fear. This, at least, was new. A sharp pain exploded beneath Hulk's ear. He pawed at the back of his neck, knocking away a small silver dart, but the pain ripped like fire through his skin, along his spine, and up to his brain. He turned to face the puny red-skinned man walking down the rise in his gold armor and funny plumed helmet. Then the nanobots burrowing into the Hulk's brain completed their work, and the alien's words became comprehensible. And judging by the comically moronic expression of surprise spreading over your face, I assume the talk bots have reached whatever limited organ you use for cogitation. So, hear ye, hear ye. I am Governor Denbo of the Wuka province, and by order of the Hero Protector and Lord Emperor of Sakaar, all detritus that exits the Great Portal is henceforth designated as Imperial property. Therefore, I claim... This isn't right! First picking... First finders! That's forever been the law! The law has changed, Hiver. But the Red King promised! His hunt destroyed our crops, and now the Wilza bots are coming! The life of our hive depends on the right to... Enough! Now, kneel! The hivers stared for a moment, mandibles grinding as they clutched and reclutched their swords and spears. But the governor's soldiers calmly leveled their glowing energy spears, preparing to fire. The hivers eyed each other, as if sharing some silent communication, and then all simultaneously shuddered, and slowly lowered themselves to the ground. A faint scent of burning leaves filled the air. We all have our problems. Now you, oh hideous green one, we're all impressed by your ability to remain upright after passing through the Great Portal. So your ship will go to the Emperor's scientists for further study, and you'll learn how to serve your Emperor. Let's begin with lesson one. On your knees! The Hulk stared up at the puny pink aliens on the hill. So small, but so smug. Always somebody yelling. You want the ship? Hulk's hands dug into the side of the shuttle. <sighs> the governor's eyes widened with surprise, and then the massive ship was airborne, flung straight at him by the green monster. And then the governor looked up to see the Hulk bounding through the air toward him. The Hulk doesn't kneel. The governor was 30 slabs overweight. He'd started growing an old man's fuzz on the tips of his ears. He got winded if you ran a half stone step in full armor. But four tours in the war against the Wildabots had taught him what to do with the terror he felt coursing through his veins. In one smooth movement, he unhooked his blaster from his belt. The last one tagged the Hulk square in the chest. <gasps> the Hulk's eyes opened wide, and his muscles went limp. The governor stepped lightly to one side. <sighs> Close enough. The governor turned, a thin smile spreading over his face. He pulled off his helmet, mopped the sweat from his bald pate, and executed a small bow. We'll stop the auction with these three hivers, Kim bonded and neutered! It was a thin crowd at the South Wukar border market. They're entering voluntary servitude to raise money for their starving hive. Plucks at the old hawk strings, doesn't it? Bidding starts at 15 silver squares. Please buy us, buy us that our hive may live. The Hulk opened his eyes. He was baffled and furious. Something felt outrageously, offensively wrong. Only when he tried to stand and the chains around his neck jerked him back to his knees did he realize what it was. His entire body ached as it almost never had back on Earth. Taking it easy, big c man. This was a small black-shelled hiver chained at his side. You freshling from Portal, 
Not so strong. Shut up! I'm the strongest one there is! The pain ripped through the Hulk's bones, and he fell to his knees again, seething with fury. Nothing could hurt the Hulk. Everyone knew that. What the hell kind of planet was this? Ha <laughs> ha! He's quite a prize, ain't he? Don't worry, folks. He can't break those Shadow Forge chains. But it's cute watching him try, isn't it? Sixty for the lot. That was a stocky, one-eyed Imperial from the crowd. So The trainer took the Imperial's silver squares. <laughs> Although, to be honest, I probably would have paid you to take Greeny off me hands. Little too unreconciled, you know? The one-eyed man smiled as the transport box descended over the monster and the hivers. That's why I want him. The first act needs a little juice. <laughs> the Hulk and the Hiver stumbled in the pitch black inside the box, losing their footing and falling against each other as the floor tilted. They felt themselves swinging through the air. Then the box settled. They were in motion, heading somewhere unknown. For the next three hours, the Hulk steadily, methodically, and brutally pounded on the inner walls of the box. Ignoring the wailing of the hivers and the terrible pain in his fists and arms and legs and the blood dripping down his arms. Stupid planet, stupid portal, they thought they could make him weak? The Hulk grinned to himself as he landed his 10,330th punch. But the Hulk was already getting stronger. He ripped through the metal wall of the transport box and blinked as his eyes adjusted to the light. He gazed up at the thousands of screaming spectators in the stands of the great arena. In the royal box overlooking the arena, Governor Denbo nervously eyed the handsome young emperor, who lounged in his golden throne, tugging idly on his chin tendrils. Like the governor, the emperor had the four tendrils and deep red skin of the most aristocratic imperial families. Denbo and the emperor were technically social equals. In the presence of Ankmo the Great, the current emperor's departed father, Denbo had often sat and laughed and chatted about nectar recipes and the best ways to trap a hiver queen. But no one sat in the presence of Ankmo's young successor. <sighs> Boring, governor. Boring. Any death's head in the guard could rip through an old cage. I thought you had something new. B -b -b Patience, your eminence. The governor immediately felt his stomach drop into his bowels. What kind of fool would tell the Red King to be patient? <sighs> the governor daubed his forehead to hide his relief. Maybe this was a terrible mistake. He treated his men to six rounds of egg nectars after taking out the green monster. They cheered him three times and told the story of his triumph to everyone in the bar. For the first time in years, Denbo had felt like a hero again. He'd gone home and lain smiling in bed and thought about the green monster, and finally placed a call to his mother's first husband's cousin, the Imperial Games Counselor. And now, as he sat in the presence of the Emperor himself, foolishly grasping for that little portion of the glory he always felt had been denied him, he suddenly realized that if he said the wrong word or laughed at the wrong moment, he might not live through the intermission. And now, citizens and oligarchs, act one of today's festivities. The governor had written those words himself. He eyed the emperor surreptitiously, cursing himself even as he ached for some glimmer of interest to flicker across the emperor's face. An exciting and educational interlude wherein we shall investigate the feeding habits of our planet's most ferocious predators. Down in the arena, the little black-shelled hiver blinked nervously. Eating habits? The Cavarantus mazorus, more commonly known as the Greek devil corker, thrives in the plains and deserts of Upper Vondro. The sand rippled like water, and the hiver scattered. <laughs> the Hulk clenched his fists, turning to stare as massive pink tentacles exploded from the sand to seize the nearest hiver. <laughs> of its lethal tentacles and spiked projectile tongue. A six-foot-long spike erupted from the sand to stab through the carapace of a terrified hiver. The Devil Corker's massive head burst up from below to swallow the hiver whole. That's new, isn't it? The Emperor raised a begrudging eyebrow, and the Governor felt a warm glow spread through his body. 
Three more yellow shelled hivers charged at the devil corker with their small spears, but the black shelled hiver shouted after them. Forget your hive, soft shells! Now's the time for dodging, running, hiding! The devil corker's tentacles seized the incoming hivers. <laughs> the corker's harpoon tongue cocked back in its great maw. The black shelled hiver scrambled away, shaking his head. I'm telling you! Telling you! <laughs> But then, a green blur flashed past him, and the Hulk's great hands seized the nearest thrashing tentacle. The yellow-shelled hivers tumbled free as the Hulk ripped the tentacle loose from the Devil Corker's body. An actual breeze rippled across the arena, from the air displaced by 10,000 sets of lungs. The Emperor raised an eyebrow. The Governor's heart pounded. Then six more tentacles wrapped around the green monster, and the Devil Corker crammed him down its throat. We're getting back to boring, Governor. My apologies, Your Eminence. I'm sure the second act will... A chunk of hot flesh hit the Governor in the cheek. Oh. He turned in shock to stare down at the arena as the Hulk ripped his way out of the belly of the Devil Corker and raised his fists. <laughs> the Emperor leaned forward, eyes shining. <laughs> The governor eyed his king, beaming in exhilarated relief. Meek, the little black-shelled hiver, stared in amazement at the Hulk. In his miserable 14 seasons of life, he'd never seen anything survive a devil corker attack, much less kill one of the monsters. Meek watched the Hulk turn, <clears throat> spitting out a chunk of devil corker flesh, and Meek's six hearts fluttered with an unfamiliar, but absolutely glorious, fierce gladness. Two more Devil Corkers erupted from the sand. The Yellow Shelled Hivers fell to their knees in terror, but Meek leaned down, seized a blade, and charged forward. Stupid jackworms! He grabbed the Yellow Shelled Hivers with his other three arms, trying to drag them to safety. We will not Kim with you. I'll never ask for Kimming, you dumb cringes! Just shutting up and running! Meek felt the sand shake beneath his feet. The Devil Corkers were too fast. So stupid. Meek, so good at running and hiding and staying alive. Dying out in the open like this? But Meek saw the Hulk crouching behind him, picking up a great battle axe, staring sullenly. Meek grinned and ran directly at the Greenskin. The Hulk's eyes widened as Meek closed in, the two Devil Corkers just behind him. The monsters fell to the ground, tentacles thrashing as they died. You're trying to trick me, you little punk! Hey, hey! No more fighting! It's all being over! Listen! He turned and sped all four arms, grinning at the crowd. The big cheers! All for us! The Red K King! You're pardoning us now! Oh, Red King? The Emperor! Meek pointed up at the throne. His planet? We just living here! The Hulk stared up at the Emperor. The Emperor, still reclining, stroking his tendrils, stared back, a small smile on his cruel lips. The Hulk's eyes narrowed as he recognized Governor Danbo whose mouth opened and closed three times in stunned shock. The Hulk leapt up toward the throne. His muscles screamed. Every cut on his body split open again. He never felt this much pain in his life. But he grinned. Finally, he knew who to smash. Blazing blue energy ripped across the Hulk's body and knocked him back down to the sand. He struggled to rise, but was unable to control his spasming muscles. The smell of his own burning flesh filled his nostrils. A seven-foot-tall, gray-skinned shadow warrior stepped out from behind the Emperor's throne, lowering her smoking stun gun. The governor, smiling and trembling with relief, stepped back, giving her plenty of room as she drew her twin-bladed shadow staff. She paused before leaping to the arena floor, one foot on the railing, looking back at the Red King. By your leave, my lord? No. Wait. The Red King rose from his throne, and a broad, smug smile spread over the royal visage. I'll take care of this one myself. A huge, chipped sword and a battered shield landed in the sand before the Hulk. You could have been pardoned. I might have even made you a citizen. But instead you tried to kill me. And for that, your Emperor thanks you. Because this is going to be fun. <laughs> The Emperor descended from above in a flash of gold, the jets on the boots of his massive armored suit blazing. He swung a great sword, rippling with blue energy. It's up to you, monster. Die on your feet, or take it on your knees. 
The Hulk picked up the battered sword from the sand. The Red King smiled. <laughs> the Hulk slashed wildly. The Red King's smile faded. The beast was much faster than he expected. But the jets on his armor fired automatically, shifting him backwards. Don't disappoint me now. You can't win with brute force. The Red King swung his sword. Jets fired in his gauntlet, thrusting the blade toward its target, augmenting the power of his attack a thousandfold. <laughs> the Hulk's shield shattered from the impact, and the Hulk felt the bones in his forearm grind and crack. I'm the strongest one there is. The Hulk's vision blurred as his heart pounded with terrible rage. If he'd gotten this angry on Earth, he'd have exploded with unheard of strength. He could have split mountains, shattered tectonic fault lines, broken the whole damn world. But on this stupid planet, his rage only blinded him. If you want to have any kind of chance, you have to be smarter, faster. The Hulk lunged forward, swinging his sword. But the Red King's auto jets fired. He dodged the attacks, shooting around and behind the Hulk, then seized him by the shoulder and swung around to land in front of him. The King's sword flashed. Like so! Bright green liquid jetted into the air. A sharp line of pain ripped across the Hulk's cheek, and he realized he was watching his own blood hit the sand. And so! The Red King spun, slashing through three of the cringing yellow-shelled hivers. Their severed heads tumbled across the hot sand. <laughs> Meek charged at the Red King's back, spear leveled. He wasn't hived with the others. He wasn't hived with anyone. He'd learned time and time again that no one on this planet would ever sacrifice themselves for him. But he smelled the Hulk's blood spattering in the dust. He scented the Hivers' terrified chemming as they died. He smelled the Red King's pheromones firing with fierce, smug joy. And he couldn't suppress the righteous rage that surged in his heart. The Red King turned toward him, grinning, blades sparking. And Meek knew he was going to die. <coughs> then the Hulk's elbow slammed into Meek from the side, knocking him out of harm's way. Back off, bug! He's mine! The Hulk lunged at the Red King. Too wild, too slow. The Red King dodged for the third time. <laughs> the monster doesn't learn. The Hulk played the Emperor's own trick, grabbing the Red King's shoulder from behind and swinging to land back in front of him. The Red King touched his face, stared at the blood on his fingers, then looked up at the Hulk in shock. Hulk slash... The Emperor fumbled for a grip on his slippery sword hilt, suddenly slick with blood. The Emperor felt his bowels shift. He saw himself falling, saw the Hulk's rusty blade hacking down through his shoulder, splitting him in two, saw his viscera spill out onto the sand, saw his citizens and servants and slaves screaming and crying, saw his dead father towering over him, roaring with laughter. The Shadow Warrior slammed into the sand between the Hulk and the Emperor, raising her Shadow Staff to block the Hulk's blow. The Emperor winced. He knew the Hulk's attack would have shattered his battle armor and hewed through his bones, but the Shadow Warrior held her ground, feet planted, unmoving, as the Hulk's sword ground against her staff. Uh, don't be stupid. I'm Kyara the Old Strong, the Emperor's warbound shadow. You're a quick study. But you can't beat me. The Hulk stared into her strange eyes, with their green irises surrounded by inky black. <sighs> this isn't your world. <clears throat> Not yet. <clears throat> Kayara stared at the monster. He was an alien, freshly fallen through the great portal, and he had no idea of her power. But she could feel his heartbeat reverberating through the ground, steady and true and utterly fearless, and she realized that she had no real idea of his true strength either. May he who dies, die well. They shifted in the sand, eyes locked. She saw him sizing her up, measuring her stance, planning his own moves. Already he felt his sword easy in his hand, as if he'd fought with it for years. A quick study indeed. She realized she was smiling. <laughs> Then, blazing blue energy ripped through the Hulk, and he crumpled unconscious at Kaira's feet. Ah, this fight was mine! Who would... A black-armored Death's Head robot lowered its smoking gun. The Emperor patted the guard's shoulder, giving Kaira a breezy smile. Now, now, old strong. Can't have my shadow upstaging me, can I? Behold, 
the Lord Emperor and hero protector of Sakaar grants this slave his life. The governor of Wukar trembled as the Emperor returned to his golden throne. These next seconds would determine everything. Should he beg forgiveness? No, never. That would imply the Red King had been embarrassed. Nothing could be worse. Congratulate the Red King on his victory? Even though there was no victory? No, the Emperor loved praise, but he was smart enough to hate sycophants. That left only the greatest risk of all, to speak like an adult, a trusted governor to his king. To treat this tyrant like the leader he had never been? He bled you in front of the crowd, my lord. Is it wise to let him live? Who said anything about letting him live? He's going straight to the mall. <laughs> the emperor gave the governor a wink and settled back in his throne. The governor stood stock still for an instant, shocked beyond belief at his astounding success. Then he inclined his head and slowly walked to his post at his emperor's side, studiously maintaining what he hoped looked like the wise, canny smile of a newly minted royal counselor. His heart soared. The Hulk awoke in darkness, surrounded by hivers in a lumbering, tilting transport box. Meek stood at a small, narrow window in the side of the transport, orange light reflected in his yellow eyes. Listen to Meek. Nobody looking out the window. A yellow-shelled hiver immediately peered over Meek's shoulder. I said don't looking! The Hulk shifted forward, shoved the hivers aside, and peered through the slot. Before them lay the maw. A giant pit lined with prison cells and guard towers. Overseers on floating disks monitored the action down in the pit as gouts of magma erupted upwards and massive lava monsters lunged at armored gladiators. What are you crying about? The Hulk's eyes glittered, reflecting the fiery magma. <laughs> this is gonna be fun. Deep in the Caves of Size, in the northern Wukar range, seven of the eight prefects of the Sakarian Democratic Insurgency sat around their council fire in their ragged mufti, continuing the same interminable conversation that had dragged through each of the twelve seasons of the Red King's reign. The Emperor's war is getting too expensive. He's raised the Hiver's tribute again and denied them first pickings beneath the Great Portal. It's time to approach them about an alliance. Our fathers and our fathers' fathers tried that. The bugs don't think the way we do. They won't fight. Nor will we, apparently. The time isn't right. You saw what happened when the garrison at Embo resisted. He took out the entire town and no one did a thing. Including us. What if we'd stood up? What if we'd done something? No insurgency in history has ever survived without massive popular support. It's not yet time. But it is. A young Imperial approached the fire. He was the fifth prefect, last of the group, arriving late to the meeting. I come from Crown City. You, you haven't heard, have you? What? You know the security protocols. No communicators are permitted at Council. Well then, look at this. The fifth prefect held up a glowing recording disc. Grainy images of the Red King sparring with the Hulk glimmered in the firelight. The Emperor entered the arena yesterday to slash the cheek of a slave who defended him. And the slave slashed back. The rebels stared at the little disc, watching a thin spray of the Red King's blood spurt outward as the Hulk's blade whistled past his face. The Red King's blood. No one said the words aloud. They ached for it in their bones... Yet who among them had ever dreamed he would actually see the tyrant bleed? Who had ever dared imagine the sharp joy and fear they all felt at this instant? But in his armor, the Red King's untouchable. No one has the power to... The fifth prefect gazed at the Hulk's roaring face on the recording disc. This man has the power and the will. And when we find him, so will we. The prefects sat in silence listening as the crowd's cheers rose from the recording disc. The crowd, the people, their people, cheering for the blood of their king.
Primus Band, a stocky Imperial with two chin tendrils, an eye patch, a steel skull plate, and 330 separate scars, hovered above the maw on a floating disc as his guards unlocked the transport boxes strapped to the backs of the Dramath pack lizards. Three loads of new slaves stumbled out of the boxes onto the center field of the maw. Primus ran a practiced eye over them. A few big bruisers, including the green hulking monster who'd made such a stir in the great arena, and a bunch of soft scared chaff. Didn't look like much. But Primus had been in the game long enough to know, not to make too many predictions. This Hulk had managed to scar the Emperor, but the toughest looking monsters were often the first to crumble in the Maw. And every once in a while, the puniest Pinky might have the medal to survive, or even conquer. Primus had proved that himself, years ago. He suppressed a smile. Sakaris and help him, after all these years, he still loved it. I am Primus Vand. I spent four undefeated seasons in the Imperial Arenas, and was granted my freedom by the Emperor's father, Angmo the Great. If you do as I say, you may learn the skills to seize the glory I have tasted. But this is the Maw. The Empire's most lethal gladiatorial training school. And the Maw must be fed. Primus pointed his obedience staff at the slaves. First lesson. When I say kneel, kneel. Primus's staff sparked. The Hulk looked down at his chest, seeming to notice for the first time an oval disc with a shiny black center implanted over his heart. He grabbed at the disc. <laughs> and it blazed with blue arcs of energy. The other slaves twitched, clutching at their own discs, and fell to their knees. But the Hulk just clenched his jaw and stared up at Primus. Give it up, slave. You've been implanted with an obedience disc. Fight it too hard and it'll fry your brain. The Hulk ground his teeth and stared at Primus as his obedience disc sparked. Primus thumbed the button on his staff again. The disc throbbed. <laughs> The Hulk fell to one knee. Primus smiled tightly and pointed his staff at the rest of the slaves. Criminals. Traitors. Slaves. Monsters. No one on this planet believes you deserve to live. But apparently, some of you still have pride, as stupid as that may be. Some of you might still believe you deserve respect, even glory. But what will you do to seize it? Excuse me? The middle-aged Imperial was dressed in the long silk robes of an oligarch, but his face was bruised, his clothes ripped and soiled. A seven-foot-tall Imperial giant, apparently his bodyguard, stood at his side. A shell-shocked young Imperial woman hunched just behind them. I am Ronan Kaifi, a citizen of the Empire and an elected representative in the Community Congress. Does the law mean nothing? I demand to know what I'm charged with. I demand a trial! I demand! Primus Vand leveled his obedience staff and fired a blaze of blue energy at the man, instantly reducing him to smoking black ash. <laughs> the Imperial Giant's obedience disc blazed. He froze, glaring at Primus, fists balled, every muscle straining. The Giant turned to shield the young Imperial woman as she reeled, turning pale pink with horror. Twenty-two have entered this field. Only seven will leave it. He gestured, and one of his men dumped a great cart full of battered weapons from a floating disc onto the field below. Fight or die! Meek and the yellow-shelled hivers instinctively hunched close to the Hulk, the closest thing to a friend they had in this new world. On the other side of the field, the Imperial Giant nudged the young woman closer to a group of terrified Imperials standing near a giant humanoid who seemed to have been hewn from craggy yellow granite. The Hulk stared at the Rock Man, the only other prisoner close to his size, then leaned down and picked up a massive chipped sword. The Imperials, Meek, and the other Hivers quickly scrambled for weapons of their own. We getting this! Everybody fighting together like before, right, two hands? Get away from me! Come on! All of us needing everyone! And something else strange. Primus saying 22, but Meek only counting 16. Shut up, bug. But the Hulk's eyes were locked on the Rock Man, who finally leaned down and hoisted a great axe. The Rock Man pointed silently at the Hulk, and only the Hulk. The Hulk grinned. The grown-ups are talking. The Hulk lunged forward. Ah! Meek was at his side. 
The rock monster and the Hulk slammed into each other. The rock man caught the Hulk's blade in one hand. They grappled with each other, thrashing in the middle of the field, knocking other combatants to the ground all around them. The Hulk tried to free his sword, but the rock monster dropped his axe and seized the Hulk's arms with both massive hands. Hulk, Fred! If we work together, we can... The Hulk twisted, kicking the rock man's feet out from beneath him, then raised his sword, point down. But before he could drive the blade home, great teeth closed around his shoulder, cutting to the bone, and clawed tentacles covered in chitinous armor lacerated his face. He spawned, clawing at the flying monstrosity attacking him. It launched back into the air. The Hulk's own blood ran into his eyes, but he caught glimpses of more of the flying monsters tearing into Hivers and Imperials on all sides. We are Brood from Brood World. The Brood Monster lunged back at his face. <laughs> you are lunch! So have a sandwich. <laughs> Hulk smashed the Brood and shattered its teeth. Blood sprayed, bodies split, bones shattered, bright eyes went dull, mashed into the sand. And then, Primus Van raised his staff. The Hulk's obedience disc blazed, and he crumpled to his knees. When he looked back up, he saw six other slaves kneeling among the bodies of the fallen, splashed with gore, battered and bleeding, but still alive. The Imperial Giant, the young Imperial Woman, the Rock Man, a tall gray shadow warrior, one of the brood, and little Meek. They warily pulled themselves to their feet, eyeing each other as they shifted in the sand, preparing for whatever might come. You seven have survived the cut. From now on, you're a team. Sleep well. Tomorrow, it gets worse. Guards swinging obedience staffs ushered the seven survivors into a cell, crammed a few chunks of half-roasted, three-legged trizel into the cell, and left them in the darkness. The young Imperial woman hunched against a wall, staring blankly at the ground. The Imperial giant sat beside her, eyeing the others with suspicion. The brood dragged a chunk of the meat into a dark corner and began to feed. The rock man and the gray shadow warrior just sat quietly. Meek picked at his obedience disc. <laughs> if none of us can pull it out, what makes you think you can, tiny bug? You won't last long, will you? Please do minding your own business. All alone. No more hive mates to protect you. So sad. So sad. Meek sat up straight, staring at the brood with sharp, hard eyes. Never having hive. Never needing one. But you... He tilted his head, sampling the air, and smiled thinly. Mm. I'm killing you. You calling out for your sisters, but no answering. They're being dead, all chopped up and stabbed in the sand. You're the one who won't be lasting. The brood stared at him in silence. Her muscles coiled and tightened, causing her carapace to click. The hook raised an eyebrow. A sharp, acrid scent was rising from the brood, a dark mix of sadness and fury. She shot forward, great mouth opening wide. <laughs> But the rock man's massive stone hand closed around the brood's neck, and her teeth clamped shut in the air, a few inches from Meek's face. I'm Korg. I could crush any one of you. But if I did, we'd be one fighter short tomorrow. And then we all might die. Like it or not, we're depending on each other. Korg gave the brood a significant look. But then she slowly relaxed, and uncoiled her tentacles and claws from Korg's arm and shoulder. He relaxed his grip on her neck, and she jerked away to scuttle back to her dark corner. So let's talk. Names and skills. Korg caught Meek's eye and gave him a small nod. Meek smiled back, then stood up, smacking his small chest with two claws. I being Meek, unhived and not caring. Skills? Four-handed fighting, stealing, hiding, skulking. The others just stared at him. But speaking up seemed to have given Meek new confidence. He turned to the brood. What about you, big bug? The brood's bitter scent grew stronger. I am brood from brood world, which is no more. No queen, no sisters, no name. You've seen what I can do. No name, then. Korg turned to the shadow warrior, who sat cross-legged, head inclined, eyes closed, as still as stone. 
Black scars marked his forehead and zigzagged down his cheekbones from the corners of his eyes, lending his face a tragic aspect that his stoic demeanor only enhanced. He won't talk to us. He's an unbound shadow, still in his desert gear. His days are silence and prayer, but when the time comes, he'll fight like nothing you've ever seen. And who are you, giant? Captain Lavinsky, formerly of the Imperial Guard. My employer was Ronan Kaifi, representative of the Fifth Regional Community Congress. The man the trainer killed. My father. Can the little one fight? My name is Eloe Kaifi. I... I won the school vaulting championship two years ago. <laughs> the giant put a gentle hand on her shoulder. I don't know much about fighting. She looked up at Korg, and her eyes seemed to focus for the first time. She blinked again, and her brow furrowed, as if she were taking a tally of the different emotions fighting for her attention. Her eyes hardened with anger. But I'll learn. Good. No. Stupid. The others turned to the Hulk. He was bruised and battered, with gashes all over his body. He looked exhausted, as if he might collapse or just fall asleep at any moment. But aside from Korg, he was still the biggest monster in the room. You say we can't survive on our own, so we have to fight together, as a team. That's right. But we've all seen how this world works. What happens when it's time to kill each other? Korg stared into the Hulk's glittering green eyes, and suddenly grasped that the next few seconds would determine the rest of his life. The green skin was making his decision, and depending on how the neurons fired within whatever brains he possessed, this could be the end. The monster could go for the kill, right here, right now. And Korg could hardly fault him. If it should all end today, so be it. Korg had done all he could do, as well and as fairly as he could manage. A great calm filled him, as he slowly clenched and unclenched his massive fists. We both know what happens then. But until that day, we're friends. Korg felt the air in the chamber shift. The Hulk lowered his head onto his crossed arms. Wake me up when it's time to fight. The tension leaked out of his massive frame. Korg looked over to see the Shadow Warrior easing a blade back into its scabbard. The Shadow Warrior caught Korg's eye and gave him a small smile. So, friend. Meek glanced around the room, grinning. Eloway smiled back at him out of reflex, then scowled. <sighs> then slowly smiled again. Yeah, friends. Hulk woke to the sharp pain of his buzzing obedience disc. He shuffled to his feet, eyeing the others as they lined up before the guards, noting with mild surprise that everyone had survived the night. The guards marched them through dank tunnels to the door leading to the Maw's central arena. The Hulk felt the heat even before they left the tunnel. They were heading to the lava pits they'd seen when they first arrived. You're a team, remember? Primus Vand was once again on his floating disc. Let's see if you can fight together! The Hulk and Korg stood side by side, staring into the magma. Huge bubbles rose and popped, sending flumes of hot toxic gas into the air to sting the Hulk's eyes. And then the surface rippled as something massive rose up from below. Lava monster! We saw it when we arrived! Anyway, get behind me! There's no way to survive! No! This is something else! The form burbling up from the lava had split into three great mounds. Whatever they are, they're big. Greenskin, we'll double-team the first one, see what it's made of. Everyone else, oh! The first of the creatures stepped out of the pool, magma dripping from its stony face and shoulders. Vargas! I thought... I thought you were dead! Korg stepped forward, reaching out. Brother! The dead-eyed creature swung its great stone fist and pounded Korg to the ground. <laughs> The Hulk charged forward, breaking his sword on the monster's shoulders. Oh, uh, Marcus, please. He can't hear you. He fought his disc too long. His brain's gone. Two more dead-eyed rock men attacked the Hulk from behind. He spun, pounding them, but only split his knuckles on their stone hides. Korg, they're not breaking. We needing you, standing together. Not against my brother. I can't. You will. 
Hulk grabbed Korg by the arm. The Hulk swung Korg through the air like a massive club, smashing through the thing that had been Margus, who exploded in a fireball as the living furnace deep within his chest ruptured. Thought you might be hard enough! Korg knelt on the ground, stunned, clutching at fragments of rock from his fallen brother. Lord, I am your rockling. Forgive me and protect me. The other dead-eyed rock men trundled toward them. Korg staggered to his feet. The Hulk stepped up to his side. All right! You crack him, and I'll smash him! On a ridge high above the Maw, the fifth prefect of the Sicarian Democratic Insurgency peered through his scope at the mayhem at the edge of the lava pool. That's him all right. What do you think? The truth? The fifth prefect and his scout were huddled behind a boulder, at least three stone steps from the Hulk. But the fifth prefect felt the ground tremble every time the Hulk landed a blow. As he zoomed his scope in on the Hulk's snarling face, every night horror he'd ever felt as a child surged up in his gut. I'm scared as hell. Primus Vand strode through the Maw's armory. Up, you lazy, flarking blood slugs! <laughs> he kicked the chairs out from beneath the napping smiths. Panicking workers scrambled to their furnaces as he raged, veins popping from his neck. He's gonna kill us, isn't he? We're all gonna die. Actually... The chief smelter shoveled coal into a furnace while sneaking a look at Primus. I've never seen him happier. Seven sets of armor! Primus smacked the assistant smelter upside the head. And the good silver alloys! Not the knockoff shadow stone. Shined and buffed. And stick some damn feathers on top. <laughs> Finally got something worth showing off, sir? Primus stared at the old man, then pounded him on the shoulder. <laughs> the assistant smelter stared in disbelief, then lowered his head and heaved shovelful after shovelful of coal into the raging furnace. The warriors stood in silence in the sand as the armorers crowded around them, strapped the gleaming still warm armor onto their arms and legs, and presented them with newly forged swords and axes. Slaves and guards paused in their exercises, staring at the Hulk and his team with a strange mix of fear and envy. Meek stood proudly, preening, running a claw over his new silver skull plate. But then he blinked, staring at the plumes rising from the helmets on the other warriors. Why Meek not getting feathers? Feathers are for soft skins. <laughs> the brew tapped her own naked skull plate. <laughs> Shut up and listen! Primus gazed down at them from his small floating disc. They stared back up at him, immobilized by their obedience discs. But he could see the hate burning in their eyes and the corners of his mouth twitched in the faintest of smiles. He felt a warm glow in his chest, a strange emotion he hadn't felt in years. Pride. You're gladiators now. Make the most of it. Now get on board! They marched onto a huge floating disc that rose into the sky and winged out over the blasted plains toward the setting sun. Korg stood alone at the far edge of the disc, the sun at his back, leaning on the railing. Lord, I am your rockling. Forgive me and protect me. Lavinsky slowly approached him. Korg, they would have killed us all. The green skin did what had to be done, and so did you. Korg stretched out a hand, letting tiny fragments of his brother's crumbled yellow body drift out over the plains beneath their speeding transport. Rockling to stone, stone to sand. Find him and keep him, O oh Lord. On the other side of the floating platform, Meek sidled close to the Hulk. All your people being as strong as you two hands? I don't have any people. On your world? No more like you? No. Just puny little humans. Like Banner. Banner? The Hulk's hands clenched around the railing. He felt the metal slowly bend in his fists. Banner. Hadn't thought about him for a while. But if Banner hadn't been so stupid, the Hulk wouldn't be here now. That's how it worked, every time. Banner getting into trouble, then running away and letting the Hulk take the blame. Who's Banner? You'll never see his face. He wouldn't last a minute on this planet. He's even weaker than you. <laughs> weaker than me? I'd like to see that. 
Yes, you might not. Humans aren't quite as weak as he pretends. I've eaten a few individually. I admit, they're practically defenseless. But with their machines and their heroes, they can overcome considerable challenges. Their machines and heroes won't save them. From what? <sighs> but the Hulk just stared out over the horizon with faraway eyes, a small, cruel smile playing over his lips. He felt the wind on his face, the comfortable heft of the sword at his side, the now cool armor sitting heavy and strong on his shoulder and arm. He saw the soft, wet, blue-green eye of planet Earth hanging in space. He saw himself screaming silently, raising his great sword, plummeting down through the stratosphere, catching on fire. He saw Reed Richards and Tony Stark and all the other stupid, puny humans turning to stare up at him in pale terror. Hey! An Imperial Pleasure Cruiser! The Hulk turned to see a great, yacht-like airship floating through the pink clouds. Sleek Imperials in silks and finery crowded along the decks, holding drinks and fluted crystal glasses, cheering and waving at the gladiators. Those used to be our people. Now they've come to see our blood. S or theirs. The brute pointed to a group of ragged Imperials running from their floating disc as it descended to the golden fields below. No. No, 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 those are just farmers. She turned to the others, shifting her body to block the gap in the railing that served as the exit of the floating disc. We are not, we are not killing those people. We'll do what our control discs force us to do. Korg stared out at the forest line. But we have bigger problems than your farmers. Last week, the fierce green gladiator earned his first wound from the Emperor himself. Now, after a stint in the mall, let's see how he does against the Chalene Plains' most lethal pack of Wildebarns. The floating disc skidded across the field of orange grass as a half dozen huge robots exploded from the forest. Each robot was a massive patchwork of limbs, blades, guns, armor, and treads scavenged from a dozen different machines. The biggest robot was a 20-foot-tall monstrosity covered in rust and moss. This particular pack is led by a giant bot the locals call Eggbreaker for its predilection for crushing hiver hatchlings. But it's not just the hivers that picks up. At last count, it's killed 43 farmers and two squadrons of Imperial soldiers. And today, it might just add seven gladiators to its list. LOA jumped from the disc, swinging her sword to hack down a shrieking cat-sized Wildebot before it sank its blades into a fallen farmer. Come on! We have to stop them! Lob and Ski and the Shadow Warrior drew their blades. <laughs> and jumped down to join LOA. The Hulk stepped forward, sizing up the egg breaker, but before he could attack, Korg reached out and grabbed him by the edge of his spiked shoulder armor. <laughs> the stone man grinned. Just returning the favor. <laughs> Korg spun like a discus thrower and slung the Hulk up into the air, straight toward the egg breaker's biggest roaring maw. By the prophet's knee! The Eggbreaker! The Eggbreaker is broken! In a single blow! A single blow! The green scar has locked its head clean off! This is one for the record books, folks. Three seconds to take out a Wildebot that Imperial forces have been hunting for three years! The Hulk grinned, standing on the Eggbreaker's shoulders. <laughs> and swung his axe to lop off the robot's remaining two heads. <laughs> then he jammed his shield into a crack in the Wildebot's armor, cracked it like a clam, and tore it clean in half. A huge blaze of blue energy erupted as the Eggbreaker's batteries ruptured. Then the two halves of its great tank-like body fell to the ground. <laughs> gallivanting group of gladiators is moving in for a piece of the action against the Eggbreaker's pack. Call your friends, call your enemies. Everyone on the planet's gonna want to watch this one.
As the sun slipped behind the horizon, gleeful hivers and imperial farmers picked through the wreckage of the fallen wildebots. On any other night, the hivers and imperials in this valley might have fought over any redeemable scrap of metal or machinery they found. But tonight, there was enough for everyone. For the first time in months, both communities would sleep in peace, knowing that their hives and villages would soon be filled with a kind of wealth no one had seen since the rule of Angmo the Great. They laughed and shook their heads, marveling over this green scar, and they waved to the pleasure cruiser as it glided from the valley. In the pleasure cruiser's great hall, the gladiators sat in chairs of honor, digging into the steaming roasted Chilean water bees that lay in the center of the captain's table. Only Korg refused the meat, dining instead on a bucket of coal he'd requested from the kitchen. The captain had given a speech, singing the gladiator's praises. The imperial guests now tittered with excitement, their eyes shining. But none were quite brave enough to get within arm's reach of the warriors. Ridiculous. Eloway forked a second great helping of water beast onto her platter. It's the Emperor's responsibility to deal with the Wilderbots, and he's using gladiators to do the job. Too much talking, not enough eating. <coughs> Meek ripped another leg from the carcass. Seriously, what's the army for, Ski? What's he doing with the money he's been collecting? But Ski had turned to a table attendant, who was gesturing toward a pair of Imperial Duchesses who giggled and blushed at him from a silk-draped doorway. One of the hall attendants came alongside the gladiator. You have been chosen... for what? <laughs> well... Well, indeed. Ski blushed, turning an even deeper shade of crimson. I, uh, might be able to get word to your father's allies. Oh, just go! <laughs> As Ski passed from the chamber, the Hulk caught sight of a pair of green and black eyes peering at him from the dark hallway. Kayera the Old Strong pointed at him. Careful, Greenskin. <laughs> But the Hulk rose from the table to follow the Shadow Warrior out of the chamber. You don't have an obedience staff. I don't need one. Kayera stepped through red curtains into a dimly lit chamber. The Hulk followed her, eyeing the great round bed behind her. <gasps> but Kayera spun and lunged, aiming a blade at his throat. <laughs> He caught her arm just before the knife bit into his neck. You're gonna try to kill me every time we meet? I'm the Emperor's shadow guard. I need to know his enemies. You're getting faster. And stronger. Maybe. But I could still cut off your head. And I'd rip you in half before it hit the ground. They stared at each other. Each could feel the strength in the other's sinews. Each knew no lies had been told. Kayera stepped back and sheathed her blade. What do you want? You're about to become famous. And that's a problem for the Emperor. So I'm here to buy you. She walked to the great oval window in the wall and pointed out over the plains. I'll take you to the steps, a place of peace. You'll never have to fight again. <sighs> Heard that one before. He saw Reed's face on the screen in the shuttle and felt the old rage firing up under his skin. <sighs> No thanks. Think again, Green Scar. You'll always be a monster to them. The Hulk pushed the curtains back and stepped out of the chamber, startling a group of duchesses. They backed away and stared at him with big eyes. He headed back to the banquet hall. The crop insurance program's target rate of return... The Emperor lay in his favorite lounging room at the top of the Imperial Tower in the center of Crown City. He was listening to the day's news as read from a recording disc by the former Governor Denbo, who'd achieved his ludicrously ambitious dream and now wore the white robes of an Imperial Counselor. Counselor Denbo kept his voice steady, but his fingers trembled as he scrolled down the face of his recording disc. He'd held this new position for a week already, but he still felt his blood run cold with fear whenever he was completely alone with the Red King. And community representative Kaifi continues to protest the increase in tribute. Kill him. Oh, wait. Here's an updated note. We already have. Eh, my will be done. Counselor Dembo considered letting out an audible chuckle, but didn't trust himself to sell it convincingly given the pounding of his heart. He settled on a small smile and a nod, and continued reading. Now, about the Wildebot problem. The gladiator teams are actually making some progress, but three more hives have been wiped out. They're just bugs, Counselor. 
I want to talk about the war. The Fillions are laughing at us. It may be time for the spikes. <gasps> the spikes, my lord? Your grace, a word? Have as many as you like, my Kyera the Old Strong. The Hulk lives. The Hulk? Who's that? The Greenskin, your grace. The one who marked you. The Emperor turned to stare at Denbo, whose skin faded to a dark pink. The Counselor's fingers began to tremble uncontrollably, and he hid them under his robe. He went into the moor, I thought. The Emperor ran a finger along the scar on his cheek. Which he survived. And now his team has triumphed over a Wildebot tribe in the Chalene Plains. Well, good. The Emperor turned to him. Eyebrows arched in surprise. Denbo forced a small smile, heart pounding, shocked at his own boldness. It's how the system is supposed to work. Even a slave has a chance. The people know their Emperor is fair. This is proof. The Emperor smiled, but narrowed his eyes at his new counselor. Tricky, tricky. Your Grace, the people are talking. You're starting to annoy me, my dear. What difference can one slave possibly make? Denbo fought to suppress the giddy grin threatening to spread over his lips. The Emperor had actually listened to him, and now was chiding his own shadow. Denbo studied Kayera's stubborn expression on the talk screen, and felt his heart surge with joy as he realized she was just getting started. The more she annoyed the Emperor, the more Denbo's own star would surely rise. He could barely wait to hear what she would say next. But as Kayera opened her mouth to speak, the Emperor turned to the Counselor with a surprised look on his face. The Shadow appears to have gotten herself into some trouble. <laughs> Apparently so, Your Grace. <laughs> Denbo's heart pounded with joy. The Fifth Prefect's mission proposal had been rejected unanimously by the other seven Prefects. The third prefect had even taken him aside after the meeting to ask for his personal assurance that he would abide by their decision. The fifth had put on a show, ranting about the other's short-sightedness, but allowed himself to be calmed by the third prefect into accepting their decision. But the minute the fifth had left the Cave of Sighs, he'd called his ten best soldiers and told them the time had come. In his first life, the fifth prefect had been a guardsman, a member of the Crown City garrison, sworn to protect the lives and property of citizens. His father and grandfather before him had both been guardsmen. His father had even died in the line of duty, saving a family from a burning house in the last year of Angmo's reign. So for as long as he could remember, the fifth prefect had felt destined to serve. But the Red King had purged the guardsmen, replacing its leaders with his own personal soldiers, sworn to protect him and only him. When the 5th's unit was ordered to execute a group of theatrical performers who had supposedly mocked the Emperor during a children's puppet show, he dropped his gun and walked away. When the Emperor found out, he had the 5th Prefect's entire unit executed. And so it was that the 5th Prefect found himself leading his team of insurgents through a smoking hole in the side of the pleasure cruiser, in the first attack of what would eventually be known as the Green Scar's War. Green Scar! We are the Sakarian Democratic Insurgency. We fight for the outcasts, the slaves, the discarded, and the despised. We fight for you! The Hulk and the other gladiators, still feasting at the captain's table, stared in shock. Will you fight for us? Imperial guards charged into the chamber, blowing spears leveled. Yeah. Eloy leapt forward, slamming into the guards from the side and knocking them to the ground. Now we'll really fight! But the Hulk just stared back at her, not moving from his seat at the table. Hulk, come on, there's no time to wa A trio of Death's Head robots burst into the chamber, shoving the guards out of the way. Enemy, targeted. They overwhelmed the rebels in seconds, slamming them to the ground with bone-shattering force. Hulk, we have, we have to help! Do what you want, I'm gonna finish my dinner. What's the matter with you? The Rebels are the only ones trying to fix this fratzed up world! They need us! Enemy! Targeted! Puny pinkies! But the puny humans! First they call us monsters, and then they come crying for help. And then they call us monsters again. Enemy! Down! Uh? A Death's Head guard seized Eloy by the elbow. <coughs> the Hulk finally turned and stood. Enemy! Down! She's with us. No, I'm not. 
The Death's Head guards hoisted the bloody, battered rebels from the ground and dragged them down the hallway along with Eloway. Despite the rough shoves from the guards, Eloway stayed on her feet and kept her back straight. She never looked back. An hour later, the Hulk and the other gladiators stood on the observation deck of the Pleasure Cruiser, watching Imperial Dreadnoughts bomb a small town on the horizon to oblivion. A crowd of oligarchs watched with appreciation the more spectacular explosions. Who are they burning? Meek addressed his question to a pair of bored-looking guards standing off to the side. Fish in town. Koranen. Retribution for the rebel attack. Crazy. Those rebels had high street accents. They came from Crown City. Koranen's closer. The guards eyed the Hulk warily, tightening their grips on their spears. He held their gaze for a moment. Then shook his head, turning to stare at the fire blooming on the horizon. Eloy was my charge. I never should have left her alone. There was nothing you could have done. She chose her path. And she's the only one who chose correctly. You're offlanders, so maybe you don't care. But 30,000 citizens have disappeared since the Emperor took the throne, vanished without a trace. And that doesn't include the hundreds of thousands of slaves and foreign soldiers who have died in his fretzing wars. Lavin gestured at the flames on the horizon. None of that's new, you know. I was with the Imperial Guard. I fought in the wars that ruined this world. The wars that leveled a hundred cities like that all across the continent. Those rebels would have killed me on sight if I'd been in the room. But if I thought it could help them... I'd cut off my own right arm. All right, young blood. Enough crazy talk for one day. Primus Van stood in the doorway, holding his glowing obedience staff. But he didn't thumb the button. Instead, he stared at the group with quiet respect. Your fight with the Wildabots made the premier view box feed. The Imperial League has taken notice. So get some sleep. Tomorrow, you hit the big time. The next day, as the sun dipped beneath the horizon, the pleasure cruiser drifted over the spires of Crown City and descended toward the great arena. The duchesses and oligarchs on the pleasure cruiser's upper decks grinned and waved as the crowds in the arena cheered and whooped in deafening waves of noise. Primus Vand thumbed his obedience staff and the gladiators leapt from a hatch in the pleasure cruiser's belly to the sands below. The crowd screamed even louder. The gladiators spaced themselves out in the sand, preparing for whatever might come next. Then the pleasure cruiser lifted away, and the arena announcer's voice filled the air. Welcome to the great game, citizens and oligarchs! Featuring the world's finest gladiators vying for the planet's greatest prize. Any slave who survives three rounds becomes a citizen. Yes, a citizen of the Empire, with all the rights and responsibilities that entails. And probably, I might add, a lucrative endorsement contract with one of the better sword and shield manufacturers. So this is it. Three rounds and we're free. You really believe that? Thousands of people are watching. Even this emperor of yours would hesitate to break his word before a crowd this big. The gladiators looked up in shock. What do you say now? A massive armored starship loomed over the arena. It dwarfed the pleasure cruiser, which floated off to one side. That's... that's an Imperial Dreadnought directly overhead. If I remember correctly, this ship just saw action in the Emperor's War, bombing the Philian Barbarians. The hatch on the bottom of the Dreadnought opened. By the sweet prophet. A massive bomb tumbled free of the hatch. Shield the others! Wait! Greenskin! It's too much... even you can't! I'm the Hulk! The Hulk was leaping skyward toward the falling bomb. Down below, the stone man hunched, spreading his arms over the brood, who wrapped herself around Meek. Lord, give us our cracks. The flames exploded outward, enveloping the entire battlefield and surging up into the ground floor standing room section, instantly burning 32 slaves to death. The other spectators reacted in terror as the blistering heat wave washed over them. Unbe Unbe Unbelievable! 
unbelievable. That was a precision death fire bomb detonated in the middle of the great arena in the center of Crown City against gladiators armed only with swords and shields. That's a gross violation of the rules. I've never, never seen it. Primus Van pushed past the guards toward the games counselor standing at the front of the Emperor's empty box. I've put hundreds of silver squares into this team! You can't just change the rules and slaughter them like fetching air jellies! Emperor's game, Emperor's rules, Primus. Don't give me that! I demand! No th one demands anything from the Red King and lives. Now, stand ready with your obedience staff. We don't want your slaves getting out of hand. Primus stared at the counselor, his jaw set. He imagined swinging his staff, smashing in the counselor's skull, then getting his two guards with a blade hidden in his boot. He'd killed 213 men and monsters in the arenas, seven more on his own time. He knew he could take these three in seconds. But then the six guards on the balcony would fire, and that would be the end of it. <sighs> They're not slaves. They're gladiators. He turned his back on the counselor and walked back down to the railing to watch his champions die. Smoke and embers filled the arena. Korg staggered to his feet. Meek and the Brood uncurled from the hollow in the sand beneath him and scuttled free. The Shadow Warrior leaned over Lavin's ski. Lavin's right arm was a jagged, scorched stump. Targeted. Korg turned as a platoon of black-armored robots advanced on them, red eyes shining through the smoke. Death's heads with laser cannons. Lavin clutched his stomp, rearing up to get a better look. This is... this is the end. Hush now. I'm a soccer priest. You'll want a prayer. Enemy. Targeted. No. I want a sword. The shadow priest stared, then smiled. He pressed a sword into Lavin's bloody hand and helped him to his feet. The gladiators crouched behind their shields, squinting through the smoke at the incoming robots. Enemy targeted. Death head. Troops who killed the spikes. Our shields will hold for a couple of seconds at the most. Stay behind Korg until we're close enough. Their armor's most vulnerable around the joints. Throat shots would be best. Strike true. Won't get a second chance if you miss. May the Prophet forgive and embrace us all. Enemy. Targeted. The gladiators charged forward. The laser cannon fire shattered the gladiator's shields, melted their armor. Korg felt a cloud of someone else's blood splash across his face. Lavin was right. This was the end. Enemy. Dead. The Death's Head guards spun in mid-charge, turning to look over their shoulders. The Hulk, scorched and smoking, exploded from the haze, seizing the nearest robot and ripping it to pieces, as if it were made of dry leaves and twine. Enemy. Mad. The guards raised their cannons in unison, focusing on the Hulk. But he lunged through them with shocking speed, ripping apart their guns and forearms before they could fire. The guards converged on the Hulk, stabbing him through with spikes and spears, but it was too late. This wasn't the weak, stupid Hulk who had first stumbled out of the garbage dump beneath the Great Portal. This was the Green Scar. Kyera the Old Strong, standing behind the empty throne in the Emperor's box, stared, her face blank with shock, as the Hulk leaned back. He roared over the fallen bodies of the Death's Head guards and the 10,000 citizens and oligarchs in the stands of the Great Arena roared back. The gladiators sat in a dark prison cell beneath the arena. Just five of them were left now. The Hulk, Korg, Meek, no name the Brood, and the grim Shadow Warrior. Lavin Ski's dead body lay before them, wrapped in bloody rags. With but one arm left, he raised your sword. We commend him to you, O Prophet. Forgive him and embrace him. Forgiving him and embracing him. The city above hummed with their names. Citizens, slaves, and oligarchs alike recounted their battles and laughed and shook their heads and debated and celebrated. 
The Vidbox ran interviews with the farmers and hivers who had seen them destroy the Wildabots the day before. The gambling chiefs scrambled to update their rankings and odds, sick with excitement and worry as the stakes skyrocketed. But there was no captain's table for the gladiators that evening. No celebratory meal, no tumbles with duchesses. They had been marked, and they knew it. So they sat in silence in the dark, staring at Lavin's corpse. Tomorrow, we dying too, huh? If it is our time. <clears throat> Meek turned to the Hulk, expectantly, but he just stared into space, sullen and silent. No name coiled and uncoiled. Open your ears, little bug. You saw much today, but I've seen far worse, and lived to tell the tales. Her lips drew back, and she showed her great, terrible fangs. But then, her wings fluttered, and the air filled with a new scent, dark and warm, and full of promise. The gladiators gazed back at her, and Meek grinned as she began her story. My sisters and I were Broodworld's greatest soldiers. Warriors Prime, they called us. When invaders came to our world, puny humans, but dangerous with strange mutant powers. The Queen sent us after them, deep into the catacombs below the throne city. But in the twisted tunnels, there lived creatures far more fearsome than any mutant or brood. Great monsters with fangs a hundred times longer than mine. My sisters and I were swallowed whole. We began to die slowly and horribly, digested alive. But the catacombs held an even greater threat. A presence, a fire, a light. And you know how much we brood hate lights. I can't tell you what it looked like. None who saw it lived to describe it. The superstitious said it was the vengeful soul of a long-defeated enemy. If a brood stood in its presence, it would judge her, call her a monster, and burn her to crystal. Inside the belly of the beast that had swallowed us, burning in its digestive fluids, we heard rumblings, great cracks, and shifts. The soul had broken free, judging all it touched. It killed my whole world. But my sisters and I lived, safe inside the monster that had swallowed us. Now a crystal vessel in which we sailed to this new world. So I escaped the wrath of a vengeful ghost. How could a mere king scare me? <laughs> Meek rocked on his hind legs and punched Korg in the shoulder. What you saying now, Korg? Korg smiled. The little bug was so tiny, so vulnerable. Yet he'd survived this long, hadn't he? Yes, the Emperor wanted them dead, which meant they almost certainly would die. But they should have died today. And the day before that. And the day before that. The furnace in Korg's heart rumbled, and his eyes glowed warmly. Want to hear a real story? My brothers and I had flown to a small world, strange and green as the green sky himself. I was a young brick, strong and wild, ready to conquer. So I attacked the first moving thing I saw, but it just flopped over and wilted. Later, I learned they called it a tree. When we saw our first sentient native, my brother Margus... Shouted, do not slay him. He must be captured and studied. The creature was short, and his skin looked as soft as jelly. He wore a silly hat with silly little wings over his bushy yellow hair. But he slung his little hammer and chipped the very stone from our flesh. He tore it through the bars of our strongest cage and smashed our mechano warbot like it was made of glass. So we fled, filled with shame like fresh-cut rocklings. How could we conquer a planet of creatures such as he? But if we'd stayed just a bit longer, we would have learned the truth. He was the only one of his kind. Indeed, he was a living god, the Lord of Thunder. So I fought the heavens themselves, and all it cost me was a few chips of stone. Why should I worry about what a mere emperor throws at me? 
Meek capered and drummed on Korg's shoulders with glee. Even the shadow priest's lips flickered with the faintest of smiles. Meek danced before the Hulk, who sat stony-faced in the dark. Okay, two hands. Your turn now. All right. I told you about the puny humans. No matter what I did, no matter how much I helped them, they hated me. Because I'm the strongest. And they're weak. And the weakest of them all. The one who hates me the most. Banner. Tricky thing is that Banner's smart. One of the smartest. He figured out how to bottle me up for years and years. And he went to work trying to make things even stronger than me. One day, he finished a bomb. The worst bomb ever made. A thousand times more powerful than the Emperor's stupid bomb. It could level a city, make it big enough, and you could destroy the world. And what do you think he does with it? He tries to kill me. But I didn't die. The bomb just let me out. I got stronger. And stronger. The strongest one there is. Let the Red King drop every bomb he's got. He can't beat us. <laughs> Meek jumped up and down, even in and out of the fire, scattering embers. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Meek telling one next. Meek all alone, hiding in the alleys, creeping and skulking and stealing. Nobody helping him. Nobody caring. Matter of fact, everyone trying to killing him or slaving him. Until Meek meeting you. Hulk saving Meek from the Red King. Cork saving Meek from the Brood. Brood saving Meek from the Killer Bomb. Everybody helping everybody. So, who caring about the Red King? Meek deciding. Being like Ski. They cutting off three hands. Meek still holding sword in last one left. Fighting for friends. Meek now stood over Lavin's body, breathing hard. All six hearts pounding. One fist raised. The fire cast his shadow against the wall. It was huge. The others stared in silence. I've heard enough. The shadow priest stood, looking down at Meek. Meek stared back at him, defiant eyes flickering in the firelight. The shadow priest gave him the faintest of smiles, then turned to gaze at the others. Let us be war-bound. In life and death, the oath that cannot be broken. The Shadow Priest knelt and placed a hand on Lavin's chest. He was Lavin Ski, protector of Eloe Kaifi and hero of our second trial. We who honor him speak our true names and bind to each other forever. The Shadow Priest gazed at Meek, who stared back with shocked, liquid eyes. Heroim the Shamed, Shadow Warrior and Saka Priest. Meek was eager but unsure. Heroim inclined his head toward his hand on Lavin's chest. Meek extended a claw and rested it on Heroine's hand. Meek. Unhide. Last one living. A heartbeat passed, and then one of the brood's tentacles uncoiled and rested atop Meek's claw. No name. Warrior Prime of Brood World. Korg's heavy hand joined the others. Korg of Krona. Son of Okorg and Ahana. Brother killer of Marcus. The Hulk stared at the stack of strange hands, claws, and tentacles. He thought of the puny humans. He had stood with them like this more than once. Iron Man, Thor, Captain America, and the others. And later, Strange, Namor, and the Silver Surfer. Avengers and Defenders. Even the kid, Amadeus Cho. They all talked so pretty, with so many promises. They even believed them while they made them. But every time... Every damn time, it ended with betrayal and smashing, and stupid puny humans screaming monster. But today, the Hulk looked up at the faces of his fellow gladiators, and all he saw were monsters. Deep inside, the tiny voice screamed, No! But the Hulk laid his hand 
on the top of the pile. <gasps> Hulk. Warbound. Yes. Warbound. Whatever may come. Kayera walked down the damp hall to the receiving hold beneath the great arena. A trainer leaning on the side of a big transport box looked up and grinned. Scarring the king? Surviving a death fire bomb? Wiping out a squadron of spike slayers? You have to admit, it's quite a story, Lieutenant. A story that never should have begun. They say it began long ago. They're talking, you know. The Emperor can burn all the scrolls he wants, but the old legends are hard to forget. You're a shadow. You know what I'm talking about. Watch your tongue, or I'll take your head. Tut, tut, Lieutenant. I'm on your side, remember? And I brought you what I promised. The green scar may have started this story, but the silver savage will end it. Kaira appeared into the narrow window of the box. The chrome-skinned gladiator inside looked up at her with white shining eyes, and her heart shot to her throat as her father's oldest prayers skipped through her mind. Sakarsan, hear my cry. My eyes are burning. My heart is cold. My night is filled with death. Sakarsan, hear my cry. <laughs> what did I tell you? Looks just like him, doesn't he? Like the old legends say. <laughs> Kaira's hand flashed, palm out, and the trainer flew back ten feet and hit the wall. The silver savage looked up. But Kaira had the trainer's obedience staff in her hand. Tell me, where did you come from? Who are you? The silver savage gazed back at her with eerie calm. I am not who you wish or fear I might be. Who are you? I am Norin Rad of Zen La, a world where 10,000 years of steady progress culminated in a paradise. No war, no crime, no illness. Everything the greatest philosophers ever dreamed of. And I hated it. I grew up in perfection. But I longed for the brutal, grasping past I could only read about in our Historiscans. The age when heroes struggled, explored, discovered, and fought. Fought for survival, fought for knowledge. I wandered the museums, studied the old sciences, the crumbling starships that had been retired when our ancestors made peace and heaven on Zen La. I dreamed of adventure and darkness. And then the darkness came. Its name was Galactus, the Eater of Worlds. Of all my countrymen, only I had learned how to fly our old starships. So I alone went forth to fight him. I stood before him, tiny and helpless. And I knew I would die. But I shouted, No! He stared at me with his unknowable eyes, and he gave me a choice. He would spare my world if I became his herald. And I was transformed. I became the Silver Surfer. I saw galaxies crumble and new suns aborning. I dreamed a thousand worlds, walked with their heroes, fought against their villains. All the power of the cosmos flowed through me. But the emptiness only grew. Before, I'd longed for danger. Now I channeled the power cosmic. And nothing could touch me. And then I felt your great portal. I could have escaped its pull as easily as you turn from a breeze. But it called to me. I needed to find out why. When I awoke, I was in chains. The portal had weakened me. I was vulnerable as never before. My captors pierced my flesh, implanted their disk through which they could control my very will. And then I learned why I had been called. Forced into battle in your pits and cages, I fought and killed again and again and again. You gave me what I once wanted. A world where I could feel what it is to struggle, to strive, to fight for life itself. Behold, the paradise for which I always ached. For this gift, I hate you. 
Almost as much as I hate myself. Kaira pulled back from the window, aching with relief and disappointment all at once. Kind of a bummer, huh? The trainer kept his distance, but grinned as he rubbed his bruised hip. I'd hate to think the real Sir Carson would be such a whiner. Kayera turned her back on the cage and headed back down the tunnel. But the people won't hear him talk. They'll just see him fight. And when he's done, they won't even remember the green scar's name. The Tong Tong drummers circled in the sky on their floating discs over Crown City as the sun rose like an angry red eye. Down in the residential sector, the nectar mongers grinned as they set bottles in doorways. They'd knock off early today and head for the show. The triple drum call meant the Emperor had pronounced a public holiday. It was gonna be a bloodbath for sure. Guards with obedience staffs floated over the Great Arena Central Field as thin, sickly Imperials the slaves too weak to be gladiators raked and smoothed the sand. They'd been working all night, filling in the huge blast hole and picking out the shards of glass created when the Deathfire bomb had melted the sand. But as the sun rose, a scarred slave caught sight of a twinkle of green in the sand, light reflecting in a pool of the Hulk's blood. And something else. By the Prophet. Shake a leg, blood scum. Or do you want us to feed you to the green scar for breakfast? The slave bobbed his head deferentially and knelt, angling his rake to dislodge a chunk of rock from the sand. But as he stood, he surreptitiously tucked something into his ragged shirt. The neighboring slave noticed the move. What is it? An Eli Halal vine. He felt the green petals cool against his chest. It grew. He paused, unsure whether he was about to speak holy words or blasphemy. But the hidden petals fluttered and he felt a strange calm spread through his thin frame. He smiled for the first time in eight seasons. It grew from the blood of the green scar. By the time the sun cleared the great arena's eastern wall, the stands were filled to capacity. The four tendrilled oligarchs sat in their shaded boxes, chuckling and gossiping. The citizens and free servants mingled in the lower stands with vendors selling snacks and hastily printed green scar banners featuring stylized silk screens of the Hulk's roaring face. Five silver squares? That's outrageous. That's what real green ink costs, citizen. Old stock, imported from Philia before the war, guaranteed never to fade or run, <laughs> just like the green scar himself. <laughs> But most raucous of all were the slaves in the standing floor boxes. The games counselor had worried that the standing tickets wouldn't sell after the incineration the day before. But the slaves of Crown City had never seen one of their own cause so much mayhem. They crammed into the boxes shoulder to shoulder, giddy with anticipation, singing and chanting and muttering coded jokes, then bursting into laughter. Guards with obedience staff stood over them, weary and nervous. Everyone in the stadium wanted blood. Whose blood was the question? In the Emperor's box, the games counselor nodded to the new announcer. <coughs> Three guards stood behind him, uncomfortably close. The sun hadn't yet fully burned off the cool morning air, but the announcer's fingers were damp with sweat. Don't worry. The Emperor wants a show. The Green Scar! The announcer felt his heartbeat quicken. He'd spent his career on the regional circuit providing commentary for desultory bloodbaths and half-filled mud pits. This was his first time working the great arena. The first time he felt his ribs reverberate as 10,000 voices shouted in unison in response to his words. Despite everything, he actually smiled. The Green Sky! survived them all, smashed the Wilderbots, and won their first two rounds in a great arena. But just who are all these horrific heroes? Let's give it up for the mighty grey shadow warrior, Heroin the Shamed. The fabulous winged brood from Brood World. Gotta love that lady's smile. Korg the Cronin, Sakaar's favorite new hunk of rock. Meek, he a 
unhived, the scrappiest, luckiest little bow on the planet, and the man himself, the king of smash, the hulking hammer of horror, the green scar! The warbound stood in the sand, sunlight glinting off their shining armor as wave after wave of roaring cheers washed over them. The Hulk scanned the crowd with narrow eyes. He'd heard the sound before. He knew how little it was worth. Meek eyed the Hulk, mimicking his grim stance and expression. But then he scented the warm, musky smell of insectivoid pheromones, and he began to pick out small groups of hiver slaves in the stands, clicking and cheering, calling his name. Meek the Unhived, who had spent his life alone and hated without a kind word or touch, tilted his head and raised a fist. High in the hangar atop the Emperor's Palace, the Chief Minister of Imperial Science gestured to the Hulk's shuttle, which sat on blocks as a dozen inspectors probed its mysterious insides. The damage is extensive, Your Eminence, but we've already recovered some interesting scraps from the databanks. His people apparently had as little regard for him as we. They tricked him into the shuttle, no doubt with the intention of killing him. If we can figure out how their technology works... <coughs> <coughs> Counselor Denbo gave her a meaningful glance, and the minister trailed off. The Red King stood with his back to them at the window, staring out over the railing, deaf to all but the thunderous cheering coming from the great arena below. I should be down there. Ah, but you are, Your Grace. The authority of the Emperor pervades every aspect of the games. You know my meaning. He cut me. It should be me who kills him. If you kill him, you make him a hero. He's just a monster. Let him die like one. The Red King slowly nodded, staring down at the arena, and Denbo's heart swelled with smug pride. The announcer nodded to the Tong Tong captain floating overhead. Ten thousand pairs of eyes locked on the gladiators. The games had begun. The warbound eyed each other in the eerie quiet, and then shifted in the sand. They formed a circle in the middle of the arena, facing outwards, preparing for attack from any direction. The Hulk heard Meek's nervous clicking to his left. The brood's wings whirred behind him. Heroeem's long blade lightly scraped the sand to his right. At any other time in his life, the Hulk would have turned toward each of those noises, looking for knives aimed at his back. But today, he kept his eyes forward. The rage boiled under his skin as always, constant and hot, his oldest friend. But his eyes were clear, his heart beat steady, his new friends had his back. Warbound. The gates before the Hulk began to open. This is it, citizens, slaves and oligarchs. Prepare yourselves for the Silver Savage! The crowd shuddered like a single living thing as the sunlight glinted off the Silver Savage's shining skin. He stood in the sand, bald head inclined, his great silver board strapped to one arm like a shield. A massive, sparking mace dangled from his other hand. Blasphemers. Korg shot Heroine a questioning look, but the Hulk stepped toward the Silver Savage, lowering his sword, his eyes wide. Surfer! Is that you? Yes! The surfer tilted his head as his obedience disc sparked. You know him? Yeah. Then pray for him. They've painted him to look like the son of Sakaar. An abomination in the eyes of the Prophet. That's not paint. He's the Silver Surfer. He's my... He's my friend. The Surfer hunched as his obedience disc blazed. Uh, friend! Then he launched forward as fast as light, slamming through the warbound, swinging his great mace upward to smash the Hulk's shield into a hundred pieces. Uh, you lousy punk! The Hulk's shield arm was numb from the blow, but the fury in his veins surged through his muscles. He seized the surfer's wrist before he could strike again. The surfer's obedience disc crackled. Forgive me! He broke the Hulk's grip and swung his mace, blazing with the power cosmic. The Hulk flew 50 feet backwards to slam into the arena's far wall. Wasn't he saying all the puny humans being weak? I told you he was exaggerating. Kyera the Old Strong glided over them on a floating disc. 
The Silver Savage's trainer stood beside her, waving his sparking obedience staff. The surfer's obedience disc blazed, and he turned toward the Hulk and the Warbound. Uh, goodbye. Get ready! <laughs> Meek and the Brute lunged, slashing the surfer with blades, claws, and fangs. Any other enemy would have bled out within seconds, but they couldn't even scratch the surfer skin. <laughs> He swung his mace, breaking their swords and sending them flying. <laughs> then he raised his board above Meek, ready to smash. <laughs> Korg thundered forward, charging between the surfer and Meek, <laughs> seizing the surfer's board. <laughs> the stone man had survived the Deathfire bomb without a mark. He'd fought a god and only lost a few chips. <laughs> but he felt his plates shift and erupt with fissures as the surfer slammed him into the ground. Then... <laughs> knocked him across the arena with a backhand slam from his board. The Hulk and Heroeem crouched in the sand as the surfer's eerie white eyes caught sight of them. Give him one more pass and we're all dead. I see only one spot. Got it. The Hulk hoisted a spear. Go high. Heroeem drew his sword, <laughs> leaping through the air. He was just a shadow warrior, mere flesh and blood, but his heart sang with his Sokka faith. The surfer instinctively tilted his head and raised his shield to fend off any possible miracles. The Hulk saw his opening. He lunged, putting all of his weight and strength behind his spear. The surfer clubbed Hiroim aside, and the split second the surfer needed to block the Hulk's blow passed. He couldn't stop the spear from hitting him. But the surfer had been on the planet long enough to recover from much of the Great Portal's weakening effects. No matter how hard the Hulk pounded, he could never crack the surfer's skin. But the Hulk had a more specific target. His spear tip had slammed into the center of the obedience disc implanted in the surfer's chest, shattering its glossy black surface. When the haze cleared from the Hulk's eyes, he saw the surfer kneeling in the sand, smoke rising from the shattered disc on his chest. The surfer raised his head and gazed at the Hulk with calm, shining eyes. You freed me. The Hulk felt the rage burning through his brain. So he smashed the surfer's stupid face into the ground. The surfer's silver body bent, broke, and went limp in the sand. Korg's hand seized the Hulk's raised fist. Korg stood steady, gazing into his eyes. With one. The Hulk turned to his fellow warbound. They stood around him, bloodied and battered, but all standing, all alive, all together. We've survived three rounds, three rounds in the great arena. Give us our freedom. The Red King gazed down at the arena. Kaira the Old Strong's image spoke to him from the talk disc in Counselor Dembo's trembling hand. When she'd first called, Denbo had considered hanging up or just accidentally dropping the talk disc off the balcony. But then he realized it might be better for her rather than him to convey this particular message. It's over, your eminence. Not just yet. Kyera strode down the tunnel beneath the great arena, her back stiff with rage. She had served as the Red King's warbound shadow for eight long seasons before he'd claimed the throne and she knew his vices better than anyone. So of course, she hated him with all her stone heart. But her service was mandated by the Shadow Treaty between her people and the Imperials. Breaking her oath would be an act of war. She had always obeyed his orders, knowing the lives of thousands depended on her actions, and what she could not bear, the obedience disc coming warm and ready beneath her chest plate, simply required. Kyera walked out onto the sand, followed by three robed prisoners flanked by Death's Head guards. The Hulk and his warbound turned to stare at her. She met their eyes and saw no fear, not even in the little bug. These are the enemies of your Emperor. She gestured toward the Death's Head guards as they pulled back the prisoners' hoods. Eloway stood in the center, dazed and bruised, the fifth prefect and his scout at her side. Eloe Kaifi, your friend. A high-born Imperial and a traitor. The oligarchs in their shaded boxes leaned forward, tense with dread. They'd heard rumors about Ronan Kaifi's disappearance. They'd told themselves he'd always been a troublemaker, 
a self-righteous, self-aggrandizing crusader, sticking his nose into business, better off left alone. But now here stood his daughter, little Elloway, who sang so well in the chapel, who had won the vaulting competition just three seasons ago, who liked baked eggs and the color purple. Kill her, and you are free. Bad joke. I wish it were. She nodded at Primus Vand. He stepped forward grimly, raising his sparking obedience staff. Don't fight it, Greenie. You've already won. This is just a little clean-up before you walk out the door. Blue energy from the Hulk's obedience disc rippled over his shoulders and arm. His muscles strained as he fought the disc, but he raised his massive fist over Eloway's head. She gazed at it blankly. The Hulk's fist hovered in the air, trembling, and the people in the stands stared in shock. Enough. Even you can't stop this now. Just tell me one thing. Lavinsky? My... my father's god. Where... He who died, died well. Eloy gazed at him with broken eyes. <sighs> Lavinsky led us in our second trial. He fell as a hero. And we swore our war-bound oath over his still warm body. Heroine turned to Kayera, eyebrow arched. And so, we invoke the war-bound provisions of the Shadow Pact. Our brother served Eloe Kaifi. We cannot fight her. Force our hand and you break the treaty between Shadow and Empire. I know you, Heroine the Shamed. You gave up your right to invoke the Shadow Pact when you broke your first war-bound oath. That bond was broken long before you and I ever took it, Kyera the Old Strong. You speak treason. So be it. But we will not kill this girl. <sighs> Primus Vand raised his obedience staff and thumbed the dial. Blue energy exploded from the discs on all the warbound. They turned toward Eloway, raising their weapons. Their muscles flexed and spasmed. Their flesh smoked and burned as blue energy ripped over them. The Hulk's fist and the warbound's weapons trembled in midair, poised for the kill. <laughs> No one struck. No matter how hard Primus smashed the dial. This is insane! You'll fry your brains, and she'll die anyway! It's the way of the world! Nothing can stop it! A silver hand rose into the air, crackling with a power cosmic. The obedience discs on the chests of the warbound exploded. Hundreds of slaves gasped as their obedience discs hissed and popped and fell in shards to the ground. Kaira stood as still as stone, but her eyes widened as her own obedience disc crumbled to dust beneath her armor. The silver savage knelt in his ragged armor in the center of the arena. He barely whispered, but every soul in the arena heard him as clearly as if he had been standing at their side. No more slaves. Only free people now. Tied only by the bonds they have chosen. The slaves in their standing boxes looked around at each other. Stunned. Free? Yeah. No. What? We tear this mother down. The Emperor stared down from his palace, blank-faced, as Korg and the Hulk ripped through the wall of the Great Arena. The Warbound burst out into the street, followed by a roaring horde of freed slaves. Behind the Emperor, Counselor Denbo literally hopped up and down as he barked into his talk disc, shouting at the commanders of the Guard to stop the monsters. But the slave units within the army were rebelling. The Death's Head Guards in the immediate vicinity had spontaneously crumpled to the ground in pieces, and the oligarchs were screaming for protection from their gloriously vengeful servants. The Emperor thought about his golden armor and blades in the weapons chamber one flight below his feet. He imagined himself descending like lightning upon the green scar, hacking his hideous head from his shoulders, and mowing through the hordes of soft, screaming slaves and rebels. But then he saw the sun glint off of the Silver Savage as he sailed over the rebels. He saw Korg knock over a platoon of soldiers with one massive foot stomp. He saw the Hulk almost casually tear a great hole in the city's outer wall and lead the horde into the Twisted Wood. And the Emperor drew back into the cool shadows of his tower, to seethe and plot.
Heroim scanned the crowd filing into the twisted wood. Most of the slaves freed by the surfer had scattered and disappeared into the city once they were clear of the great arena. The 215 former slaves, both Hivers and Imperials, had followed the warbound and the surfer, most of them wearing nothing but sandals and thin robes. Few carried supplies or tools. Heroim guessed only a handful had any experience surviving in the wild. As they moved deeper into the woods and the shadows grew darker, the excited chatter and laughter gave way to nervous murmurs. What about the Wilderbots? No fearing them, brother. You're with the Green Scar now. Meek turned around, proudly jerking a thumb behind him. But the Hulk was nowhere to be seen. On a ridge overlooking the twisted wood, Heroim watched as the surfer turned to the sun, closing his eyes and soaking up its rays. In the Sock of Faith, we tell the story of the Sakarsan who shines with the stars. He comes to save us. When I first saw you, against all my best judgment, I thought that you... I have heard these stories, and I don't want to believe them either. I was born of science, not prophecy. But in my time, I have seen many mysteries come true. And your stories also speak of the World Breaker, who comes to destroy. The surfer flexed his hand. His face grew grim, even as his power increased. I've taken enough life on this planet. I cannot stay. Heroim stared hard at the surfer, then nodded. The priest stood in silence for a moment, head inclined, paying his respects, then walked off to join the refugees. The Hulk emerged from the woods. He watched Heroim go, then turned to the surfer. <clears throat> Back there, in the arena, Sorry about that. So am I. But the obedience discs are gone now. The obedience disc didn't make me smash you. I did that all by myself. Your anger has always been your curse. Should I free you from it? The Hulk imagined the surfer raising his gleaming hand to send the power cosmic ripping through his body. He felt that hot core of fury in his heart and belly boiling over then slowly cooling and draining away. He saw his skin and flesh melting, saw himself withering and vanishing, until all that was left was a tiny pink thing lying curled on the ground, smiling as it slept. Banner. <laughs> Hell no. <laughs> I'm still weak, you know. Something about this planet or the portal. I must return to the stars. The surfer laid his hand on the Hulk's shoulder. Will you come? The Hulk felt the surfer's touch spread through his chest, slowing his heartbeat, relaxing his muscles. Warm and cool all at once, alive with the promise of all things possible. He remembered a night many years ago, when he'd first felt this calm, gazing at a gleam of silver in the sky. Back when we first met, that's all I wanted. I hated the stupid humans. They never left me alone. Then, I saw you in the sky. Thought you were a flying saucer. I wanted to catch you. Make you take me away to another world. The Hulk scowled as he remembered himself leaping through the air, seizing the surfer's board, raging and fighting, and then falling, falling, falling. I'm sorry. If I had known. But I can take you now. You don't get it. Hulk turned to gaze at the warbound, guiding the civilians through the woods. As he stepped toward them, the surfer's hand slipped from his shoulder, and the old fire returned to the Hulk's muscles and bones. The pain of every bruise and cut this planet had given him. The righteous rage of the beaten. The furious glory of the rebel. Meek emerged from the woods, clicking and waving. The puny, blue-robed Imperial beside Meek turned pale at the sight of the Hulk and slowly backed away. <laughs> the Hulk turned back to the surfer and showed his teeth. I'm already here. So be it. Be well. The surfer gazed at the Hulk. He'd never seen his friend so focused and so relaxed, so sure of himself. And he suddenly realized how much more dangerous that made the Hulk. World Breaker. No. Be good.
Kayero walked across the arena. Get me stretchers! I want those men treated and out of here now! She should have chased the Green Scar, cut him down and massacred his followers. But instead, she'd saved five fat oligarchs from the knives of their water bearers and prevented a panicky subaltern from massacring a hundred fleeing citizens who were climbing over the barricades outside the arena, just trying to reach their homes. She paused, staring in shock at a slave who knelt on the floor of the arena, clutching a small plant to his chest. Great swaths of green blood stained the sand before him, and from the heart of each spatter of blood, pulsing vines throbbed and delicate green leaves unfolded. The slave turned and met her eyes, beaming. Sakarsan, Sakarsan, hear my cry. My eyes are burning. My heart is ice. My night is full of death. Sakarsan, hear my cry. Cool my eyes. Warm my heart. Let me dream again. The Hulk spoke fewer than a hundred words over the next twelve hours. He just walked silently through the twisted wood. Hundreds followed. Heroim and Korg took charge, arming the most able-bodied former slaves with sharpened sticks and arranging them along the sides of the column to defend the others against possible attacks. The brood buzzed through the dark forest, hunting tree pigs and harvesting mushrooms for the evening's meal, while Eloway and Meek led scouting parties in all directions. But no scout was as good as the Green Scar's nose. Every hour or so, he'd pause, eye the sky, sniff the wind, and change direction. Throughout that first day, the mood of the refugees turned from stunned elation to panicky tension to a slowly growing calm. Few dared to walk beside Green Scar. They'd seen the terrible destruction his barest touch could wreak. But gradually, they felt their heartbeats synchronize with the steady rhythm echoing through the ground from his steps. And they drew closer to him as they walked, comforted by his massive presence. He might be a monster, but with each passing hour, they grew more and more certain he was their monster. When night fell, Korg stationed sentries around a clearing, and Heroim showed the refugees how to build smokeless cooking fires under wet branches. The Hulk sat in darkness beneath a tree on a low hillside, scanning the camp as people began to bed down for the night. There. The Hulk followed the brute's gaze and smiled. The small Imperial in blue robes was slipping away from the far edge of the camp, disappearing into the dark between the trees. The blue-robed spy slipped behind a rock overlooking the encampment and pulled a comm device from his robes. They're completely vulnerable on low ground in a valley between two mountains with just a few rows of wooden fortifications. Follow my trace. Should take less than an hour to get here. Message received. Counselor Denbo answered into his communicator, 13 stone steps away in his own camp. Hold your position. Kaira the Old Strong gave Denbo a warning look. Verse 12 of the war book, Counselor. If an enemy invites you in... I assure you, our opponents haven't been reading the war book. Heroim the Shamed served as the Emperor's father's warbound shadow. So you think the Green Scar has his own shadow guard now? And he's preparing a masterful plan to trick and defeat us? I was the very first to face the Green Scar. Even before you, Kyera the Old Strong. And I've watched every battle he's been in since. He fights out of anger, or pride, or just because he likes it. He may employ rudimentary cunning in hand-to-hand -hand combat, but I assure you, strategy has nothing to do with it. Sir, I'd like to move a bit farther out, if that's all. No, no. Hold your position. Denbo nodded to his soldiers, who climbed aboard their war carriage and pried open a great transport box. A trio of tentacled, squid-like amoebids floated up out of the box, their obedience discs sparking, and the soldiers began to strap bombs to their harnesses.
The blue-robed spy hunched between boulders on the ridge, gingerly daubing at his thorn-scraped legs with a kerchief. <gasps> he eyed the campfires glowing between the tents below. Seven hells. In his twelve seasons as an army interrogator in Crown City, he'd grown used to warm, dry royal offices. But here he was, cold, bleeding, and hungry, all because of those traitors below. He couldn't wait to watch Denbo's soldiers mow them down. But his eyes caught movement high in the night sky, and his jaw dropped. He spun away from the encampment, heading for the far side of the ridge. Why are you running? The spy stared up in shock. The Hulk towered over him, a thin, cruel smile on his lips. There's nobody here but us monsters. The Hulk's great hands reached out, but before the Hulk could seize him, the spy stumbled backwards, tripped over the edge of the ridge, and tumbled down the hill toward the encampment. Then the obedience discs on the flying squid overhead flashed, their tentacles twitched, and their bombs tumbled down to fill the valley with fire. As dawn broke, Kaira the Old Strong walked across the smoldering encampment, eyeing the blackened remains of tents and lean tos. The bombs had incinerated the entire area, but she saw only one charred corpse. She turned over the skull with one foot, took note of the fragments of blue fabric in the black ash, then raised her comm device to her ear. Just one body, Counselor. Our own spy. The rebels knew what we had planned and moved their camp. And the bombs have destroyed any trail they might have left during their escape. We're back where we started. Kaira sprinted to the other side of the encampment, where Denbo's Death's Head guards had just incinerated a pair of bound Imperials. Calm yourself, Kaira. Just dealing with some local villagers. They were hiding food from the army. Have to keep up our standards. She stared at the bodies on the ground, her fists clenched. Her oath was to the Emperor, not Denbo. Technically, she could cut the counselor down where he stood, but she was fairly certain that neither the Emperor nor her own people's Shadow Elders would appreciate such a broad interpretation of the Shadow Treaty. Denbo sidled a bit closer to her, surreptitiously eyeing the surrounding hills. And I thought it might add a little bait to your trap. Eloway stared down through the trees from the hill above. The smell of the scorched bodies hit her nose. She grimaced as images of her father burning in the maw raced through her brain. Let's do this, Hulk. She began to draw her sword, but Heroim reached out a hand. If your enemy invites you in, look to the far ridge. Eloway raised her scope to her eyes and peered at the line of trees on the other side of the valley. All right. Point taken. I see a few glimmers. A couple of snipers and armor. No. A dozen war chariots and two platoons of heavy infantry. Kaira's trying our trick right back on us. Wants us to think she's exposed. Wants us to strike in anger. And then she'd crush us like nectar flies. Heroine backed away through the trees. Alloway stared down at the smoldering bodies in the valley below. Eyes furious and hungry. Then she scowled, turned, and followed Heroin to the clearing where the rest of the warbound waited. If we're going to survive, you need to learn about strategy. And these slaves need to learn about war. We need a place to train. Meet knowing where. A pair of Imperial soldiers on floating discs skimmed across the moat surrounding the small farming village of Antoba. The Green Scar has escaped! He was last seen heading in this direction. If you see him or any of his crew, contact us immediately. Oh, and you'll come running just like that. The same way you're so helpful every time the Wildebots attack, huh? The Green Scar is a federal military issue. The Wildebots are a local matter for local authorities. It's not our jurisdiction. <laughs> A huge Wildebot surged upwards, seized him in its massive metal jaws, and crashed thunderously back into the water.
Headman Char ran up from the mill pits and into the central square as five wildebots clambered up out of the moat onto the shore. Guess they're not scared of the water anymore. Old Fingo stared in blank shock. We knew this day would come. Headman Char drew his hand cannon and turned to his people. The Empire has abandoned us, but this is our home. Stand firm. The Wildabots charged up the walkway, ripping cobblestones loose with their great claws and treads. Headman Char seethed. He'd helped lay those cobblestones by hand just three months ago. It had taken a whole week. He wondered where they'd find the time for repairs before winter set in. Then he silently laughed at himself for worrying. Five Wildabots as big and deadly as devil corkers were bearing down on them. Their mismatched limbs creaked and clanked. The Char saw that they'd incorporated retrofitted armor and weaponry from six of the deadliest Imperial war machines ever built. Almost certainly, no one in the village would ever see another winter. Curse the Red King. Open fire! The first wave of shells bounced harmlessly off the Wildebutt's metal hides. Edmund Char's second shot went straight into the nearest Wildebutt's mouth, but the beast just shook its head, spat a few sparks, and kept on coming. Go hide the children! All of you! Edmund! Now! His men ran. The headman drew his sword and faced the bots alone, picking his target. If he could wedge his blade into the neck of the first bot, he might be able to slow it down for a couple of heartbeats, possibly even steer it into its neighbor. In the best of possible outcomes, he'd end up gruesomely dismembered by the other three bots, but that might buy enough time for a couple more children to find hiding places. So be it. He raised his sword. Ah! But then, the rearmost bot crumbled, crashing forward into the bot in front of it. The lead bot turned its head just in time to see its packmates rupture and explode. <laughs> the green star burst into view, swinging his sword, and the last Wildebot's severed head fell to the ground at the stunned headman's feet. Char had to smash three pots in the kitchens to convince his people to show hospitality to their guests and saviors. The villagers might be mere farmers, abandoned by their emperor, but they were still red-skinned imperials, and they balked at seating bugs and monsters at the tables from which their children ate. Char respected their pride. Without it, they'd never have survived this long. But these were remarkable times, and he knew the villagers would need the help of these gladiators if they wanted to survive the next Wildabot attack. After the refugees had all been fed and settled on pallets in the main courtyard, and the warbound had downed their sixth roast tree pig, Char pulled up a stool beside the green scar. Char was the tallest man in his village, but he felt like a child next to the Hulk. He realized he was sweating, and it made him angry. Green Scar, we thank you again for your assistance, and we hope you have enjoyed our hospitality. Perhaps we might discuss the possibility of extending this relationship. The Hulk just stared at him. Char clenched his jaw, resisting the urge to wipe his brow. But he almost felt like smiling. He gave his own underlings that same silent stare when he wanted to put them in their place. The stone man saved him. We need a place to rest and train for a few days. If you don't want to be part of our fight, you can tell the Imperial soldiers we forced you to host us. Or you'll just force us anyway, huh? Now the stone man just stared at him in silence. But Char's confidence had returned. The monsters wanted something and seemed inclined to ask rather than just take. This could work. We've got a Wildabot problem. The Red King's soldiers don't care. You can stay as long as you like if you're slaves. Not slaves. Your people help in the fields. And you kill any Wildabots that attack us while you're here. Korg and the Hulk exchanged looks. Then Korg turned to Heroim. The Grey Shadow Priest leaned forward. Something in his manner drew everyone's attention. Know this. Anyone who betrays us will be killed. And we will know if we have been betrayed. Because I can read your very souls. That's a bluff, right? Why don't you betray them, Fango, and find out? From the moment the Warbound entered the village, Meek had been nearly overwhelmed by the acrid stink of suspicion and disgust emanating from the farmers. As he slunk from the table, he cursed himself for being so surprised. He'd spent the past few weeks as a gladiator, chemming the excitement of the Imperial spectators in the stands. They had cheered for him. 
But he should never have forgotten the contempt he'd spent all his life inhaling from their kind. Now he needed to focus, to clear his nostrils and mind so he could sniff out the thing that had brought him to this village in the first place. He slipped behind the cooking huts and slunk toward the garbage dump in the field beyond. His eyes rolled back. He keened, kenning a scent so powerful and awful it knocked him to his knees. The brew descended to his side, tilting back her own head. I can smell it. The kim's still in the air. After all these years, she touched his shoulder with a gentle tentacle. Your eyes. The warbound stood up from the table and turned toward the sound. Make! Eloi broke into a run, then almost immediately winced and stumbled oh. to her knees, clutching her forehead. The Hulk's eyes watered. A sharp smell filled his nostrils. It was Meek's scent but painfully sour and a thousand times stronger than usual. It smelled like misery. He's trying to chem with us, the Hiver way. What the hell's that mean? It's his deepest form of communication. We are his warbound. Breathe deep and let him in. The Hulk's fellow gladiators stood silent and solemn, eyes closed, taking deep breaths. <laughs> the Hulk seethed, resisting. But then he felt Korg's hand on his shoulder. Warbound. The Hulk closed his eyes and inhaled. Meek twitched and opened his eyes for the very first time. He was an armless larva in a golden egg, nestled among a hundred other golden eggs on the wall of a hidden hollow. His six tiny hearts pulsed warm and strong, and he rolled and kicked inside his orb. He felt his brothers shifting and rolling inside their own eggs, and he began to chitter with giddy, unexplainable joy. It was time, it was time, it was time! The larvae discovered their mandibles. Thrilled, they chewed until they'd burrowed through the walls of their eggs, then slid in a heap to nestle with each other in a roiling mass at the bottom of the chamber. They chemmed, sharing scents, marking each other forever. Brother, 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 brother. Hive, 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 hive. And then they separated, though they'd never be alone ever again, and crawled back up the sides of the walls to spin their cocoons. When Meek woke again, he rubbed his eyes, then grinned and chittered at the discovery of his four arms and two legs. He chemmed his waking brothers, who chattered as they discovered their own new bodies, and they tore through the paper shells of their cocoons to tumble and gamble together again on the floor of the chamber. They crawled up through the tunnel to the surface, filled with delight, as they felt the warm summer sun on their still soft shells. And then they chemmed a deep, golden scent, aged and warm, and full of pride. It was a smell they'd always known. It permeated their chitin, invested in every molecule of their shared being, but now it stood before them, beaming with love. Meek gazed up at his father, a huge hiver king with shoulders twice as wide as the hulks, great jagged spikes covering his massive skull and shell. Father carried a spear stained with the blood of a thousand enemies. His mandibles flashed like knives as they clicked. But his children smelled his true hearts and lunged forward with joy to embrace him. Ha <laughs> ha, my son! Meek and he touched antennae, and Meek felt forever brave and safe and perfect in his hive. Father turned at the sound of an Imperial Guard riding toward them on a lumbering warbot, flanked by a platoon of armed soldiers. Hail the Emperor. May his deeds be forever exalted. You are not approved for reproduction, and this land has been requisitioned by the Emperor. You know me, Lieutenant Char. I am a veteran of the Spike Wars. I was allotted this land by royal decree. That was a mistake. New laws. No hiver may hold land within a thousand stone steps of the capital. So crawl away or die. Meek and his siblings didn't understand Char's words or smells, but they scented every phrase their father spoke, every emotional nuance. They knew Char had threatened them. They could barely grasp the concept. All they had known was the hive, and the hive stood together forever. 
But now they understood that others could stand outside the hive and hate it, and even hurt it. Ready to fight, Meek? I'd rather see you live. Meek and his brothers hummed, feeling their hot rage turn to brown, crackling sadness. But then that sadness faded, soothed over with golden love. Father turned his back on Char, spreading his four arms, gathering and guiding his children down the hill. No! As I said, you are not approved for reproduction. This brood is forfeit! Father turned back to Char. His eyes narrowed and his carapace clicked as his claw tightened around his spear. His chemming blazed a white-hot warning to his children. Run! The hive scattered as Father lunged, slamming his spear into the neck of Char's mouth, bringing it to the ground in an explosion of fire and metal. Char rolled as he hit the ground. Fire! They leveled their blasters and fired. Their father's scent leaked out onto the ground in a terrifying chaos of jumbled warnings and howls that scorched their nostrils, then dissolved into a murk of dark brown despair. They desperately kemmed with each other, but Meek lost everyone's scent as Char's guns rang out. He was left with only his own stink, sharp, sour, horrified. And now, forever alone. Meek in the woods, hungry and cold. Meek in a cage, poked with sticks by imperial children. Meek in a dirty city alley, sniffing garbage, scrounging and hiding. Meek in manacles, chained to imperial machines, slaving for hours and days and months and years. The brood knelt, curling her tentacles around Meek, holding him. The warbound staggered toward them, blinking in stunned silence. He has Kim bonded with us, shared his life, as if we were his hive. Yes, you my hive now. So now I'm calling on you for justice. His scent turned deep and gold, full of pride and righteous anger. The warbound stared in shock as he rose to his feet. Tiny Meek camped with them as his great father had camped with his sons, embracing and commanding. Meek walked among and past them, heading back around the cooking hut. Headman Char stood in the square, consulting with his lieutenants, one hand on the shoulder of a small imperial child. You! Headman! You killing my father, my brothers, my whole family! Now you paying! Nobody touches my father! But the headman gently took the boy at his side by the shoulder and stepped in front of him. He stared at the warbound and his own people with hard eyes and quiet confidence. I don't know this bug, but this isn't any secret. Years ago, I wiped out a hive right here in this valley. The Emperor's orders exterminate the hivers, establish imperial ownership of all vital resources. You want apologies? Restitution? Fine. Let's talk. But those are old crimes unconnected to the threats we jointly face today. If we fight each other, many will die. Edmund Char caught the same fierce scent Meek's father had exuded all those years ago. He knew the bug would never give this up. Did I invoke Imperial custom? Let us make a trial by arms. If the bug agrees, only he and I need fight. The rest of you stay unmarked. Then, no matter the outcome, the alliance between our people still stands. What say you? Twelve hours to prepare our bodies and souls. Then we meet here to make an end. Your end. As the sun set, the villagers slipped into their huts, shooting baleful glares at the gladiators and refugees who stood in the square, practicing drills. Heroim spun a spear, demonstrating attacks, while nervous rebels watched. I learned their foot soldiers' fighting style in the first Spike Wars. The Imperial infantryman's weak spot is the throat. So, spin, thrust, spin, thrust. Hedman Char watched grimly for a few moments, then shook his head. He exchanged a look with Fango, both of them realizing the flaw in Heroim's instruction. Char took a step forward, 
Headman, what are you doing? We've been over this. Emperor's not going to save us. We need these gladiators. These gladiators are going to try to kill you in the morning. And maybe they will. But then they will remember what I did for them tonight, and they will keep their word and protect this village. Char turned to stare at Hiroim as the square fell silent. Then Hiroim nodded, and Char took Hiroim's spear and began to demonstrate. Meek seethed, mandibles clacking. He pictured himself leaping, attacking Char from behind, clawing his throat out and spraying his blood over the square. Meek, a word. Korg stepped to Meek's side. Forgo. Not understanding. This man is an ally now. Let the past... No! Talking about my brothers! You not understanding! I lost my brothers too, little one. We are brothers now. Meek just stared in silence. Korg held his gaze for a long moment before turning to join Heroim and Char. Meek watched him go, then turned to the Hulk, who loomed in the darkness behind him. Two hands? What's saying you? Why ask me? You know what you want. You brought us here to get it. But what... what would you be doing? The Hulk saw Meek's father ripped apart and bleeding out. The Hulk saw Primus Vand incinerating Ronan Kaifi. The Hulk saw the Red King swinging his golden sword. The Hulk saw Reed Richards and Iron Man and all the other Shining Heroes laughing their faces at masks, stretching and distorting as the Hulk screamed in pain, spilling green blood into the hot sand of the great arena. I'd never stop making them pay. Meek stared at the Hulk, inhaling his hot green anger, and smiled in the darkness. Char eyed his son as they walked through the tunnels beneath the village, and the headman's heart filled with aching, sad pride. The boy was small for his age, only half Char's height, but he carried himself with an adult's solemn gravity. Char had raised his son alone since his wife had died in the Swamp Plague six seasons ago. He'd seldom seen the boy laugh out loud. But when the chores were done, the boy would build little forts out of small stones and smile when his father knelt to help him. They paused at the well, where the boy carefully worked the pump by himself for the first time, filling two buckets. And you will draw the water every morning? Yes, father. Char led the boy to the armory and showed him the code to the lock. Then they swung open the door and gazed at the bright blades on their racks. And you will clean the swords and learn to fight? Yes, father. They walked to the lower chamber where the animals hunched, chained in their stalls near the mill. The boy poured water into their troughs, then shoveled feed from the sacks, avoiding the animals' snapping claws and jaws. And you will feed the animals and watch over your friends and keep all of them safe? Yes, father. Grimy from his chores, chin tendrils trembling, the boy gazed up at his father with shining eyes. Char ran a rough hand over the boy's head and wiped the tears from both their eyes. Then may he who dies, die well. Headman Char slept soundly through the night, with his boy curled against him, tucked under one arm, held safe against the monsters waiting in the square. When morning came, father and son quietly washed their faces, prepared their breakfast, and ate by the window, listening to the little honey skippers splashing in the moat and singing for mates. Then they walked out to the square, where someone had already used red sand to delineate a great circle. Meek, holding a jagged spear, stood with a warbound on the far side of the circle. The villagers parted solemnly as Char and his son approached. Char took a spear from old Fengo and tested the blade's sharpness. He nodded curtly, then knelt, kissed his boy on the forehead, and walked into the circle. Meek charged immediately. <coughs> Meek thrust his spear, missing Char's leg, and Char hooked his own spear behind the jagged tines of Meek's blade. Char spun, ripping Meek's spear out of his hands. Char spun again, cracking Meek in the face with the butt of his spear. Meek fell, and Char planted a foot on one of Meek's four arms, pinning him to the ground. Char raised his spear, aiming it at Meek's throat. By the rules they'd agreed upon, he could kill the bug and end this now. But he looked up to see his son staring at him. The boy's face was blank. But Char felt the hardness in his own heart crack. 
He turned to stare down at Meek. Yield and live. <laughs> Never! And then the bug seized Char's spear and jerked it downward, jamming the blade through the joint connecting his pinned arm to his side. <laughs> he spun away, leaving his severed arm under Char's boot. Char felt his balance give out, and then suddenly he was lying on the ground with the bug sitting on his chest, holding his own spear to his throat. <laughs> Meek froze. <laughs> He scented the agony emanating from the father who lay beneath him, and he reeled with the chem memory of his own father's aching love. Not fair. So close. Not fair, not fair, not... <laughs> the smell of the boy's terror cut like a knife through Meek's hearts. He dropped his spear and staggered away from the headman. Korg reached out to him, but Meek stumbled blindly out of the red circle and fell to his knees, alone tearing at the ground. The cry echoed over the village, and then it seemed to reverberate, welling up from below. Meek looked up in shock. The Hulk stared back at him, head cocked, listening, then strode forward. It's nothing! Just the stables, the animals! The Hulk stared at the ground, then swept aside a great patch of sand to expose several huge interlocking slabs of flagstone. A few panicking villagers ran forward, trying to pull him away, but he shoved them back, dug his fingers into the cracks at the edge of the biggest chunk of flagstone, and heaved it up from the ground. Sunlight poured down into a chamber below, and the animals in their pens blinked, rattling their chains, reaching up toward the light. Meek's hearts pounded with shock. His body reacted before his brain fully grasped what was happening, and he stumbled forward, his vision blurring with tears. But his brother's cam guided him home. He tumbled from the square into the pit, and wept with joy as the scent of his brothers carried him away. There were only a dozen of them, tiny, stunted, little bigger than hivelings. Just twelve remaining, of the hundred who had hatched all those years ago. Dragged from the murder field, slaved and chained in darkness underground, to work the mill for years and years. But here they were, his brothers, his lost hide, radiating the same warm scent that he'd never dreamed of smelling again. Forever together, forever separated. Now forever together again. And then, Meek the Hived, unhived no more, turned to stare back up at Hedman Char, his eyes hard and cold. Ten hours later, Counselor Denbo signaled his battalion to halt as he spotted the smear of smoke over Antoba. Kaira the Old Strong took point, loping through the burning fields and leaping lightly across the moat toward the burned-out farming village. Stunned villagers staggered through the embers and ash. Headman Char, bruised, stunned, and stripped of his armor, knelt with his son in the ruins of the storehouse, carefully picking scattered breadgrass grains out of the dirt. Good boy. Char murmured each time his son dropped a seed into the pot. But the child just nodded silently and kept working never looking his father in the eye. Hedman, have you seen the green scar? Or any of his monsters? Monsters? The headman looked up. His distorted face, reflected in Denbo's breastplate, stared back at him. He saw his child behind him in the reflection, finally raising his head to eye his father with quiet dread. Shar's heart sank like a dead rock in his chest. That's all I see. On each of the first six days after the Green Scar's escape, the Emperor sent his royal gardeners into the Great Arena to eradicate the Aleha Alvines. The gardeners weeded and dug and poisoned and burned, but each morning the twisting green vines returned, more thick and lush than before. By noon of the seventh day, the vines had infiltrated the cracks in the foundation of the Great Arena, and another huge section of the North Wall came crashing down. The Vagabonds began streaming into the city on the eighth day, 
They called themselves pilgrims and knelt and prayed and sang before the vines. The Red King stared down at them from his tower and shook his head in amusement and disgust. But when his chief librarian read to him the passages of the scrolls that they were chanting, his smile vanished. The Sakarsan bled. The Alehaal grew. And the great stones crumbled. The Red King sent his soldiers to chase away the pilgrims, but like the vines, they returned each day, in greater numbers. So he ordered his men to lock them up in the dungeons. And yet even more appeared to pray before the vines each morning. On the tenth day, a soldier panicked and opened fire during an evacuation operation. In the mayhem that followed, his platoon slaughtered 33 pilgrims. On the eleventh day, rebellions broke out throughout the city. Some were organized attacks by trained insurgents, taking advantage of the disquiet from the massacre. Others were spontaneous acts of resistance by everyday workers and civilians. One particularly worrisome incident involved the murder of a commanding officer by his subordinates, who joined a group of insurgents to take control of the great arena, declaring it free land as a holy site of the Sakarsan. On the twelfth day, the emperor put on his gold armor, took up his sword, and descended to the great arena, where he personally incinerated every pilgrim, rebel, and Alehaal vine he could find. And then he killed his gardeners. But on the thirteenth day, the vines grew back. The Hulk could have stopped Meek and his brothers from burning Antoba to the ground, but instead, he just watched, standing guard with Korg and Heroim over Headman Char, who sat in the square, holding his weeping son, surrounded by his terrified people. Meek and his brothers, followed by the Brood and Alloway, roamed the village, smashing anything that would break and torching anything that would burn. Old Fengo mumbled a feeble appeal to Alloway, begging her to have mercy on her fellow Imperials. She slapped his wrinkled hands aside and shoved him to the ground with her foot. Uh, you slaved those Hiver babies! Locked them underground for years! And all of you knew it! All of you! They're just bugs! The Hulk's eyes blazed. Meek's chem hung thick in the air. And the Hulk felt the fury of the Hive surging through his veins. Twelve seasons of horror inhaled in the ashes the chains rubbing their wrists raw, the dull despair as they walked in circles for hours on end, turning the great wheel that powered the mill, their keening agony as an irritated farmer reached out with a scythe to hook one of their brother's bodies from the makeshift grave they tried to hollow out in their cell, then chucked the corpse into the compost wagon. But before the hole could roar, <coughs> Eloy backhanded Fengo across the face, breaking his nose and sending him crashing back into the sand. <coughs> Eloise stood, fists clenched, listening to the child sob, her eyes locked on the old man, hunched in the sand. Then the sickly sweet smell of roasting grain blew over the square as the fields caught fire, and the Hulk turned and started walking. Eloise followed, face blank, never looking back. And soon, all the rebels and refugees trailed after the Hulk, heading out across the plains, Meek and his brothers followed last, at first stiff and stalking, proud and sad and furious. But as they put the village behind them, they gazed at the bright sky and sniffed the blooming grass and felt the fresh breeze on their faces. Where do we go now? Eloe strode out in front of the Hulk, pointing east. The anger was in her blood and bones now. Meek had had his revenge. Now she wanted hers. We can make the mountains by nightfall and take cover in the caves. And then by midday tomorrow... We'll hit them all. Primus Van first realized the Warbound had returned when his floating disc exploded beneath him and he tumbled 50 feet, breaking his leg in the middle of a practice arena where a new shipment of would-be gladiators were fighting to the death. He spun, raising his control staff to defend himself, but Eloway kicked him in the teeth and ripped the staff from his hands. She pointed the staff at the shocked slaves in the arena. Go ahead! Kill him! Her thumb was on the dial. But the Hulk jerked the staff from her hands and crumpled it to bits before her eyes. You're all free! He turned.
turn to clear a Delaware. Get to hell with anyone who'd make you a slave again! Primus Van killed my father, and who knows how many others? He deserves to die! Then do it yourself. Elloway stared at Primus, who sat silently in the sand. He couldn't feel his broken leg, and his jaw ached, probably fractured. But he made a point of staring right back at Elloway. He knew from experience how hard it was to kill a defenseless man who met your eye, no matter what he'd done in the past. It had taken Primus years to master the skill, and Elloway had only been fighting for a month. Elloway spun and kicked Primus in the head. Primus crumpled to the ground, a thin smile playing on his lips. The smile stayed on his lips, because even as he blacked out, he knew he was still alive. After the Hulk smashed every guard's obedient staff, and Heroim pried the obedience discs out of every slave, half of the freed gladiators fled to the hills, but the other half joined the Hulk's band. They saddled up the Dramaths, filled the wagons with weapons and supplies, and headed out over the range toward the northern steppes. No man's land, protected by the Shadow Treaty. The Empire will not follow us there, but since the Spike War, it's been nothing but a wasteland. Nothing grows there but thorns. Nothing lives there but monsters. The Hulk gazed out over the rough, windswept wilds and thought of the desert where he was born, back on Earth. Thousands of miles of wide open landscape, but not a single puny human in sight. Sounds like home. The moment he said the word, he saw it in his mind's eye. A stretch of low buildings alongside a gentle river. Imperials, hivers, and shadows side by side, working their fields and gardens. Children chasing floating seed pods across the plains. The warbound laughing, returning from the hunt. Meek and Elloway, calm and happy at last, as they stoked the fires and prepared for the roast. And the Hulk himself, sitting quietly in the high grass, gazing across the fields, waiting for something. For someone. Wait! Meek's brothers echoed him, eyes closed, hunching and sniffing. What is it? Voices in the air! They calling... calling to us! He pointed toward a stretch of mountains to the south. Forget it. We're going to the steppes. Not yet! For the next three hours, Meek and the Brood followed the scent in the air, leading the column along the border of the steppes and up into the mountains. Once under cover of the trees at the base of the range, the warbound left the non-combatant refugees behind and broke into a run. Up there! Meek pointed up the ridge. Careful! They crouched low, staying under cover of the trees, and peered over the ridge. In the box canyon below, Counselor Denbo stood in the open, watching approvingly as Headman Char put a bullet into the head of a bound, blue-shelled hiver. The hiver fell to the ground, his blood pooling with twenty other murdered hive mates. This is what happens when you betray your emperor! Denbo looked up around the walls of the canyon. These bugs never bothered anyone before today. You've never met them. They've never met you. They're just another slave hive from another village, like hundreds of slave hives in hundreds of villages across the Empire. But today, they heard about what you did, and they ran away from their masters. So, look! He kicked the skull of the nearest dead hiver. Look what you made us do. Had Char stared bleakly up toward the ridge. Then Denbo nudged him, and Char fired into the corpses of the hivers. That's what we get for letting those fratzes live. Time to ending it! Time to ending them all! Calm yourselves. It's the same trap as before. They're trying to enrage us. Get us into that box canyon. They're crying! Brother me! Hush now. No crying no more. Meek turned a fierce, wet eye to the Hulk. Just smashing! The Hulk thought of the steps, the home by the river, the children laughing in the fields. Warbound, two hands. Whatever may come. The Hulk closed his eyes and let the anger take him. 
Counselor Denbo smiled as the green scar and the rebels began to rush down toward them from the far side of the canyon. You see, no strategy, just rage. Denbo signaled the munitions team. The cliffside exploded, sending a third of the Green Scar's army flying through the air in the initial fireball, and the rest staring in shock as an avalanche of stones tumbled toward them. Heroim's lips moved with silent prayers as he scooped up three hivelings and ran from the falling boulders. The hivelings cried out in fear, and he spoke the verses aloud as he leapt from rock to rock, teaching them as he was taught when he was a child. And their heartbeats began to calm. Sakarsim, hear my cry! Our enemies are strong! <clears throat> They burn us with their fire! They break us with their stones! Ah! But though they move earth and sky against us, ah! You bear the very mountains on your back, that we may strike our foes! Heroim landed beside the Hulk and Korg at the bottom of the cliffside. He hadn't been fast enough. He knew the rocks would hit them in an instant. But he felt his faith spreading through him like a warm fire. Look! Hivelings! The Hulk and Korg dug their hands into the ground. <laughs> they heaved up a massive chunk of stone, deflecting the avalanche to send the boulders tumbling down toward Denbo's men in the valley below. You bear the very mountains on your back. That we may strike our foes! <laughs> Meek charged through the embers and falling rocks. Headman Char turned and raised his hand cannon. Their eyes locked. In another lifetime, Char might have had a story to tell, an explanation, maybe even an apology. But his eyes were hard and dead, as if he'd reconciled himself to whatever he thought he had to do long, long ago. He said nothing, just squeezed off two shots that flew wide. <laughs> then Meek's spear caught him under the ribs and ripped up through his lungs to exit beneath his shoulder blade. As Char fell, Meek hacked him with blades from either side. And when Char's body hit the ground, Meek stabbed him three times more. Enough, Meek! It's over! <sighs> over? Meek turned to the Imperial soldiers who backed against the far wall of the canyon, dropping their weapons. Denbo raised his trembling hands. We yield! Meek heard nothing but the rushing of blood in his ears, and smelled nothing but the stink of the hivers that the soldiers had murdered. Never stop making them pay! <laughs> Meek charged forward, spear level, his hivelings at his side. Denbo stumbled backwards, falling to the ground. Meek leapt, raising his spear high. But the Hulk stepped forward, stretched wide his arms, and brought his hands together. Throwing Meek and his hivelings backwards through the air. Meek scrambled to his feet, grabbing his fallen spear, and spun back toward Denbo. But now the Hulk stood between him and the Imperials. Eloy stared at the Hulk in fury. Go! Meek charged, his spear leveled, but the Hulk didn't even flinch. Meek's blade sank into his chest, and the handle broke off in Meek's hands. The Hulk just stood there, massive and unmoving, as Meek hunched before him. Why are you stopping me, two hands? You should already know that, little one. Meek stared at Korg and Hulk, baffled and furious. They swore to stand with him, they shared his chem, they marched on this mission of vengeance, and now they held back and chastised him for not knowing rules he never learned? Furious and grief-stricken, Meek stared into the Hulk's eyes. All I knowing is what you teaching! Crown City burned. Kaira stood on the wall outside the palace, gazing over the rooftops, shaking her head in disgust, but not surprise. The Red King's particular mode of leadership maintained a veneer of law and order. The more people you kill, the quieter your rebels become. But they multiply in that bloody silence until their opportunity comes. Panicking Imperial soldiers broke and ran as insurgents smashed through the barricades blocking the main road to the Emperor's palace. Kyera waded into the insurgents from behind, swinging her twin blades, hacking down four rebels and breaking their charge. The rest turned and ran for cover among the huge columns bordering the public gardens across the boulevard. Kyera stepped toward them, then stopped as she spotted a handful of terrified, exhilarated adolescents peering out at her from behind the columns, rocks and sticks in their hands. 
Taking advantage of the distraction, the insurgents circled back around the far side of the columns and fired arrows at Kaira's right flank. She swung her blades, hacking the arrows from the air as the adolescents started throwing their rocks. Go home, you fools! Hide your faces and never return! The platoon of Imperial soldiers charged the bowmen, but mini jets split the air and a great plume of fire descended from above to incinerate both the bowmen and the soldiers. The Red King descended from the sky, shooting fire from his hands. The lieutenant ran toward Kaira in panic. He's killing anything that moves! You have to stop him! Ah! 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 Flames engulfed the lieutenant. <laughs> the adolescents behind the columns huddled. Kaira knelt, facing the children with her back to the Emperor, and pressed her palm to the ground. Tiny pebbles shivered around her hand, and the ground shook and split open as she summoned the old power that gave her her name. The children ran as the columns around them fell and shattered. Kaira stood, facing the Emperor. It's over, Your Grace. They'll bother you no more. But of course they bother me, Shadow. They still live, because you chose to put on a magic show instead of simply killing them. Now step aside! Kaira stared up at her king. She no longer wore an obedience disc, but she was still bound to obey by her people's treaty. Still, she thought, she could take her time. She turned slowly to look back at the children as they squeezed through a great crack she'd made in the wall behind the columns. If she took another five seconds to quit the field, they might have a chance of reaching the next block and taking cover in the royal galleries. But she knew that wouldn't be enough. The Red King was primed now. He wouldn't be satisfied until he'd seen all their bodies twisting in his fire. But then her eyes caught a familiar silhouetted figure staggering down the street toward them, ragged and bloodied. Counselor Denbo, where is your armor? Where is your army? Denbo stared at her, eyes blasted and strange. Like a stranger watching himself, he wondered what he would say. All the calculation and affectation with which he so carefully held himself had washed away. He had no idea what was left until his mouth opened and the words spelled out. Like the old rhymes promised, he bore mountains on his back. Who? The Green Scar? He's not the Green Scar. <laughs> He's the Sakarsan! Let it be said throughout the world! The Red King's face turned deep crimson as he slowly turned in the air. I am he, the hero protector, the deliverer of the people, the one and true son of Sakar! He slowly descended towards Kaira the Old Strong. Go, Shadow! Go kill the Hulk! Kaira turned and walked from the Silent City. The Emperor floated back to his tower. Citizens huddled in their dark homes for the rest of the night, barely daring to make a sound. At the border of the steps, Meek hunched on a hillside, staring out at the encampment of refugees on the plains. A cold wind blew, and snow had begun to fall. The Imperials huddled for warmth in small, weary groups in their tents and lean-tos. But Meek's hiveling brothers milled about on a high hill in the wind, walking in strange, listless circles. Korg sat down heavily at a campfire beside the Hulk and Heroine. <sighs> we found Primus and the other prisoners dead. Throats cut. No one will say who did it. Eloy just laughed when I asked her about it. Why not laughing? They deserving it. It doesn't matter. Every blow struck in anger turns back upon us. But those puny pinkies! Killing, 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 and killing! We have to stop them, or they're killing everyone forever! Yes, but still we pay the price. Meek looked from Heroine to the Hulk, but the Hulk just stared into the fire. Meek turned and trundled away through the snow to his brothers. The Hivelings continued shuffling in their strange circle. Meek knelt among his hive, raising his face to the wind, and tasted aching grief and longing. The cam came from his hive, from the dead hivers in the box canyon, from hundreds, even thousands of other hivers reaching out across the steps, chemming in the wind. Yes, crying, 
and dying and calling. Change. Me closed his eyes. He should have been shivering from the cold, but the chemming had flipped switches in his limbic system, triggering chemical reactions deep within his body that sent a tingling warmth through his every nerve and muscle. He folded his arms, tilted his head forward, and released his conscious mind as his body began to spin a great cocoon. As dawn broke, the Hulk stood on a snowy ridge, staring out across the steps. He flexed his legs, testing the power in his muscles. He wasn't anywhere near full strength, but he was growing stronger every day. When he'd first landed on Sakaar, he could barely jump twenty feet. But now all he had to do was crouch and leap, and he'd be ten miles away in thirty seconds. If he gave himself an hour... He could bound so far away, no one would ever find him again. The fifth prefect of the Sakarian Democratic Insurgency winged down from the sky on a floating disc, crashed into a snowbank, and sprinted toward the Hulk through the snow. Green Scar! The scouts have news! Hundreds of slaves and rebels rioting in Crown City! In your name! Smashing the guards, fighting the Red King himself. The time is now! We must return and fight! So go. Green Scar. I'm not the Green Scar. I'm the Hulk. And all the Hulk ever wanted was for people to leave him alone. But... Korg stepped forward through the snow and put a hand on the fifth prefect's shoulder to guide him away. But he jerked free. You can't stop now! We fought for you! You fought for yourselves. Because you bled and the green vines grew! Because you held the mountains on your shoulders. Why do you deny who you are? I know exactly who I am. He turned to the prefect, staring at him squarely for the first time, boring into him with his dark green eyes. And if you have any brains at all, you'll shut the hell up and let me walk away before I kill your whole stupid planet. <gasps> Worldbreaker. The prefect then clapped his hand over his mouth, as if shocked to have spoken the word out loud. The Hulk turned his back on the prefect and walked toward the steps. But Meek's voice rang out, strange and unfamiliar. You not going anywhere! The hivelings followed Meek over the rise toward the Hulk. They rattled their swords against their shells. Meek towered over them. Fresh from his final metamorphosis, he was massive now. His shoulders twice as broad as the Hulk's, his great shell covered with spikes, his three remaining hands holding spear, mace, and shield. A strange new scent drifted from Meek, a smoky mix of pride and anger. The Hulk instinctively began sizing him up, gauging his vulnerabilities, picking out possible points of attack. The Hulk's hands tightened into fists. He shifted his weight almost imperceptibly, preparing to charge. And then he realized what his body was doing and clenched his jaw, fighting his rage. Don't try to stop me, Meek. He's not just Meek no more. Hero Meek, King Meek. 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 Then let him fight for you. I'm done. No, Two Hands. For killing the Red King, we needing you. Meek lowered his spear and reached out with a huge clawed hand toward the Hulk. His scent turned orange and tangy, pleading. Warbound, two hands, fighting for friends. Hulk stared into his beseeching eyes. The hivelings could call Meek a king, but inside those eyes, the Hulk saw the same little bug he'd always known. Still so furious and still looking up to him, calling to him, asking and demanding and insisting and begging and... Don't you get it? It'll never stop. <clears throat> Meek grabbed at the Hulk to keep him from turning away, his claws digging into the Hulk's shoulder. The Hulk knocked away his hand. <clears throat> Meek tumbled backwards, caught off balance. He rolled for a moment on the back of his shell, huge and ridiculous, limbs clattering helplessly. All his new power and dignity lost in an instant. 
You don't! Listen! I told you I was done! The Hivelings charged, stabbing the Hulk with their spears, gouging him with their claws and mandibles. <laughs> he spun, sending their little bodies flying in all directions. <laughs> and then the stink of anger and fire hit the air, and King Meek was upon him, clawing at his eyes and neck, while slamming his spear deep into the Hulk's chest. <laughs> Since landing on Sakaar, nothing had hurt the Hulk this badly. Not the Devil Corker, not the Red King's sword, not the Deathfire bombs. <laughs> Meek's huge mandibles were clacking inches from the Hulk's face. The tiny, eternal no howled deep inside the Hulk, but he felt the anger surging through his muscles, overtaking his brain. And soon all he heard was the pounding of his own furious heart. <laughs> The Hulk smashed Meek in the face, cracking his cheekplate and sending him flying to gouge a twenty-foot trench in the sand. The Hivelings lunged forward to protect their king. But the force of the Hulk's roar knocked them head over heels. Meek spun and raised his broken lance. The Hulk's vision distorted as his heart pounded. Meek's face twisted, turning more monstrous. The Hulk raised his fists. His roar so loud, the top layer of snow and ice and dirt exploded upward around him and Meek in a fifty-foot radius. But his fists crashed down on yellow stone. Korg had lunged forward to take the blow. Now he crumpled to the ground at the Hulk's feet, face cracked. A thin, steaming line of molten Cronin blood ran down his cheek. Enough! Let Meek hunt the Red King if he wants, but you, Greenskin, you have to stop. Who you kidding, Korg? <clears throat> Meek staggered to his feet. The Hulk stared at Meek, feeling the blood drip from his split knuckles. Meek tilted his head, chemming the Hulk's blood and rage, feeding it with his own, and grinned. How can he be stopping what he made for doing? Korg and Heroine walked among the refugees, helping them bundle their belongings and wrap their faces for the wind and sand of the steps. A pair of Imperials knelt reverently in the thin soil, carefully using broken swords to dig up an Alehaal vine without damaging its roots. Heroim watched them with an eerie mix of awe and dread. The steps had been nearly barren ever since the Spike Wars, but now the Alehaal vines were returning, just as the scrolls foretold. Heroim gazed at the refugees, who had begun to pray over the vine, and he resisted the terrible, blasphemous urge to join them. Heroim was a true priest. He knew the dangers of false prophecy, but he couldn't deny the flower of hope blossoming deep within his own chest. Meek is wrong. Hulk should come with us into the steps. To do what? Plant crops? Raise a family? No. She turned to gaze at the Hulk and Meek. Walking with a line of Hiver and Imperial warriors along the edge of the steps. The brood flew over them, hissing approvingly as the rebels shook their spears. The Green Scar goes to war. Before the two groups split, they met one last time in the plains at the border of the steps. Korg praised the heroism of all, the fortitude of the refugees, and the bravery of the warriors. He spoke of different paths, of the importance of simultaneously fighting the past and building the future. But the refugees he and Heroim would lead into the steps hung their heads, barely listening, weary and scared. And the Hulk's army fidgeted, eyeing the horizon, itching to march. Heroim gazed at the Hulk. They had become a people divided, both against each other and each in his own heart. Too many dreams, too many curses... Too much confusion. The Green Scar should speak. But the Hulk just stared at nothing, a thousand stone steps away. So Heroim stepped forward. With signs upon signs pointing the way, how can we help but believe? These are the days of the Sarkarsin, who will save us. Or the World Breaker, who will destroy us. There. He'd said the names out loud. Now the refugees and the soldiers turned to stare at him, dread and hope welling in their guts, and Heroim's heart ached, knowing how sorely he'd disappoint them. 
But the prophet tells us to look within for the Sakarsan. In our own hearts, with our own hands, by our own blood, no destiny, no doom foretold. We make our own choices to save ourselves or destroy ourselves. So whether we ride north into the unknown or south toward war, we remember you, O Prophet. Forgive and embrace us all. The believers in the crowd had mumbled the old benediction along with Heroin, but they avoided his eyes, gazing at the ground. Of course, they hated his words. Deep down, everyone longed for destiny. It would be so much easier. But the green scar had heard. He stared at Heroin for a long moment, then nodded, turned, and walked toward the dark mountains. Meek and his hivelings rattled their spears against their shells, Eloise's insurgents stood to attention, and the Green Scar's army headed south toward chaos. High over the North Atlantic, in his favorite untraceable satellite headquarters, Reed Richards stretched. His back arched impossibly, forming a ten-foot half-circle. His arms extended 20 feet overhead, and his fingers splayed out in five-foot arcs to brush the ceiling of his massive laboratory. <sighs> he closed his eyes for three and a quarter seconds. Then he snaked his elongated neck around to sip water from the bag tethered to his desk lamp and got back to work. He let his limbs float loose and gangly in the zero-grav environment as his long fingers flew over the keyboards. Reed had learned over the years that the looser he let his body become, the more fluidly his mind would work. And today he was managing three separate projects that could determine the fate of the human race. A nuclear meltdown in India, a terrorist attack on the polar ice caps, and the mysterious dying off of a quarter of the world's tuna in the seas below. He worked calmly, barely feeling his heart rate rise. It was Tuesday, and the smartest human on the planet was doing his job. Reed's head swiveled in shock. The green phone never, ever rang. Who is this? Who else would be calling you on the super-secret encrypted line you and I established for emergencies, Dr. Richards? It's Dr. Bruce Banner, naturally. The Incredible Hulk! Doubtful. Judging from your voice's timbre and accent, you're about half the age of Bruce Banner, and you're using an over-dramatized cadence to indicate sarcasm, which has never been a part of Bruce's verbal repertoire. And you're from Arizona, not Ohio. And you're not nearly as smart as Bruce because you've given away your exact location by calling this number. Doubtful. I mean, you're right on the sarcasm thing, but Banner encrypted this line? Even you haven't been able to crack it. Maybe I haven't tried. Amadeus Cho grinned, removing his feet from Bruce Banner's desk so he could lean forward to tap on his keyboard. He was a hundred feet beneath the Mojave Desert and the third of the seven secret Banner headquarters he'd uncovered in the past month. The hideout had been built into a natural cave, only accessible by swimming through a lake to a hidden underwater passage. So Amadeus sat in his boxers, munching on a candy bar, leaving a wet spot on Banner's creaky army surplus office chair. His clothes were drying on a line stretched across the lab, while his coyote pup gobbled down one of Banner's warmed-up frozen dinners. The warm air from Banner's rusty space heater only reached the pup, so Amadeus should have been shivering. But his big brain was cranking warming his whole body. Fine. You do what you want. Reed was tapping the last key in the sequence. My work here is done. Reed spun, eyes wide, as the red alarm lights flashed. His fingers flew over his keyboard, but it was already too late. His unbreachable system had been breached. Banner figured out that hack years ago. It's all right here in his notes. I just needed a current voice imprint from you to update the security bypass. So thanks. Reed identified the compromised drives and walled them off, while simultaneously running voice print searches on the intruder. But Amadeus wasn't gunning for Reed's most critical data. He skipped the files about nuclear fusion and Shi'ar railguns and time travel. All he wanted was anything that related in any way to the Hulk. All right, I've got your file. Your Amadeus Cho, 16-year-old boy genius on the run. Why this interest in Bruce, young man? Maybe because he's my friend. And where I come from, friends... Don't shoot friends into outer space. Dude, when he comes back... He's not coming back. 
Oh yeah? Let's just cross-check the distance capacity of the shuttle you stuck him in against the map of known worlds and narrow the search to the planets to which you've sent probes in the last two years. And bingo! BR-054 in the Tayo system. And you even have a probe in place to monitor things. But no one's checked it for ages. I've been busy. Reed blushed a bit as he checked the probe. Oh, and it's not even recording properly. What the heck kind of junker is this? It's a shield model. I haven't had time to reprogram it. Listen, you need to come in, Amadeus. I can clear up whatever misunderstandings you've had with the authorities. Your potential is incredible. You just need training. What? And end up in another one of your shuttles? Hang on. Amadeus finished reprogramming the probe and began to scan the planet. His eyes widened with shock. He's not even on this damn planet! Where did you put him? Reed hacked Amadeus's hack and scanned the data. Even when Banner was perfectly calm, he radiated a specific gamma signature, which was entirely absent from BR-054. Reed's stomach stretched involuntarily, then contracted into a tight knot. You killed him! N stop! Stop shouting! Nobody kills the Hulk, you should know that. The shuttle must have gone off course. You're a monster. Reed spun to the monitor displaying the SITREP in India. A retaining wall inside the nuclear reactor had failed. He redirected the TAC team at the meltdown site to a safe room and uploaded a new mission map. Then he turned his attention back to the green phone. I'm a monster. You say you're smart, Amadeus? Then go ahead. You have my files. Look up Hadleyville, Stone Ridge, Jericho, Las Vegas. Take a good look at what the Hulk did to those towns. Yeah, and New York a couple times too. Whatever. How dare you treat this like- Save the outrage, Richards. I've read your logs. When the Hulk trashed New York, he'd been driven insane by that nightmare dude. When he hit Stone Ridge in Jericho, he and Banner had been separated by Doc Samson. And when he attacked Las Vegas, he'd just been blasted by a Gamma Moab and harassed by your own teammates. Why don't you just try leaving him alone? Because if you bothered to notice, he does pretty well when you're not trying to kill him, or help him. Amadeus, you have no idea. Reed put his full concentration into completing and uploading fresh code for the on-site engineers to use while rebooting the nuclear plant's core. Whatever, man. Like you said, let's look at the files. He held up a damn mountain to save you and your friends. He smashed an alien armada to save the White House. He saved the world almost as often as you have. And what kills me is that you used to know that. Messages from India flashed across Reed's screen. The code had worked. The plant was secure. A few scientists on the monitor beamed at him, waving and cheering, tears running down their faces. He closed his eyes and rubbed his forehead. He's a freaking hero. He may hate us puny humans, but he saves us anyway. And I wonder if there wouldn't be fewer dead folks if you launched yourselves into space instead of him. As smart as he was, Amadeus was totally wrong in so many particulars. But in three seconds, Reed surveyed every argument he might use to counter Amadeus' tirade, and he knew they'd all fail. Because on a fundamental level, Amadeus was right. Of course he was right. Reed and his friends had broken at least nine American laws and their own moral code by betraying Bruce. But Reed searched his mind for alternatives, for a different plan, for a better way he could have dealt with a monumental existential threat of the Hulk, and he couldn't find a thing. A tsunami was bearing down on Madripoor, and the emergency force shield had failed. Amadeus's voice still rang out from the receiver. You're the monster, Richards. Not the- Reed got back to work. As his army cleared the mountain, leaving the steps behind, the Hulk stared out across the great stretch of red spear grass before them. Heroim and Korg had always avoided the plains. Too easy to be spotted and tracked by Kayera's forces. But the Hulk was tired of waiting. He led the army down the side of a mountain and marched straight out into the grass. The hivelings squinted in the sun, nervous and exposed. Hulk turned to glare at them. They caught his scent and froze. Meek stepped forward. But Meek paused, then led the army to the shelter of a great stone arch at the edge of the plains. The Hulk walked out alone into the center of the valley. He stood in silence for a moment, feeling the gentle breeze in his hair, touching the top of the high grass with one open palm. Then the grass trembled, and he felt the faint rumbling of the ground beneath his feet. Soon enough, 
Kaira the Old Strong appeared on the horizon, leading a platoon of Imperial Guards. The fifth prefect shouted to the archers who'd climbed atop the stone arch. They let loose a volley of arrows. But Kyera planted her feet, closed her eyes, and raised a hand. And the old power deep in the planet's heart rose up through the rocks and earth. The soles of her feet tingled, and every cell in her body burned, froze, and shifted. Kyera's gray skin hardened to smooth stone. She opened her eyes, and the arrows bounced harmlessly off her body. Behind her, at the edge of the field... Her first officer and her soldiers shook their weapons in the air. The Hulk walked forward through the high grass, a faint smile flickering over his lips as his eyes locked with Kyera's. She realized, with a touch of surprise, that he was impressed. What do you want? You? She studied him, scanning his face and stance. He seemed calmer than before, more in control. But she was channeling the old power now, and she could feel the slow but relentless pounding of his heartbeat through the ground at her feet. He was angrier than ever. She should have struck already, shattered his sternum and stopped his heart, or hacked off his head, or split open the earth and dropped him into the magma below. But if she killed him so quickly, she'd never know. Exactly what she still wanted to know, she didn't know. But in these heartbeats, instead of killing, she found herself talking. You should have listened to me before, Holku. I could have let you join your friends in the steppes. Holku? My desert accent. It suits you. But now my king demands your head. Funny. I was coming for his. She eyed his army on the arch. A few Imperial archers fired off another round of arrows. Almost idly, she knocked them aside with the back of her hand, shaking her head. You've lost the Stone Man and your shadow, your heart and your strategy. You lead an army of angry children. Angry's worked pretty good for me so far. You really don't know what you're up against, do you? Kaira turned to the west, gazing out over the rippling red grass to the deserts beyond. With her old power, she reached out through the crust of the planet, feeling the hot sand of her homeland, the realm of the shadow, a world away. Her heart filled with the old ache. She hadn't known about the old power then, either. I was eleven when I first learned who I am, and it was my weakness that revealed it to me. I was sparring with my father. He tripped me for the ninth time, sent me sprawling, I dug my fingers into the sand, screamed with anger, and turned to stone. And then I broke my father's finest sword with my bare hands. She fixed her eyes on the Hulk, studying his face, reading his heartbeat through the ground. I am Kyera the Old Strong. I carry the old power, the ability to channel the power of the planet itself, gifted to only one in each generation. You call yourself the strongest one there is. You are wrong. The faintest of smiles flickered over the Hulk's face. He didn't deny her words, but she could tell he didn't doubt himself for a second either. But as strong as I am, I am not the greatest danger you face. Still no change. If anything, his breathing slowed. She realized he was enjoying this. She should strike now while he listened. He didn't know it himself yet, but he was dropping his guard. But so was she. I was 13 when he came for me. Just two seasons into my old strong training. I couldn't control it fully. Didn't know the secrets. But I wasn't worried. I could feel it in my bones every time my feet touched the earth. Like it belonged to me. And I to it. And I had six more seasons of training left to discover myself. But then the spikes attacked. A great swarm sweeping up on the village in the night. By then I'd learned to harden my skin at will. But only for moments at a time. So I avoided the first wave of infections. But then it fell on me to defend the survivors against the first fallen who rose again as spikes themselves. My father's body was the first I cut down. But you can't kill a spike with a blade. 
He split in two and reached out to me with a thousand sharp, new tendrils. I felt my stone form giving way. I knew I couldn't shield myself much longer. The elders screamed at me to run. But I was young and grieving and furious. What good was the old power if I couldn't save my own father? Then plasma blasts rained down around me and the spikes shrieked and burned. Death's head guards seized me and a red child laughed. It was the Emperor. He was little more than a boy then, but already he knew what he wanted and how to get it. His death's head robots pinned me to the ground and shot an obedience disc into my chest. He had known the spikes were coming, but he let my whole village die, just to flush out a shadow with the old power and make her his slave. That is your true enemy, and that is what he will do to get what he wants. The Hulk's eyes shifted. She followed his gaze to the hivelings beneath the arch. Meek and the brood still stared at them with hard eyes. But the little ones had grown bored with jeering. A few were leaning on their spears, dozing. Two gambled at Meek's feet, playing tag in the high grass. Kayera turned back to the Hulk, watching him watch his people. A small smile flickered over his face. The Red King will kill every hiveling on that hill. He'll kill everyone you know to get you. But if I kill you first, the others might have a chance. I challenge you by the ancient laws of Savage Sakaar. Individual combat. Hmm. What do I get? A fight. She lunged, sinking her blade deep into the side of his neck. Cute. He knocked her blade free. My turn. The Hulk tossed his shield aside and drew his sword. Kyera planted her feet, raising her blade to block his blow. On the other side of the field, Kyera's soldiers clashed their swords against their shields. No one could move an old strong, but no one could stop the Hulk either. The Hulk sword hit Kyera's blade, and both weapons exploded, strafing both warriors with red-hot shrapnel. The resulting force wave blew the grass back in a huge concentric circle, a full stone step across. The Hulk and Kaira staggered back from each other, gashed and bloody, the bones in their hands still vibrating, and dropped the broken shards of their weapons. May he who dies, die well. Hmm. The Hulk grinned, bowling his fists. Kaira closed her eyes, turning her movements to the turning of the planet. Tremors ripped from her feet through the ground in all directions. Her first officer spun. Take cover! Crouching in dread, Kayera's army formed protective huts by joining their shields. The Imperial rebels took cover behind the base of the arch. Meek pushed as many hivelings as he could grab into a hollow in the ground, shielding them under his massive shell. <laughs> the Hulk's fist smashed down onto Kayera's left shoulder. In the same instant, Kayera slammed the Hulk in the chest with the open palm of her right hand. All of the fury of the green scar reverberated through Kyera's stone form, opening hairline fissures in her skin and shattering the bones of her left arm. But the inconceivable force of the planet's rotation, channeled through Kyera's right arm, rocketed out of her palm and exploded into the Hulk's chest, cracking his ribs, rupturing his lungs, and bursting the left chamber of his mighty heart. Ten stone steps away, Korg and Heroim and their column of refugees paused in the steps, looking back over their shoulders in dread, as the ground shook beneath their feet. Slowly, the dust and smoke cleared. Kyara lay on the blasted plain, broken and bloodied. She lay still, eyes closed, listening through the stones. She felt the hivelings scrabbling to their feet, felt her own men lower their shields and stand, and she felt the great weight of the Hulk's body lying on the earth, just a few arm's lengths away, as still as stone. His steady heartbeat, silent at last. Almost by reflex, her lips formed a small, tight smile. She'd done her job, conquered her enemy. But her heart sank like a rock, disappearing into the silent depths of an endless ocean. And then... <sighs> Kayera's eyes opened wide. <sighs> The Hulk pulled himself to his feet, coughing up dark green blood. Their eyes locked. 
So, that's the old power. He wiped his mouth with the back of his hand. She reached through the stone, felt the tiny vibrations of his bones slowly knitting back together. You should be dead. You look dead. Her left arm hung limp at her side. But with the other, she raised a broken fragment of her staff and silently pointed the blade at the Hulk. Fine by me. He pawed at his own broken sword lying on the ground, missing it with his first grab. But he clenched his jaw, seized the blade, and staggered forward, blood dripping from his gashes. She smiled tightly. He might heal faster than anyone she'd ever fought, but still he bled. But from every drop of blood that hit the earth, a green vine sprouted, twisting upward, its shimmering leaves unfolding into the sunlight. Suck our sun. The Emperor sat up in his throne, peering into his comm device. His heart thundered in his chest, his vision blurring momentarily with anger. That word again, from his own men's mouths, never. What did you say? Suck our sun. It's, it's true that the Eleha vines, they grow from his blood. The Emperor turned to his science minister and nodded. The minister, who now wore the white counselor's robes made available by Denbo's recent departure. Please, Your Grace, no! The Emperor just smiled. High on the mountaintop, Hirwim stared up through the clouds, his gray face turning ashen. A huge black shape appeared in the sky, like a jagged dagger pointing earthward. It hurtled downward. Prophet forbid. What is it? The end. The end of everything. The Hulk spun, looking back toward his army. But the sound was coming from the sky. A black metal spike a hundred feet long slammed into the field behind Kaira's soldiers, sending them flying through the air. Run! What's that? Another bomb? The black spacecraft split open, and a writhing horror of gelatinous monstrosities with jagged, spidery legs spilled out onto the plane. No, Green Star! It's the spikes! What's the big deal? They're just a bunch of little bugs. Kaira ran forward, but the spikes reached her men long before she could. She slowed to a stop. She couldn't help them now. Those are spores! They watched the spikes burrow into the soldiers' flesh. They'll attack anything that lives, and within minutes, even seconds, they take over! Kaira's first officer fell to the ground. He stared blankly at Kaira and the Hulk his head hanging sideways. Then, his skin melted and erupted with sharp, writhing tendrils. The spikes consumed his flesh and made him theirs. Then he collapsed into jelly and merged with a great mound of spiked flesh that had been his platoon. Now what do they do? They destroy the world. The Hulk just sneered as the spikes surged toward them. Didn't you hear? That's my job! The Hulk stepped forward, raising his blade. Kaira stared at the Hulk, marveling. He was either the bravest or the stupidest person she'd ever met. Maybe both. A part of her wanted to shout his name along with the Hivelings, to dream of impossible victories, to believe. But Kaira bore the burdens of a Shadow Guard. Thousands could die if she allowed herself to believe in anything but the unbreakable bond of her oath. And she had sworn to kill the Hulk. Kaira turned as the planet turned, taking its power into the arc of her body as she hurled her blade. It sliced into the Hulk's calf from behind, ripped through his ankle, and pinned his foot to the ground. He spun toward her and struck her with all his strength, sending her soaring out over the plains. When his enemies strike, he welcomes the pain. He embraces the rage and becomes what you wish you could be. Uh, uh. Numb with pain, Kaira gazed up at the pink clouds as she arced through the sky. A floating amoebid stared at her with dumb moon eyes, 
and gracefully flexed its fins, impossibly beautiful and peaceful. Then Kaira reached the apex of her trajectory and pulled her knees to her chest, preparing herself for the brutal descent. As she began to plummet, she caught sight of the Hulk on the plains in the distance, swinging as the spikes swarmed over him. Goodbye, Sakarson. Hello, World Breaker. At the gate of the egg farming village of Ansara, a dozing guard fell from his stool as the embankment on the other side of the main road exploded. Rocks and earth rained down around him as he scrambled to his feet. A tall figure staggered from the cloud of dust, then rose to her full height, snapped the guard's spear in two with one hand, and marched past him into the central square of the village. I am Kyara the Old Strong. The Emperor's shadow! Call in your workers! Weld shut your windows and doors! And stoke your fires and furnaces! The village headman stared up at Kaira in shock. During a visit to the Congress of Mayors six years before, he'd watched from the cheap seats of the Great Arena as Kaira burst the hearts of 16 suspected insurgents with one blow in a ritual execution. He'd even brought home a banner with her picture for his daughter. Now he stared at Kyara in terror. His only coherent thought was that she looked much taller up close. Forgive us, Shadow. Whatever you came to punish us for, we submit and beg you for mercy. All praise the Emperor, the Red King, the hero protector of Sakaar. Listen, you fools! The spikes have returned! The headman goggled for a split second in shock. Then his terror increased a hundredfold. You heard her! Sound the horns! Bring the workers in from the fields! Stoke the fires! Put the children in the cellars and bring out every stick of tallow and barrel of oil! Why are you still standing there? Move! Kyara strode back out through the main gates and stared across the plains at the gelatinous spike horde in the distance, rolling slowly toward the village. A blur of green smashed into the ground, and a great wall of stone and earth plowed up before the spikes. Her heart jumped. She'd pinned the Hulk to the ground, left him for the spikes. But once again, she realized she had no idea of his true strength. She closed her eyes and reached out through the earth, feeling his pounding heartbeat and the gushing of the blood falling from the gashes in his arms. The spikes had torn into him, but he'd ripped their spores out of his flesh. He'd survived what no creature of flesh and blood could survive. She opened her eyes to stare in wonder. But then the spike surged over the top of the Hulk's wall of earth, flooded down to the open field, and infected the grass, spreading like fire throughout the valley. The Hulk leapt away from them in three impossible bounds and ran toward Meek and Eloway and the rest of his army, who scrambled for safety on the rocky arch on the hill. What on Sakaar are you doing here, Old Strong? Kaya returned to see a small calm orb floating down toward her from the sky. Its blue eye flickered and projected an image of the Emperor into the air. As I recall, I sent you to kill the Green Scar. Your Grace, a spike ship landed, released a thousand spores, infected my entire platoon! So? So, these people, this entire continent, is at risk. We need Death's Head Guards, Deathfire Bombs. Calm yourself, my dear. They're already on their way. Five stone steps north, Hiroim and Kor clambered down a mountain, ducking into a crevasse as an Imperial Dreadnought passed overhead, followed by a platoon of guards on floating discs. But as the bombs began to drop from the belly of the Dreadnought, Hiroim emerged from the crevasse to stare out over the spike-infested plains. The ground shook from the Deathfire bombs, but they were falling two stone steps too far south, forming a half-circle around a rocky arch. I don't understand. Korg's eyes were built for close combat in rocky mountains, not staring across deserts. Aren't the spikes farther north, Heroim? The Hulk's army stands beneath that arch, and the green scar is running to them. He's the one they want. But they're not bombing him. Because bombs can't kill him. They're trapping him. Heroim pointed as the second wave of bombs created a wall of fire that surrounded the arch the village of Ansara. 
and the horde of spikes that rolled between them. They're trapping all of them. At the gates of Ansara, Kaira turned to stare in shock as the blazing fires encircled the area and the spikes closed in. If you'd killed the Hulk when you had the chance, it wouldn't have come to this. But the villagers! They don't have anything to do with this! Why trap them? We still don't really know how strong this green scar is, do we? It'll be good to have them on hand, just in case the spikes need some replenishing. The spikes lunged at a shepherd, dragging a pair of trizels toward the gate. Kyera <laughs> jerked the farmer to safety an instant before the spores enveloped his shrieking animals. Kyera! Kyera! Get back here! Without another look back at the floating orb, Kyera dragged the shepherd into the walled village and slammed the gates shut. The headman turned to Kyera, holding up an old, tarnished fire rifle. From the first spike wars, we've got 12 of them and three barrels of fuel. She grabbed the gun, <laughs> vaulted to the wall above the gate, and burned back the first wave of spores with a huge gout of flame. The spike mass recoiled like a child's hand jerked back from a fire bee. She scanned the mass and ran the numbers in her head. Three barrels of fuel would barely kill a quarter of the horde, and no wall had ever been made that spike spores couldn't eventually squeeze their way through. What now? She looked back down at the headman in the courtyard, surrounded by terrified villagers staring up at her with stricken faces. She saw her father's face, full of love and horror, exploding with spikes. Soon these villagers would boil over with spores, dissolve into the horde, and seep down into the basement to eat their own children. But until then, they'd fight. Five guns up here by me! Two on each of the other walls! Bring anything that will burn! We need bonfires on every wall and vats to melt the tallow! She turned to blow back the next wave of spikes as the villagers scrambled, running to their tasks. Then the whole village shook as great chunks of stone descended from the sky to slam onto the spikes outside their gates. The Hulk bounded over the stones, leading his army toward Ansara. A villager aimed his fire rifle, but the brood swept down from above and tore the weapon from his hands. The villager tripped and tumbled from the wall. But the Hulk leapt upward and caught the man. The Hulk's army followed him up the wall, the brood circling back to help the smallest hivelings and Imperials clear the final jump. The Hulk released the villager, then turned to Kyera. As he hunched down, she saw the spike tendrils writhing on his back and erupting from his eyes. She bathed the Hulk with fire. He gripped the edge of the wall so hard it cracked and crumbled. But he held his position until she burned away the last remnants of the infection. Only when she saw his grimace turn to a grinning snarl did she ease off the trigger. The Hulk rose, smoking and scorched, and nodded. Thanks. Those were starting to itch. The Hivelings slapped the backs of shocked villagers. The Hulk grabbed Kyera's gun, checked its controls, then turned to the next wave of spikes. The Emperor's comm orb floated up behind Kyera. Now, while he's playing hero, you still have a chance. Kyera jerked a fire rifle from the hands of the villager. The Hulk turned to stare at her, grinning, underlit by the flames. Through the stone wall beneath her feet, she felt his heart pounding with fierce joy, steady and true. <laughs> and she joined him on the wall, standing shoulder to shoulder, burning back the spikes. Eloway strode through the panicking villagers, shouting orders and clearing bottlenecks. Soon she had one group smashing furniture and hoisting the pieces up to the bonfire tenders on the walls, while another team scoured the lower levels of the walls, cramming any gaps with earth and clay. Meek the Brute and the Hivelings just wandered through the main courtyard, heads tilted, scenting the air. Meek spun, pointing toward a silo in the center of the courtyard. A terrified Imperial farmer stood before the doors, holding a pitchfork. Wait! This facility is off-limits! You can't... Meek clubbed the farmer aside and tore open the doors. 
A warm scent flooded over him, and the air seemed to shimmer with golden light. An enormous Hiver Queen towered over him, her limbs chained to the ceilings and walls. Beneath the grated platform she sat on, a pile of glistening eggs lay in a collection chamber. Horror and elation, hope and rage, love and fury exploded in Meek's mind. You've come! The air filled with light. Meek stumbled forward toward the queen. You, Kimming, you're calling. We never thinking they're still being, never dreaming. He touched his antennae with hers. The hivelings knelt on the ground around them, eyes rolling back as they chemmed this new bond. Meek exploded from the silo, seized the first three villagers he saw, and shook them in the air like dolls. Dirty, beauty, pinkies! Meek killing all of you! All of you! Meek! No! no. Eloy bolted down from the wall, shock in her eyes. We're saving these people! What are you doing? One of the last queens here! And these people slaving her! Chaining her in the dark! Making her lay and eating her eggs! Eloy stared in horror as the queen staggered out of the silo, blinking in the sun, flanked by the hivelings. The queen's shell was mottled and cracked, edged with moss. Her eyes were cloudy, and the chitin around her wrists had been worn raw by her manacles. But the light in the courtyard seemed to soften and glow as she hugged the weeping hivelings to her sides. When Eloe was a child, the cook had baked her half a hiver egg every morning. On holidays, her mother took over the cooking. Not knowing any better, she sautéed Eloy an entire egg and seasoned it with ground salt grass. Now, as the hiver queen keened, embracing the hivelings, the sweet, meaty taste of the pink yolk flooded Eloy's mouth, and Eloe burst into tears. <laughs> Meek hoisted the farmer into the air, snarling into his face. <laughs> now, Meek! Eloy lurched forward. She could barely see through her tears, but her sword was in her hand. What was she doing? Was she going to help me kill the Imperials who had slaughtered and enslaved his species for generations? Or was she going to hide her own guilt by burying her blade in Meek's belly? She saw her mother's indulgent, imperious smile, and her heart swelled with hate and love. Then the wall behind her crumbled. A great spike spore surged past to stab into the queen's side. Kayera, standing on the wall above, spun and aimed her fire rifle. The queen was enormous, twice the size of Meek. If the queen melted into spikes, she'd kill everyone inside the courtyard within minutes. There was only one choice to be made. But as Kayera pulled the trigger, the <laughs> blocked her blast with his own hand. What are you doing? Fighting for friends! <laughs> the Hulk leapt down toward Meek and his queen. An Imperial pleasure cruiser descended over the village. Kaira looked up to see the beaming faces of the oligarchs cheering from its decks. Drops of shimmering nectar struck her upturned face as a giggling duchess spilled her drink. The Green Scar, ladies and gentlemen, brought to you live on Vidbox by Pleasure Cruiser 12. He just doesn't give up, does he? But those spikes aren't exactly pushovers either, my granddad always told me. This is insane. As Kaira leapt down into the courtyard, the Hulk shoved Meek and the Hivelings aside and ripped the spike spore from the Queen's side. The spore's tendrils whipped around his wrist, stabbing into his forearm, but he held it out at arm's length and locked eyes with Kyera. No! Kyera fired her flamethrower at the Hulk's fist, incinerating the spore. The spore caught fire, burned and died, hissing and popping, until all that was left was black ash. The Queen shuddered. Blood gushed from the wound in her side, but her calming scent swept over Meek and the Hivelings. My queen. My queen. Yes, little king, I live. Eloy stood to one side, her teary face blank, her sword dangling from her hand, until Meek reached out and pulled her into the circle with the Hivelings. 
fighting for friends. His arm was around her shoulder, and she began to sob again. Awake! Awake! Here comes the cavalry! All your favorites from the great arena! Call the Cronin! Heroine the Shame! Soon to join Meek the Unhived, who's sporting a big new look. Little LOA and the Green Scar himself in their final stand in the doomed farm town of Ansara! After the last of the soldiers had passed them on the mountainside, Hero women Korg had attacked the platoon of floating discs from behind, destroying six of the vehicles but capturing three. Now they sailed down into the courtyard of Ansara, shouting at the refugees and villagers to climb aboard. The headman was the first to scramble for a disc, but Eloy shoved him back and helped meek load the queen and hindlings. The Hulk and Korg stood on the wall with the last charged fire rifles, keeping the spores at bay, as Kyera and Eloy ushered refugees onto the discs, and Heroim evacuated load after load of rebels and villagers to the spikeless plains beyond the firewall. These guns are almost dry! Almost there! Just another hundred to evacuate! Kyera followed a whale and found a tiny villager child huddled in an alley between storehouses, sobbing and lost. She picked the boy up and gave him a smile, checking him under the chin, then held him close to her chest as she eyed the sky, waiting for the next floating disc to return. He pressed against her without a word, tucking his cold face under her chin. She channeled the old power from the earth to warm her skin where it touched his. She felt his tears dry, and his ragged breathing began to even out against her collarbone. Working with the enemy now, Shadow. Kaira turned as the Red King's comm orb floated down from the smoky sky. I have not forgotten my oath to you, Your Grace. She cast a wary eye at the Hulk on the wall above as he fired his gun at the spikes, and she spoke the words she knew that she must. Once your subjects are safe, I'll kill the Green Scar. Be enough. We've seen you try. You can't kill the Hulk, or won't. That's why I released the spikes. She stared at his floating image in shock. He studied her face, breaking into a broad smile as the realization crept into her eyes. You released them? That's beautiful. After all these years, you can still be surprised. You really are too good for this world. Kyra felt the child's head turn under her chin and realized he was staring directly into the Red King's eyes. The Red King sneered, staring at the child with distaste. But you betrayed me, didn't you? No. Yes. I gave you orders, shouted them even. But you pretended not to hear. And now, here you are, fighting for monsters and blood scum instead of me. Kyra the Oathbreaker. Goodbye. Kyra looked up as Deathfire bombs tumbled from the belly of an Imperial Dreadnought, emerging from the Great Bank of Smoke directly overhead. <laughs> Just close your eyes. Quiet and obedient, the boy squeezed his eyes shut and tucked his head back under her chin. She felt his little heart pounding, but his breathing was slow and even, and she knew he trusted her. He had watched Kyera the Old Strong fall from the sky and stride into danger unharmed to burn the spikes and save his village. He knew she would protect him, always and forever. The boy's skin burned off in an instant. His brain evaporated as his bones blew apart. And then the flames subsided, and Kaira stood stock still as the child's ashes blew from her angled, empty arms. Tears ran down her stone cheeks. And then she heard a heartbeat, steady and true. The green scar walked through the embers, and extended his hand. The last floating disc rose from the burning crater where Ansara had once stood. Covered in grime and ash, Heroine, Korg, Eloy, the Hulk, and Kyera gazed at each other in solemn silence. You who would be warbound, speak your true name and be bound to us forever. For so many years, she'd fought so hard to stay true to the Shadow Treaty. So strange that in the end, casting it aside felt so easy. 
she felt her whole world crack and crumble away, leaving her with only a fierce, hot gladness that she barely understood. I am Kyara the Old Strong, once the Emperor's shadow. Now I'll fight by your side until we all are dead. Or until I split the Red King from gullet to groin. Works for me. Hulk turned to the sky and raised his great arms into the air. Come here, you stupid pinkies! The aristocrats on the pleasure cruiser grabbed each other as the ship banked around, drawing close to the green scar. The camera operator leaned out of a porthole, her assistant holding her by the belt, focusing her lens on the monster the whole world was talking about. You tried to kill us with swords and spears! You tried to kill us with bombs! You tried to kill us with your stupid spikes! But that just made us mad! So get ready, Red King, you little coward! We're coming for you! The Red King stared into the Hulk's face on his talk disc and felt his muscles tremble as the anger surged through his body. No one had ever talked to him like that and lived. No one. Not even the Father Emperor himself. The Red King flipped the record tab on the side of his device so every citizen in Imperia could see his face and know his wrath. I'll kill you all! <sighs> he smiled and leaned in closer. I will kill you all! Heroine, Korg, and Eloway took three of the floating discs and led six different Imperial patrols in different directions to cover the escape of the Green Scar's rebels and refugees. That evening, they all converged at a site suggested by the 5th Prefect, the lowest level of the Cave of Size, which no Imperial soldier would enter for fear of the Makaw Magong lurking in the magma pools. But everyone knew the Green Scar wasn't scared of lava monsters. The brood squatted in the eerie underlighting provided by a small pool of magma, dangling a small green doll in the air. The green scar tumbled from the great portal, fell through the air, and smashed into the ground. She slammed the doll into a jumble of twigs and rocks. The brood lifted up three red dolls carrying toy spears and jabbed them at the green doll. Weakened by his journey, he bled when the soldiers cut him. And so, they slaved him, sold him, sent him to die fighting the Red King's monsters in the sands of death. The brood lowered her own head into the scene, lashing out with her tentacles in her best imitation of a devil corker. Then she hoisted the green doll with a tentacle and bashed it against her face and shoulders until she was lying on her back twitching. The green doll perched triumphantly on her belly. But what do you know? He was a bigger monster than any of them! <laughs> the children tackled the brood as soldiers stepped around them. On the other side of the cave, Meek and Eloway hunched over the Hiver Queen, changing the poultices on her wounds. The animal master of Ansara, a nervous old man who had been responsible for caring for the queen during her long years of imprisonment, murmured quiet directions, avoiding Meek's eyes. After discovering who the animal master was and what he'd done, Meek had tried to throw him from the floating disc during the evacuation. Eloway had intervened, pointing out that the queen's injuries required specialized care, and the master would have a great incentive to keep her alive if he knew his own life depended on it. But now the queen's bleeding had nearly stopped. She filled the air with a soothing, warm scent that calmed everyone in the cave. When the animal master lost his footing on the rocks while moving a wash bucket, Meek caught him by the elbow by reflex. Thank you. They stared at each other in shock for a second. <laughs> Eloway felt a great weight lift from her heart. Heroim and Korg stood with the Hulk on a ledge overlooking the encampment. <laughs> Korg watched Meek and the Animal Master exchange small, uncomfortable smiles. But Heroim just shook his head in disbelief. <laughs> What's the matter, Heroim? They're all getting along fine. Yes, they are. And such a thing I have never seen. Not in my twenty seasons of childhood and apprenticeship. 
Not in my long seasons of shame in the wild. Not in my thirty seasons of service to Angmo the Great. Imperials have always hated Hivers, and Hivers have always hated Imperials, and both have always been leery of the Shadow, and the Shadow have always shunned them both. This is the way of Sakaar, a world of hate, where peace only lives in the scrolls. But now, Hivers and Imperials work side by side while monsters care for their children. Well, that's a good thing, isn't it? And it makes sense. We've got a shared enemy. Back on Krona, two mountains will always lay aside a grudge to fight a flock of Earth Eaters. Heroine turned to gaze at the Hulk with probing eyes. The Hulk eyed him back. Don't say it. Uh, say what? You say you don't believe in prophecy, but I can see the word right there on the tip of your tongue. Oh, I wasn't... Don't. Heroine stared at the Hulk, mouth open. The Hulk smirked, and Korg slapped Heroim on the back. <laughs> the children stopped mauling the brood for a moment, and shouted and laughed along without even knowing the joke. The adults glanced up from their work. Heroim finally smiled as well, shaking his head. Then he turned to see Kyera walking toward them from the surface, her face grim and drawn. Green Scar, it's time. In the first battle of the Green Scars War, the Red King sent a thousand Imperial soldiers to drive a mass of spikes three stone steps wide to the mountains where the Green Scars people hid. The spikes had consumed a thousand acres of savanna along with three Trizel flocks. They were on the verge of swamping the hidden mountain caves when the Green Scar and his war bound emerged to meet them. Soldiers of the Empire! When I was the Emperor's shadow, we fought side by side. You live today because you trusted me, time and time again. Remember that service and listen to my words. We are not your enemy. The spikes are. Every second you let them live, you endanger every other living thing in this world. Your lives and the lives of your elders and children. But the Imperial soldiers, too young to remember the first Spike War, and more fearful of their king than any other power, triggered their flame guns. The Spikes surged forward. So the Green Scar raised his fists, <laughs> pounded the ground, and split open a chasm that exploded with a sea of magma. The Spikes tumbled into the lava and burned. A great Makam Magong surged up from the depths, seizing Imperial soldiers running from the edge of the crevasse. A handful of Imperial slaves tending the panicked Dramoths teetered at the brink of the lava, until Kaira the Old Strong leapt across the lake and knocked them to safety. But the Red King's soldiers fired their guns, shattering the ledge of rock she stood on, and she tumbled toward the lava below. The Hulk leapt across the boiling lake to catch Kyara. They landed safely on a chunk of stone in the middle of the lava, and she smiled at him through the swirling steam and embers. You didn't have to do that. I'm an old strong. In my stone form, I can't be burned. I know. Her cheeks warmed. The Maka Magong leapt up again, and the Hulk leapt out over the lava, one arm around Kyara's waist. She felt the great rush of the wind in her face, and her heart leapt at the sudden sight of amoebids drifting lazily through the pink clouds of her head. The world fell silent as she and the Hulk reached the crest of their leap over the clouds. The last time she'd sail through the sky like this, she just tried to kill the Hulk. But today, it gave her the faintest smile. Then his arm tightened around her waist, and they plummeted back through the clouds as the shattered remnants of the Imperial Army fled back across the plains. When the Hulk and Kyera slammed down into the savannah, they sent up a plume of dust visible for six stone steps. The rebels from their encampment soon joined them, along with another 200 refugees displaced by the spikes. Hivers of all hues and sizes collected around Meek and the Queen, kemming and chattering. They came from a dozen different hives, but when the Queen reached out and touched Meek's shoulder, they breathed deep, inhaling her pungent fragrance, and huddled close. 
Most of them hadn't seen a queen since their hatching. None had seen a living queen in years. They sang and cried and laughed, and a handful of them passed out. The animal master scurried through the crowd, checking temperatures and administering water and honey. The Hulk could calm their excitement, but his eyes locked on a floating disc winging toward them from the south. The fifth prefect dismounted before the disc came to a full stop and walked over to the Hulk and Kyera with a stiff, anxious gait. Three more spike ships have released their spores north, east, and west. The Imperials are driving them toward us through the forests and the villages. They're consuming every person, plant, and beast they meet along the way. The Hulk gazed out over the field of refugees and felt a surge of hot anger rush through his veins. This was their stupid planet. They should know what was coming. But they just mingled and chatted, sharing food and water and stories, secure in the knowledge that the Green Scar would protect them. His eyes met Kyera's, and he thought of her village. Her father consumed by spikes. The Red Prince laughing. This is stupid. He turned toward the Fifth Prefect's floating disc. You stay here and watch the camp. I'm gonna go stop this. Korg put a hand on the railing of the floating disc. Grayskin, I know you're getting stronger. But even you can't take on the Spike Horde and the Red King's army by yourself. You don't get it, Korg. I'm mad. And the madder I get, the stronger I get. What happens if the spikes take you? They can't. You saw that. I saw them burrowing under your flesh until I burned them out. As strong as you are, you're still flesh and blood. What if they make your strength their own? What happens then? Same thing that'll happen if we run around and wait for them to catch us. Meek blinked, confused turning to gaze at the Hulk and Kyera and Korg. He scented the Hulk's rising anger, and his hearts fluttered with dread. The hivelings around him sniffed and turned to him. But there was a much worse smell in the air. <coughs> Meek spun, his hearts pounding, and the air turned sour and cold. The Animal Master was the first to see the dark shadow wriggling beneath the translucent skin of the Queen's abdomen. Then the spike broke the surface of her skin, and before the Animal Master knew what he was doing, he reached out, seized it, and ripped it out of her body. The spore's spikes immediately plunged into his hand and wrist, and he felt hot fire surge through his blood. He knew then it was over, and his lips moved in prayer. But the part of his mind that had studied biology and practiced husbandry for 40 seasons suddenly wished for a scribe and paper. No one knew that a spike infection felt like a fire bee sting as it raced through your veins and muscles. No one knew the sudden taste of sweet honey that flooded your mouth as the fire rose up the back of your neck. Then the animal master turned to see the queen's huge, gentle eyes gazing at him. He smiled. Of course, the honey was her gift. And then the spikes liquefied his brain and burst from his eyes, and he knew no more. Meek lunged forward, knocking the dissolving Animal Master away from the Queen. The Queen seized Meek, her king, by the back of the shell and flung him away. He rolled through the grass, scrambling to his feet, and stared in shock as spikes erupted all along her abdomen and back. A dozen hivers ran to her. She spun in a circle, knocking them out of harm's way as the spikes surged over her body. Meek staggered forward, unable to form words. He reached out to her. You did all you could, and you gave me so much. One last moment with all the children. I always dreamed of hatching. But you have to run, little king. Our time is past. <laughs> Meek cammed desperately, flooding the air with pheromones of love and despair and anguish and pleading. But the spikes surged over the queen's face. The chitin fell from her dissolving eyes, and she lunged toward him. The Hulk swung a great mace, clubbing the queen aside before she reached Meek. Meek attacked the Hulk from behind and knocked him to the ground. Do not killing her! Kyera grimly stepped forward, raising a fire rifle. She's gone, Meek. Meek lunged forward, ripping the gun from Kayara's hands. He stared at her and the Hulk, 
panting, his eyes glazing over. Then he turned to face the queen as she reared up, spiky tentacles lashing toward him. Meek pulled the trigger and burned their queen to ash. The purplish light from the burning field extended the twilight long after the sun had set. The Imperial rebels and refugees had long since packed their belongings, preparing to march wherever the Green Scar commanded. But Meek and the Hiver still hunched at the edge of the fire, coming and praying. It's time to go to the desert, Heroine. We must call on the Shadow Elders. They can't hoard their power any longer. That's useless, old strong. We're Oathbreakers. Anathema. No. They'll listen and they'll help. She nodded toward the Hulk. Because of him. You're coming with us, Hulku. Forget it. I told you I'm ending this, and I don't need any help. Kaira locked her eyes with his and turned to stone. The earth shifted under the Hulk's feet. Stones rose and twisted, wrapping around his legs, holding him to the ground. You're growing stronger every day. I can feel it through the earth. But I could still spill your blood and break your bones. And that means the spikes could still kill you. And that means if you walk blindly into their midst in rage, they will take you and you will become the World Breaker. She stared into his eyes, listening to his heartbeat. He loomed over her, huge and furious. But he had heard her. She turned her back on him and the stone around his feet crumbled back to dust. The Shadow Elders will only join this fight if they believe, Heroine. You must convince them. Believe what? This blasphemous folly. That he is the one they have been calling. The healer. The savior. The Sakarsen. A small yellow-shelled hiver wiped the tears from his eyes. Not the Sakarsen! Sakarsen is Meek! Meek turned from the fire and silently cammed, warning the little hiver to fall silent. But the little one stuck at his chin. I know the old rhymes! Unite us and destroy us! Hero Meek! King Meek! He is the Sakarsen and the Worldbreaker! He has delivered us and destroyed us forever! Meek, not the Sakarsen. Not the Worldbreaker. Just Meek. But he pulled himself to his feet. Turning to his hive, a dark, hot scent washed over them, harsher than the smoke from the fire. But, you right, little brother. We delivering and destroying, all us hivers. We living new life, but already we dying dead. No queens, no new hivelings, no nothing. So, when the Green Scar and his shadow running west for help... We Hivers heading east to leading the Spikes away. No. Not your choosing, Two Hands. Whatever those shadows having, only thing that's stopping all this, right? As best I know. And seeing Two Hands only way them deciding to giving it? Kayara and Heroine exchanged looks. Yes. Then no more talking. Just fighting for friends. And for ourselves. We turned to the Hivers. Those puny pinkies killing us, brothers! Now we killing them back! The Hivers rose and began to move through the encampment, collecting their weapons and shields. Eloy exchanged looks with the 5th Prefect, then called to the Imperial refugees and rebels. The old and the sick and the families with children will march with the Shadow and the Green Scar into the desert. And nine of every ten of our fighters must join them and protect the weak. But if your heart commands you, one of every ten may come with me to fight alongside our Hiver friends. A half dozen grizzled rebels separated from the crowd to join Eloy and the Fifth Prefect as they walked toward Meek and the Hivers. Meek gazed down at Eloy. His eyes growing misty. Then he clapped her on the back with a claw. Meek, leave the little ones here. No, we stay with Meek. Fighting for the hive. Cord's amber eyes turned moist and fiery. 
I know how this ends. The Hulk just stared back at him. I'm made of stone green skin. I'll be here long after you are dead and buried. So I should just stop caring. But... Just say it. A few hours ago I thought we had a new world in the making. And now I look into the eyes of those hivelings. And Neek. And Eloe. And I fear we've already failed. They only know hate, Greenskin. Go into that desert and bring them back some hope. The Hulk stared into the desert. He tried to bring back that vision of the river, the farm, the children playing in the fields. But it dissolved like a dream half-remembered. <sighs> Korg clapped the Hulk on the shoulder, then turned and walked west, following Meek and the others toward the spikes. Heroim led the rest of the encampment into the desert. With the Hulk silent and brooding, and without the hivelings chittering and kemming, the column fell silent and cold. Within three hours, a great sandstorm swept toward them. Kaira and Heroim ran through the ranks, helping nervous soldiers set up the tarps. And then the whole encampment settled down for the night in their tents, as the winds howled around them. On the first day came fire, on the second day wind. The Imperials around the headmen of Ansara shifted nervously and cast slow stares at the Hulk, who sat beside Kayera on the other side of the tent with his head down, his eyes in shadow. Do not blaspheme, Grandfather. Tell me you don't see the signs, Priest. He held up the mountains, he united the clans, and now the prophets walk. Hiroi mied the Hulk who sat so still he might be sleeping. But Kaira caught Heroim's eye with a sharp, significant stare, and the priest knew the Hulk was listening. Of course, we've all seen the signs, and you're tempted to believe. After all, we've come here to convince the elders that the Sarkarsan walks among us in the flesh. But you must know this is blasphemy. I've said this before. The Prophet uses the Sakarsan and the Worldbreaker only as parables when he speaks of the trials each of us faces in our lives. The old man stared at Heroim, his jaw set. Heroim smiled. He'd seen that look on the face of every child he'd ever preached to. Who in this world ever wants parables? We long for prophecy. I was born in a Saka temple, raised to become a priest. But when I was a child, I read the same scrolls you read. I dreamed of the hero, the savior, the son of Sakar, come to us in flesh and blood. Even worse, I dreamed that I might be he. For the hero comes to us from beyond, and who are my parents? No one could tell me. The signs were clear, so I prepared myself. I would never lie, nor cheat, nor steal, nor profane the Creator's great works, nor the purity of my own body. I would give up all my own desires to become the vessel of life incarnate. And then the day came for my initiation into priesthood. The priests flogged me. Black blood ran down my back and legs, but I stood silent. I knew the peace of the Prophet. The acids scarred me. I smelled my own burning flesh, but I stood silent. I knew the peace of the prophet. And then my master sat before me and stared into my eyes. And he knew. And I tore away, knocked my master to the ground, and so earned my name, Heroim the Shamed. For the prophet entreats us to be like the Sakarzan. But to dream, as I did, of actually being him? Blasphemy. And now I must pray for forgiveness all over again. For the first time, Heroim locked eyes with the Hulk. Because I send you, Hulku, to chase my old forbidden dream. But even more shamefully, I dare to hope you may actually fulfill it. The old man stared at Heroim. You aim to teach me a lesson about blasphemy, priest. But instead, you make me even more of a believer. Hush! Listen! 
The Hulk lunged through the door of the tent. Four devil corpses erupted from the sand before them, waving their tentacles and flashing their fangs. The Hulk charged forward, drawing his sword. Suddenly, the devil corpses reared back, showing their bellies. They're not here to fight you, Green Scar. Just find you. Three gray-skinned shadows stood on a rise in the sand behind the Devil Corkers. The Elders. The Sarkar Priestess Okaime, now the first Elder of the Shadow, had been the fourth Elder when Kaera was lost as a child so many years ago. Fourth Elder was a high enough ranking to share in all decisions of war and peace, and the abduction of an Old Strong by the Emperor's son had been a shocking breach of the Shadow Treaty. But the Red Prince had hidden his crime well in the chaos of the Spike invasion. No one on the Council even learned of Kyera's existence until two years after Angmo the Great drove the Spikes back into the Black Ships and exiled them to the Moon. Only when the Prince emerged in public with an Old Strong fighting his battles did the Shadow unravel the true story. Okaime, then the Fourth Elder, called for war. But before the votes were tallied, Angmo died in his mysterious hunting accident, and the prince became king, with Kyera the Oldstrong as his chosen shadow, under the provisions of the Shadow Treaty. When the council refused to declare the treaty null and void, Okaime stormed from the meeting halls, kicking over the dais and breaking the hinges of the gates. She walked the desert for twelve days, weeping for Kyera the Oldstrong, a girl she had never met but for whose fate she would forever feel searing guilt and loss. But now Okaime was the first elder, sworn to protect her people above all. So she squared her shoulders, smoothed the long robes of her office, and strode between the great devil corkers to stare at the woman the girl had become. Kyara the Old Strong? Yes, first elder. You serve the emperor. No longer. Then you have broken the Shadow Treaty. You bring doom upon your people. The Emperor released the Spikes. He brings doom upon us all. You must return to him and mend this rift. Then Kyera the Old Strong turned to stone. It was the first time the First Elder had ever seen it happen, and her heart pounded with terror and joy and regret. This was the Old Strong who should have grown up with her people, sharing her gift, celebrated as their champion. Okay, you may fought the urge to burst into tears. Can you not see, Elder? The time has come to make all things right. Okay, you may composed herself as she turned to the priest. Heroim the Shamed. Your presence here is forbidden. Who are you to speak of what is right? Once, I called you blasphemers. Heroim looked from Okaime to the second and third elders behind her. But now all that you have worked for has come to pass. The prophecies are coming true, just as they were written, just as you believed. The Sakarzan walks among us. He stepped aside, and the elders gazed for the first time upon the Hulk, who stared back at them with wary hostility. He does not yet shine with the stars, but he raised the mountains. He bound the clans together. From his blood grew the vines. On the first day came fire. On the second day, wind. The beasts reared up before him. You say these words, but what proof? I saw these things with mine own eyes. And though I may be shamed, no shadow until this day has ever questioned my word. I am and forever will be a Sokka priest, First Elder Okaime. Take back your slander or meet me in the sand with your blades. No one moved. The First Elder stared at Heroim in surprise. Then she turned to Kaira, who stared back at her as steady and true as the stone from which she seemed carved. And finally... The First Elder turned her gaze on the Hulk. His unreadable eyes gave her nothing. As her gaze slipped from his, she saw the refugees behind him emerging from their tents. They took in the scene, looking from the Elders to the Warbound, 
sensing that something critical was happening in this eerie silence. Fear and doubt flickered over their faces. Then, one by one, they turned their gaze to the Hulk, and the tension left their shoulders. The First Elder gazed back at the Hulk. Alone, he was a cipher, but with his people. <sighs> she turned and walked back between the Devil Corkers into the darkness. Then come, and be provoked. The Hulk raised an eyebrow, but he followed Heroim and Kayara as the Shadow Elders led them into the darkness. The Devil Corkers burrowed back into the sands, the sun crept up over the horizon, and the Green Scar's people settled down to wait. The Hulk emerged from the darkness to see the Elders entering a great stone edifice in the middle of the desert. He turned to see Kyara and Heroim behind him, but the refugees and encampment were nowhere in sight. Heroim glanced over his shoulder at the rolling hills of empty sand, then turned back to the Hulk and gave him a little shrug. No outsiders should know the true path to the Temple of the Elders. So they transported us. Illusion or magic? Maybe just a miracle. <sighs> Kyra and the Hulk then eyed each other with wary surprise. Heroim raised an eyebrow, the faintest of smiles on his lips, and they followed the Elders through the gates of the tower. What the hell is that? They gazed up at a massive tower within the tower, a conical structure of smooth, polished stone that jutted from the carved stone floor. Blue energy swirled from great crystalline rocks at the top of the cone. Circular winds blew around the chamber, heavy with electricity. This is the vessel that brought the shadow here from our homeworld. The Hulk realized he was looking at the angled tail end of a massive starship, the bulk of which was buried in the ground beneath his feet. We were lost, far from home, but this planet nourished us, and so we strive to protect her with our champion, as is our way. But the old power only visits one in each generation, and Kyra was lost to us long ago. The First Elder gazed at Kyra with sad eyes, then turned back to the ship and laid a palm on the warm stone hull. So we fired up the ancient engines, and we created the Great Portal. It brought the Death's Head guards, who fought back the first Spike invasion. It brought the Silver Savage, who freed the slaves of the Red King. And finally, it brought you. Why? Heroim the Shamed called us blasphemers. No more. For we believe the old stories. The Sakasin will come to all the people of this planet to save us and unite us. The Prophet tells us the Sakasin lies within each of us. But you choose to look outward, scouring the universe for a savior of flesh and bone. So now you have found him. And you must obey him when he calls. Not so fast, child. Your friend may act the part. But he hasn't passed the test. Test? <laughs> I don't think so. But the First Elder just smiled, and darkness surged over the Hulk. He crouched, fists clenched, and spun, but the blackness was complete. He listened for the familiar heartbeats of his friends, but he heard only silence for a moment. Prepare yourself for the ritual provocations of the Saka. <laughs> You can't scare me. I'm not trying to. Blue light blazed as terrible pain ripped through the Hulk's brain. He fell to his knees, back in the maw, reeling from Korg's blow. Meek's great spear stabbed him in the chest once again. And he seethed with fury as Kyra's open palm sent the old power ripping through his chest, exploding his heart. You call them your friends, but they challenged you. They fought you, and they will do it again, because you're a monster. The Hulk pulled himself to his feet. 
Yeah, so are they. The first elder appeared for an instant in a flash of blue light, her piercing eyes boring into his brain. Look deeper, Green Scar. Hot white light ripped away the darkness. The puny heroes of Earth towered over the Hulk, a hundred feet tall, proud, shining, and sneering. So, you think you're one of us now? A hero, sent to save the world? Who did you love? Strange knelt down, staring at the Hulk with eerie, probing eyes. And how many are still alive? This will end as it always does. You'll kill them all. The Hulk looked down and saw Larvin Ski's one-armed corpse lying in the bloody sand. Little Eloway, riven with arrows. Meek, skull cracked. Heroim and Korg, and finally Kyera, gazing up at him. Dead eyes, crumbling into dust. The Hulk stared, his eyes turning white with rage. The puny voice deep inside screamed its tinny message, the only word it knew again and again. No, 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 no. But the voice grew stronger and louder, and the Hulk realized with shock that it wasn't talking to him. It was talking with him. The Hulk joined his voice to Banner's, and together they glared up at the heroes above them. Together they roared into the First Elder's piercing eye. Together they smashed and smashed and smashed. Kayara seized the Hulk by the arm. He blinked and turned and saw the shattered walls of the Elder's great chamber crumbling before him. Okaime hunched, shielded by Heroim, staring at him in quiet horror. How can you unite when your heart is so full of hate? You are not the Sakarsen. It doesn't matter. With your help, he can stop the spikes. He can save millions of people who... You must go. The First Elder turned her back and faded into darkness. Hiroim and Kayera stared at each other in crushed silence as the shadows deepened throughout the hall. Whatever. The Hulk raised a huge fist and pounded the stone floor, shattering its graceful carved designs and sending great cracks ripping down through the bedrock. Then he reached down, dug in his hands, and heaved upwards, ripping the huge stone starship free of the Earth that had held it for 10,000 years. I got what I came for. An hour after the heroim and Kayera had led Hulk and the refugees west into the desert, the brood spied the first new wave of spikes approaching from the east. Korg marched out alone, shouting and waving his hands, hoping to attract the horde south, away from the desert. But after giving his rocky arms a few tentative licks, the spores drifted away, and the stone man realized he couldn't play decoy. Eloway and a few of the fastest hivelings tried next, the spikes responded instantly, leaving the trail leading into the desert to hunt down closer flesh. Eloi and the Hivelings scrambled up a cliff face, the Brood and Meek winged down to carry them to safety, and Korg smashed the rocks above, sending a great avalanche down to cover the spikes. Only fire could kill the spores. But 30 feet of rubble delayed them long enough for Meek to come up with a plan. And, as usual, the plan meant war. We know we can leading the spikes. So, the only question being where to? And where else if not to where the Red King laying his stupid head? A lot more people than the Red King live in Crown City. Thousands of innocents. They're not so innocent. Hundreds of them left the city to follow the Green Scar. The ones who stayed made their choice. What about the children? The babies, the old and the sick? Did they make their choice too? After an hour of discussion, they agreed to use the 5th Prefect's contacts to send a warning to Crown City. 
giving people a day to evacuate before they led the spikes to the gates. Meek seethed a bit, but Eloway felt secretly relieved. Korg patted them both on the back. Thank you for working this trough. Besides, the spikes will have eaten us long before we reach Crown City anyway. They sent the 5th Prefect on to the capital and settled down to wait for the spikes to emerge from beneath the fallen cliffside. But the spikes didn't need their encouragement. Two other hordes were already trampling toward Crown City. The science minister had predicted exactly this kind of disaster from the moment the Emperor had released the first ship of spikes. Spike biology was simply too adaptable and virulent. A roosting honey skipper could take flight while infected and start a new horde a hundred stone steps away. But the minister hadn't expressed her concerns for fear of meeting the same fate as Counselor Dembo. And so she said nothing when the Red King put on his armor, seized an officer who had clearly located the spikes in his territory far too late, and personally dropped him into the heart of the horde. The Red King waited until the man had finished screaming and was thoroughly dissolved into the gelatinous mass. Then he gave his hovering dreadnoughts the signal and incinerated the horde with death fire bombs. But by evening, scouts brought reports of new hordes approaching the city from three different directions. The Red King bombed two of these and sent his death's head guards to eliminate the third. But throughout the next day, new hordes kept popping up out of nowhere, closer and closer to the city's borders. Finally, the king commanded the dreadnoughts to create a massive ring of fire around the city. He ordered his death's head guards to patrol the streets, incinerating anyone who exhibited any sign of infection. A dozen people died trying to cross the fires and escape the city. Another 233 were almost immediately incinerated by Death's Head Guards for various non-spike-related skin conditions or head colds. But during their second hour of deployment, the Death's Head Guards' algorithms improved and 170 people were incorrectly murdered. The per-hour numbers held steady around 150 for the rest of the day, then dropped off considerably. Possibly due to further improvement of the algorithms, or possibly because everyone with a head cold had already been killed. The smoke from the fires was so thick that when the stone starship of the Shadow arrived the next afternoon, most residents of Crown City only heard the explosions and felt the earth shake. But the Red King high in his tower saw everything. When the stone starship glided over the horizon, the Imperial Dreadnoughts launched a barrage from all directions. But the Green Skull and Kyera the Old Strong, standing on the hull of their ship, just batted the missiles from the sky. The Red King seethed, staring through his scope at the Hulk. Green Scar had grown stronger since the Emperor last saw him, and Kyera was grinning as she fought. The pleasure cruiser slid into the Emperor's view, hovering over the stone starship. Dozens of drunk oligarchs laughed and cheered on the decks. The Red King scanned their faces through his scope. These were his people, the children and cousins of the new aristocrats who had swept into power after Angmo the Great died in the bush. The Red King had given them everything, and here they were, laughing as the Green Scar laid waste to the greatest symbols of the Red King's power. The Emperor sneered. Didn't they remember? When the Red King had seized power, he'd killed the old oligarchs and installed new ones in their place. Did these new pretenders think they'd escape the same fate if a Green King took Crown City? He gave his orders to the Science Minister, who relayed them without protest to the Dreadnoughts. The Red King watched through the scope as a dreadnought slowly but inexorably careened through the air to ram the pleasure cruiser. The pleasure cruiser's hull exploded and hundreds of tiny bodies plummeted into the spikes below. The Red King could see their mouths open with terror as they fell. He imagined their screaming and smiled as a warm feeling spread through his body. Then he ordered the ashen-faced science minister to dig up the pleasure cruiser's manifest in the Hall of Records. He wanted to know exactly how many people he'd just killed. He'd calculated his father's totals a few years ago and was very curious to see whether this put him in the lead. But before the minister made it to the door, a great blue flash emanated from the stone starship. The Imperial Dreadnoughts listed, then tumbled from the sky and exploded on the plains below. Then the starship turned toward the city, blue energy rippling over its entire surface. The Red King stared through his scope, his stomach dropping, as the Hulk, standing on the hull, glared toward him, pointing his sword. A great blue flash flooded the chamber, and 
the Emperor's scope went dead. He spun as the room plunged into darkness. Heart pounding, he crouched and grabbed at the ceremonial knife in his belt. It's just a shadow trick. The science minister pointed down over the city. All the artificial lights had gone out. Only the bare flames of the oldest oil lamps still glimmered in the dark. They've just taken out the machines. Just the machines? Our defenses depend on machines. The dreadnoughts, the death's heads, my own armor. We can go to the weapons chamber. It's lined with Shadowstone. The minister led the emperor down the dark staircases, nervously explaining that the weapons chamber was lined with Shadowstone. And thus... Everything within should have survived the attack. As long as you locked the door. The minister kept her mouth shut and focused on her feet as she hurried down the stairs. The emperor stared at her with cold fury. But the door had been locked, and the Shadowstone lining the weapons chamber had worked as advertised. The Emperor's armor hummed to life and wrapped around his body. <sighs> you see, Your Grace? Nothing to fear. The Emperor turned his hard eyes on the Minister. Fear? Did you think you saw fear? He picked up his glowing sword. Seconds later, the Red King wiped the blood from his blade. I'll have to find someone else to fetch the numbers from the Pleasure Cruise Manifest. When the Stone Starship touched down on the charred fields outside of Crown City, a thousand citizens surged forward, cheering and singing. Kayera hopped down from the hull, and the rest of the warbound exited the main hatch, followed by the chittering, laughing Hivers, the proud insurgents, and finally the hundreds of beaming refugees. The Green Scar, still standing atop the ship, watched over the scene, casting a wary eye in all directions. But soon, the crowd of refugees and citizens, Hivers and Imperials, rebels and gladiators, began to look up to him. Kaira caught Heroim's eye. To save us and unite us. He nodded, then shook his head, suppressing a small, disbelieving smile. Then he grew solemn and nodded again, more slowly. You're going to crack your brain, Heroim. Just listen to your heart and believe. Meek seethed, staring as the refugees streaming from the starship began to mingle with the civilians from Crown City. Some hugged their lost friends and family. Too much cheering. Time now for fighting. Killing the rest of them in Crown City before they killing us. <coughs> the pinkies can't touch us. The Hulk had dropped down from the hull of the ship. He held one of the missiles the Dreadnoughts had fired at him and he turned it idly in his hands as Meek gave him a nervous look. No power, no ships, no bombs. We got another job now. <laughs> he turned to gaze at the wall of fire separating them from the spike hordes. You can smell them, can't you, Meek? They're calling to you. Kemming. Kemming? What are you talking about? The spikes don't even have brains. They're just mindless animals designed to eat. Stupid spikes. But the brood bared her fangs, drawing air over the sensory organs in her mouth. Maybe not. Meek tasted the air and scowled. The Hulk leaned forward, peering through the flames, then walked directly into the wall of fire. Wait! But Kaira turned to stone and followed him, with Kord close behind, while Meek and the brood winged over the flames and out of sight. Heroine, we have to stop them. He may or may not be the Sarkarsen, LOA, but he's still the Hulk. And nobody I've met so far can stop the Hulk. The Hulk, Korg, and Kyera emerged from the flames on the other side of the Wall of Fire to see an ocean of spikes filling the valley, writhing and undulating, with jagged pointed lances kicking up like surf from the crests of their waves. They're waiting for us. Be careful, Greenskin. The Hulk held the bomb high over his head deliberately showing it off. It's a death fire bomb. You know what they can do. The waves of spikes rippled and shuddered at the sight, recoiling. But then the Hulk slowly leaned down and laid the bomb in the dirt. <sighs> We're here to talk. The sea of spikes shivered, hummed, and gradually grew still. A great arch formed in the gelatinous wall of spikes, directly before the warbound. A pathway lay inside, eerily illuminated by firelight glimmering through the translucent mass of spikes forming its roof. 
The hook briefly eyed Korg and Kyara, then descended into the passage. The others followed, and the entrance sealed shut behind them. As the warbound disappeared beneath the sea of spikes, Meek screamed from above. They're eating them! Eating them! Ah! He dove down toward the bomb that the Hulk had left in the dirt. But before he could reach it, it disappeared under a wave of spikes. Ah! The brood, flying low over the sea, pointed at murky shadows beneath the surface. There they are! She buzzed over the shadows as they moved across the plains. They looked up as a great mound of spikes before them parted to reveal a huge black starship. The mouth of the passageway through the spikes below opened, and the Hulk, Korg, and Kyara emerged. The spikes around the doorway to the spaceship retracted, and the Brood and Meek descended to stand beside the others. I can kim them now, Hulk. They are calling for you. Can't trusting these stupid little spikes, two hands. What you hoping to finding here? Hulk walked into the great arched chamber and looked up. Big spikes. Four huge, five-limbed forms loomed overhead, their translucent skin hissing and popping as sharp appendages extended and retracted in pulsing patterns. Spike fathers? The brood tilted her head back and waved her snout through the air in slow, small circles, tasting the warm currents of air swirling around them. Should have kept that bomb, two hands. Not gonna need it. You know what the spikes do? We have to stopping them now! The brood laid a calming tentacle on Meek's shoulder and nuzzled his antennae. I know you're still grieving, Meek, but do not deny what I know you can kim. It's time to listen. Meek leaned against her, shell to shell, and inhaled. The Spike Fathers looming overhead trembled, spun in slow circles as the patterns of their undulating tendrils grew more complex. Orbound, Meek coming with all of you now, showing you what the big spike's saying. The minds of the Warbound opened up, as they had in the village of Headman Char, and the deep, liquid voices of the Spike Fathers echoed through their brains. Thank you, little Buck, and thank you, Green Scar. You could have, maybe should have, burned us all, but you listened to our call. So, hear our story and decide. You know us as the Spikes, killing spores that consume any organic material we touch. But this is not who we truly are. In our natural form, we live in open space, floating between planets, absorbing cosmic energies from dying stars. Every few generations, we migrate, moving to new galaxies in our ancient ships. We meant to pass this world on our way to your sun, but something went wrong. Our ships crashed on the surface of the planet, stranded on the ground, starved of cosmic energy. We lost our minds and our souls. Hungry, so hungry, we consumed everything we touched, but nothing could satisfy us. We killed Millions. Finally, the Father Emperor's robots beat us back, loaded us into our few remaining ships, and launched us into the skies. But instead of returning us to the stars, our ships landed on your shattered moon. Locked within their hulls, we spent three generations eating each other alive. Now we've been released. But we are trapped on the ground once again in these broken vessels. So once again, our children run insane through this world. But we belong in the stars. And you have a ship. The Warbound opened their eyes, exchanging looks. Our children are hungry. So hungry. But for a little while we can control them. We can help you. If... You help us. Bring that wood up! Keep the fires going! The fifth prefect organized the refugees in long lines along the Ring of Fire, watching as they passed chunks of wood and fuel to feed the flames. His heart raced. In all his years, he'd never seen so many resist the Emperor. 
His eyes widened as he caught sight of a handful of silk-robed oligarchs making their way across the field, pushing a cart full of fire rifles. Finally, they were all working together. He grinned at Elloway, wiping grime from his sweaty face. But she just scowled and stared at the wall of flame. Despite all they'd done to keep it blazing, the fire had shrunk to half its height. She eyed Heroine, who stood guard atop the stone starship, and clambered up to join him. When the fire dies, we die. She stared over the wall of fire at the rolling ocean of spikes beyond. We wait for the green scar. Heroine, too, gazed at the flames. Eloy turned to point at the dark skyline of Crown City. Inside the city we could defend ourselves. And what about the Emperor and his army? They could get auxiliary power back up at any moment. We should strike now before- We wait for the green scar. Eloy dropped off the edge of the starship, seething, and stalked back toward the fire. The fifth prefect eyed her and pulled his collar up over his mouth to hide the grin he was suddenly unable to suppress. His heart pounded. He was about to take the biggest risk of his life. Eloy! He gestured to the silk-robed men, standing nervously by their now empty wagon. These men have come to see you! The oldest of the oligarchs swallowed nervously and raised a small gold medallion stamped with the seal of the Senate. Eloy's eyes widened. Eloe Kaifi, daughter of Ronin Kaifi, we come to you from the Imperial Senate. Never did we dream this moment would come, but the days of the Red King are over. The old senator shakily bent to one knee at Eloy's feet. It's time for a queen. Move away from the wall. They stared at Hiroim in confusion, then scattered. As the first wave of spike flesh hit the fire, a great gout of steam and smoke exploded into the air. The flames surged, beating back the burning spores. But then the second wave of spikes hit, and the spores spilled over the wall. Eloy! Bring the fire rifles, now! Heroine was answered only by the screams of the panicking civilians. Then, a huge yellow tower of flame exploded from the gates of Crown City, and Heroine screamed a curse that no psycho priest should even know. Eloy and the 5th Prefect led the rebels through the burning gates of Crown City, hacking through the guards and charging down the central street. Eloy's heart pounded with rage and joy. She saw herself stabbing the Red King in the throat and tearing his crown from his head. She saw herself standing in the great arena as thousands chanted her name. She saw the senators and the judges and the guards turning out the wicked and corrupt. She saw children beam as she passed by. She saw her face, her father's face, Lavan Ski's face, carved on the sides of a great stone tower, gazing down forever on a city transformed. We're going all the way, brothers! To the palace! The gouts of white fire roared down from above. The soldiers at Elway's side burned. We brought her, your grace, just as you asked. Thank you, Senator. The Emperor floated over the flames in his golden armor. The Senator bowed, and the Emperor delivered his reward. <laughs> Incinerating the man with a blaze from his palm. So nice to clean house from time to time, don't you think? Eloy stood among the burning bodies, shaking with fury. After all she'd been through to be so naive, she should have known. She'd begun this journey with the stink of her father's charred flesh in her nose. It only made sense it would end the same way. But back in the maw, she'd screamed and wept. Now she gripped her sword and stared the Red King in the eye. Eloy Kaifi! Highborn traitor to the Empire. Do you prefer incineration or decapitation? Eloy raised her blade. Ah! The Emperor grinned and drew his blazing sword. But before he could swing, a green blur descended from above and slammed into the ground between the Emperor and Eloy. How about we just kick your ass? The Red King looked up to see the huge Spike Fathers looming over the rooftops, staring down at him firelight refracting eerily through their transparent bodies. Dead Imperial soldiers hung from their jagged tendrils. Your city's ringed with spikes, and they're fighting on our side now. Kyera stepped forward with Korg to stand behind the Hulk. Give up, Red King. A platoon of terrified Imperial guards charged out between the Hulk and the Red King. Protect his grace! Ah! 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 
But the Red King just mowed them down with a blast of fire. The Green Scar is mine! He raised his armored fist and fired missiles from his forearms. The Hulk reeled as they exploded in his face and chest. Then he pounded the ground, kicking up massive chunks of debris. As the Emperor dodged the raining rocks, the Hulk shouted at Meek through the dust and haze. Meek, you gotta Kim! All of us warbound! With him! The Hulk strode out of the swirling dust toward the Red King. So when I beat him to death, he'll know why! Meek nodded, and the smell of burning flowers began to emanate from his body. The warbound inhaled, letting Meek slip into their minds. The brood began to vibrate her wings, zooming in circles, darting in and around the Red King, surrounding him with Meek's chem. The Red King wrinkled his nose in disgust, then narrowed his eyes as sounds and images began to flood his mind. He spun, firing missiles in all directions, but the warbound just ducked or batted the bombs aside. The Hulk stared, eyes narrowed, as the visions flooded through all of them. Meek's father bled out. Eloway's father burned. Korg's brother cracked and crumbled. Lavin's ski fell dead in the sand. And the nameless, trusting child nestled under Kyera's chin turned to ash all over again in the ruins of Insara. Kyera, tears in her eyes, turned to gaze at the Hulk as a faint crackling hit the air. He stood with fists clenched, every tendon taut with rage. He was seeing everything the Red King was, and the fury was spreading through him like a physical force. His bones shifted, his muscles flexing and expanding. The angrier the Hulk got, the stronger the Hulk got. He grew three inches while Kaera stared in shock. <coughs> but the Red King just stared down at them with contempt. What do you want from me? Tears? For these slaves? For these monsters? All your precious loved ones, yes, I killed them, as is my right, my duty, and my pleasure. The Hulk stared at the Red King in silence. Then he bowled a fist, stepped forward, <laughs> and pounded the Emperor a half mile down the main thoroughfare to smash through the columns of the Angmo Memorial and the statue of the Father Emperor, which tumbled to the ground and shattered. <laughs> The Red King staggered to his feet as the Hulk descended from above, smashing him into the ground. <laughs> then he backhanded him, slapping him across the square. Half of the Red King's wrecked armor fell from his body. His left arm hung limp at his side, but he leaned against a stone dais at the crossroads and leered at the Hulk with a dark grin. <sighs> All right, Green Scar. One last chance. Kneel down before me, tear the hair from your head, lick the dirt at my feet, and beg me eight times to stay my royal wrath, or I'll burn every soul you ever tried to save. You're dead. The Red King stared into the Green Scar's eyes and felt the truth burrow into his bones, as if the words themselves had already killed him. <laughs> now it was finally upon him. But he didn't feel fear, or regret, or anguish, or any of the other emotions he'd seen flicker over the faces of the people he'd killed. Not even surprise. He remembered the Father Emperor staring in shock as the hunting spear ran through his heart. He remembered the council members and their wives screaming in terror, knocking over the banquet table as he advanced. They threw their golden knives and plates, and finally even chunks of the roasted Hiver Queen ribs. But he just hewed them apart and studied their weeping, pleading eyes as they died. Why did they fear death so much? Was it the pain of dying? The fear of punishment in the hereafter? Or was it the fear of not existing? Of passing into the void, vanishing forever, even to oneself? The Red King mulled over all these strange thoughts, turning them in his head and inspecting them from every angle. And they all left him cold. The Red King didn't fear death. He just hated losing. So he pressed his naked palm against the handprint carved in the stone panel on the dais at the crossroads. He'd had these markers placed at every intersection in the city the year he took the throne. The people saw them as symbols of their Emperor's omnipresent power. But the Red King had never been much for mere metaphors. 
The mechanics under the panel scanned the Red King's biometrics and sent a signal down a Shadowstone wire to a chain of bombs embedded deep beneath Crown City. The Father Emperor had created the system years before his son's birth. The idea was the culmination of the simple lessons that had been taught by the War Book for generations. If your enemy invites you in, beware. But who would imagine that an entire city could be a trap? <gasps> Kyera the Old Strong fell to her knees. She pressed her hand against the cobblestones, reaching down with her old power as if she could outrace the signal in the Shadowstone wire. But the spark reached the bombs. The cracked tectonic fault split wide. The city shook, and a great crack ripped down the street between the Red King and the Green Scar. A hot wind surged up from the chasm, followed by a gout of lava that set the nearby rooftops on fire. Terrified civilians hiding in the buildings shrieked. The Hulk slammed his open hands together, sending a shockwave to shatter their windows and blow up the flames. Kaira and Korg kneeled near the crevasse, faces stricken. Farewell, Holku. What are you talking about? I'm an old strong. This planet talks to me, and it cannot hold. The Red King has cracked its plates. Yes. Stone speaks to stone. This is the end. The fifth prefect, staggering through the rubble, stared at them in dull shock. But the Green Scar! The Green Scar will save us! Hush, Softskin. The crust of the very planet is shifting. With all his strength, the Green Scar could smash this world to pieces. But what can he do to heal it? The heat from the magma surged through the air in waves, singeing the Hulk's face. He felt the ground shift under his feet, heard the foundations of the surrounding buildings groan and crack. The people were hiding in the buildings. Thirty-seven people. The Hulk saw himself turning his back, leaping through the air, sailing over the city, hurtling out over the plains toward the steps. He was strong now, as strong as ever. It would take just two leaps. Ten seconds, and he could be gone forever. The Hulk just wanted to be left alone. He stared at Kyera. He felt her old power in the stones under his feet. He felt her hand on his heart, sensing his heartbeat, steady, even, and true. He smiled at her. And then he turned and jumped into the yawning crevasse, disappearing into the lava below. He calls himself Worldbreaker, because he knows that one day, his rage will burn this planet clean. But today, the planet burns him, sears him to the very bone. But he will not let her go. Today, the World Breaker unbreaks his world. As the Hulk plunged downward, the lava burned away every inch of his skin. The magma tore down through his throat and lungs, burned out his eyes, ate through his flesh, and cooked the marrow in his bones. He saw himself dying in liquid fire as this brutal world tore itself apart and killed everyone he'd fought so hard to protect for so long. But that just made him angry. His raging flesh reformed and burned again, and reformed and burned again. And that just made him angrier. His flesh knitted back together, his bones grew stronger in his fury, and he plunged deeper and deeper until he reached the great fault beneath Crown City. His fingers traced the crack in the stone. His bones ached from the unfathomable reverberations of the splitting plate, and he knew this task he had given himself was impossible. Once upon a time, he'd held up a mountain, but to pull these plates back together would require a thousand, maybe a million times more strength. It couldn't be done. Everyone would die, and the Hulk would burn to nothing, and the Red King would scream with laughter. And that made him even angrier. Kyera knelt on the ground, palms pressed against the stone. The buildings around her shook and cracked as the earth screamed and buckled and shifted. And then was still. She looked up at Korg, her face blank. He did it. Of course he did. He's the Hulk. But you said he couldn't. <laughs> I was just making him mad. He seems to work best that way. Right, Greenskin? The silhouette of the Hulk's massive form rose up toward them through the magma. <laughs> the lava couldn't kill him. He was far too strong for that now. But it had burned out his eyeballs and skinned him alive a thousand times. No one on the planet had ever known so much pain. 
And as his regenerating eyes locked on the Red King hovering in the sky overhead, his rage boiled over. All right, then. The stone man seized the Hulk's hand, and in one great heave, <laughs> flung the green scar skyward toward the Red King. 20,000 citizens, refugees, soldiers, and insurgents stared up at the sky, holding their breath. The Hulk sailed through the air, drawing back his massive fist. The Red King raised his remaining armored arm and fired a thousand pulse bullets in three seconds. But the Hulk just grinned as the bullets exploded against him. And then he swung. Windows shattered throughout the city. The Red King sailed out over the city walls, over the smoldering remains of his wall of fire, and sank straight into the palm of a great curl of spores rising up from the sea of spike flesh. Spike sank into the Red King's flesh. The searing pain ripped through his brain, and he thought of judgment and the black void of death, but he was not afraid. Then it occurred to him that he had never gotten the manifest from the pleasure cruiser. His stomach nodded with helpless anger. His father's laughter echoed through his exploding brain, and he was gone. No pleasure cruiser still flew that could broadcast the death of the Red King to the world, but breathless citizens sprinted through the city with the news, and within minutes, Tong Tong drummers had climbed the highest towers to beat out the Imperial Death Song. In the Northwest Quadrant, the oligarchs huddling in their great estates, protected by their private guards, listened to the dirge and measured their courage. Within an hour, about half of the oldest families had saddled up their dramas and fled for their summer castles near the Philian border. The rest shuttered their windows and doors and hoped for the best. Emperors had come and gone, and they had endured. Once they figured out what the Green Scar really wanted, they would negotiate and adjust, and life would go on. But in the center of the city, the Hulk ripped down the doors of the prisons, Korg smashed open the royal food hordes, and Eloe and Meek oversaw the stripping of the captured Imperial soldiers and the ritual burning of their flags and feathers. Kyera and Heroine chased off looters and rioters and posted trusted rebels to guard the palace, the courthouses, and the libraries as thousands of people poured into the streets to cheer and feast and celebrate. And then the Hulk disappeared. Kyera and Korg found him in the palace hours later, in the middle of the night, hunched on a massive stone chair in the nearly pitch-black science hall, a ripped curtain draped over him like a cloak. He gazed blankly across the room at a battered alien shuttle propped up on blocks, surrounded by analytical machinery. Tiny lights flashed on the shuttle's exposed control panels and monitors, providing the only illumination in the room. Kayera and Korg paused in the doorway of the chamber, overcome with a strange foreboding. They'd gone through so much at the Green Scar's side. Now he sat just a room's length away, but somehow it felt like a thousand stone steps separated them. How are you, Greenskin? Noise floated up through the window from the massive crowd in the great arena down below. But the Hulk seemed to have lost the strength to turn his head to see for himself what was going on. Mm -hmm. What's all that noise? They're celebrating your coronation. Oh, your idea? Korg smiled. The Hulk did not. You know me, Korg. Why are you doing this? Because I know you. You could have left us so many times, but always you returned. That's why the people stay. That's why they celebrate together, so many clans as one, in peace. I don't know about the Sakarsan or the Worldbreaker. I pray to my lord, and try to do the right thing by everyone and leave it at that. But prophecy or not, they know you will not leave them, Greenskin. And you know it too. Come down and show your face. The Hulk flinched and hunched in his throne, pulling the cloak more tightly around him. A faint green glow backlit his silhouetted profile. Kyera raised an eyebrow and left the doorway, stepping into the room to see the Spike Fathers hunched in the shadows on the other side of Hulk's throne. They writhed and spun, their bodies pulsating as their spiked appendages probed deep into the Hulk's limp left arm, glowing green as they gorged on his energy. Kyera gazed into the Hulk's listless eyes, and her heart pounded as she realized 
But this planet still might have the strength to kill the strongest one there is. How could... no! Green glowing spike spores pulled away from the glistening bodies of their fathers, floating out the window toward the spike horde out in the valley. <sighs> this is why the spikes are so quiet. What the fathers take from the green scar they give to their children. So now everyone can live in peace. Except the Hulk, of course. But he can't... He can't bear every burden of this world. <clears throat> Says who? Sensing the Hulk's faint movement, the Spike Fathers tightened their grip on his arm and dug their tendrils deeper into his flesh. His right hand clenched the arm of the throne. <clears throat> Kyra found herself stepping forward and laying her hand on his. He leaned toward her, his face wrenched with pain, and she pressed her forehead to his. But when a spike tendril curled around the Hulk's neck and angled itself tentatively toward Kyera, the Hulk pulled away from her, drawing his cloak over his shoulders, bearing the burden alone. Gore gazed at the Hulk from the doorway as Kyera left the room, head down, heart pounding. May the Lord heal all your cracks, King Hulk. Throughout the night, the Hulk slouched on the throne, staring at the shuttle that had brought him to this world. But the longer the spikes fed on him, the duller his gaze became, until finally his eyes rolled back and slid shut. The spikes pulsed and glowed and swelled. The Hulk shrank. His green skin turned dull gray, and finally a sickly tan. <gasps> Bruce Banner jerked his arm away from the spiked, gelatinous monstrosities hunched at his side. The Spike Fathers rolled a few feet away and squatted, fat and shimmering, processing the energy they had siphoned. Banner stumbled off the huge stone throne, rubbing his arm, and then pulled up in shock before the shuttle. His eyes flickered over the same blinking lights that the Hulk had stared at for hours. But where the Hulk just saw random flashes, Banner instantly saw patterns. A message. He lunged for the keyboard beneath the main shuttle monitor. Seconds later, the monitor flickered and flashed, and Amadeus Cho's image stared down at Banner in shock and elation. Banner! What the heck took you so long? <sighs> Hush. Banner frantically fumbled with the volume knob on the monitor. Okay, sorry. You look crazy. Where's your shirt? Is that a curtain? You in danger? I don't know. I... <laughs> look, I figured out a way to get you home. You know that great portal that sucked you in? How do you know about that? I'm awesome, that's how. Listen up now. I figured out a way to reverse its polarity. So instead of sucking things from our galaxy and bringing them to Sakaar, it'll suck things up from Sakaar and bring them back home. But this is a one-time deal. The whole portal will collapse within two minutes of my reversing it. So we gotta set a time. I trigger the portal, you get your butt up in the air, and we bring you home. Banner stared at Amadeus in shock. He opened and closed his mouth twice. What's the matter? I... I don't know. Amadeus stared at him, then gave him a wry, hard look. Dude, can I talk to the Hulk? Listen, Reed Richards, Tony Stark, and all those other so-called heroes tricked you into a shuttle and shot you into space. Then they got so busy, they didn't even bother to check if you reached the destination they planned for you. Which you didn't. I don't know everything that happened since then, but from what I was able to monitor, I gather some aliens made you a slave and a gladiator and killed God knows how many of your friends. Now, I don't know about you, but if it was me, I'd want to get the heck out of there and maybe have a few stern conversations with a few folks back home. Never stop making them pay. Okay, that's one way to put it. All right then, one week from today. Get in the sky and I'll bring you home. Throughout the night, Kayera sat on a rocky outcropping a stone step from the palace, watching as glowing spores floated out the Hulk's window, sailed over her head and dissolved in the gelatinous mass of the spike horde behind her. Periodically, she reached out with the old power, feeling her way through the earth to the palace and up to the chamber where the Hulk sat. She listened to his heartbeat. She lunged up in panic, thinking the spikes had finally killed him. But then it surged and found its old rhythm, and she returned to her rock and waited. By morning, enough spores had dissolved into the spike core to give the entire mass a gentle green glow. The undulation subsided, 
The spikes were sleeping. Kaira set her jaw and headed into the palace. The Green King sat on the throne, hunched under his cloak. The Elder still glommed onto his arm. Hoku, enough. I'm the Hulk. I can take anything. But the Spike Fathers twitched. <sighs> his exposed hand turned pallid and gray. Kaira stepped forward, alarmed, and he drew his hand back under his cloak. Hoku! It's all right, Kaira. As long as they feed off him, no one else dies. Him? I mean, me. The Spike Fathers pulled away from the Hulk. The air suddenly felt electric. He stood, letting the cloak slide off his broad green shoulders, and Kaira felt his heartbeat reverberate through the floor. He watched the Fathers send green spores winging out over the valley, then turned to Kaira. How about some breakfast? The Green King walked barefoot out of his palace, wrapped in a torn cloak like a common servant, and made his way to the market with Kaira at his side. Imperials and Hivers paused in their business, stared and beamed. Children cheered and growled, doing their best Hulk imitations as they ran at his heels. The king walked among them, as no king ever had. And when his stomach growled... Your Highness! Break bread with us? The Hulk took the platter she offered, and Kaira bent her head when the woman bent hers. For this food, for this peace, for these friends... We give thanks, O oh Prophet. The woman beamed as the Hulk raised the bread to his mouth. But before it touched his lips, a plume of fire blossomed over the horizon. While the Green King was suffering in his palace with the spikes, Eloy, Meek, and the Brood had scouted the city, taking note of which streets and estates in the Northwest Quadrant were still manned by Imperial soldiers or private guards. They'd sent the fifth prefect in the robes of an oligarch servant to talk his way past a few gates. It hadn't taken long to learn who was planning the first counter-revolt. Eloy led the charge against the estate of Imperial Senator Safan Kirgo. First, she shouted out a perfunctory demand for surrender. When the guards who hunched behind the barricades answered with a grenade, she just laughed, swung her fire rifle like a bat, and clubbed the bomb back in their faces. She burned down four more guards with her fire rifle, and led her soldiers into the senator's mansion. She found Senator Kirgo in his dressing room, trying to strap himself into the armor he'd worn 20 years ago during the first Spike War. He babbled when he saw her, protesting his innocence and tearfully reminding her that he'd sent flowers when she'd won the vaulting championship in her last year of school. Then the fifth prefect arrived with letters from the senator's study confirming his plans for insurrection. The senator lunged for the window, and Eloy made a show of drawing her sword but she fumbled with her grip just long enough to let him escape. The senator was no fool. As he made his way through the city, he doubled back, twisted and turned, and changed his outer robe three times. But Meek and the Brood tracked him from the air to the shuttered Senate Hall, where he was meeting with seven other traitorous oligarchs and 113 armed guards. They were preparing for war, so Meek gave it to them. When Eloy arrived, Meek was mopping up, ripping down the doors of every room in the Senate Hall and killing anyone who raised a weapon. His shell was spattered with the black blood of Imperial oligarchs and soldiers, and his chem was bleak and sour, full of rage. Eloy wallowed in the stink, grinning as she drew her sword and kicked in a door. An older woman in silk robes raised a knife, and Eloy knocked her to the ground. But the woman stared up at her in shock as an impossibly old scent surged over Eloy. The smell of late summer, baked eggs, and salt grass. Eloy, mother? Kala Kaifi, wife of Ronan Kaifi, mother of Eloy Kaifi, and headmistress of the Chilean campus of the Imperial School of the Arts and Sciences, <clears throat> pulled herself up from the floor and brushed off her robes with as much of her old dignity as she could muster. What are you doing here? I thought you were at the school. I moved here after the spikes returned. It seemed safer. By the prophet girl, what have you done with yourself? Eloy's mother stood and reached for her daughter's bangs with a tight, disapproving frown. It was a gesture that Eloy had known all her life. Suddenly, she was nine seasons old again, awkward and anxious, aching for approval. Kill them all! Meek lunged forward with his spear. <coughs> Eloy spun, blocking his blow with her sword. 
Eloi hacked again, knocking the spear from his hands. She's my mother, Meek! Your mother? Helping the Emperor's people? But they killed your father! He died in the maw! Eloi stared at Meek, at a loss for words. Despite all he'd been through, Meek had the heart of an innocent. He'd loved his father, he'd loved his queen, he loved his hive. Those things would never change for him. How long would it take to explain to him the concept of divorce? The division of a family, the failure of love. She thought of her mother screaming at her father, breaking the wedding pots, and storming away in the night. She thought of her father holding her close, telling her everything would be fine. She thought of the first holiday passing without a hiver egg, because her father didn't know he was supposed to bake one. And then she flushed red with horror and guilt, as the memory of the sweet taste of egg and the blasted eyes of the Hiver Queen washed over her. Meek cocked his head, staring at her strangely. Eloy avoided his eyes and turned to her mother. Why are you here? With these traitors? They weren't traitors yesterday. Her mother drew herself up, tall and imperious, always the headmistress. Come on! You must have known I was here. You could have come to me. Why? The Emperor was insane, of course. He had to go. Eventually. But not the way you and your friends did it, Eloe. We are still blooded Imperials. This world belongs to us, not the bugs. This bug, knowing your stink. <laughs> Eloe spun toward him, sword drawn. <laughs> but Meek clubbed her aside and lunged at Kalakaifi. <laughs> How many of us you slaving? How many of us you killing? <laughs> His claws sank deep into Kala's arms drawing black blood. Now we killing you, back! <laughs> Eloi swung her sword, breaking the blade on Meek's jagged shell. Meek spun, dropping Kala and lunging for Eloi. <laughs> Eloi hoisted her fire rifle and aimed as Kala scrambled behind her daughter. Don't make me do it, Meek. Meek stared at her, <sighs> and his eyes glazed over as his face fell. Wait. Meek smelling. Meek smelling you. <laughs> You lying! <laughs> lying all this time! No, no! Giving it now! You eating our eggs, <laughs> our hope, our no. death! How no. many babies you eating? How many queens you killing? Ah! He charged. Eloe raised her fire rifle. The Hulk slammed into the ground between them. <laughs> he smacked Eloe's gun from her hands. Then he turned to block Meek's charge, holding him back with one hand. Enough! Kyera dropped down behind the Hulk. The war is over! We're building a nation now! Yeah! A nation for the puny pinkies! The Imperials killing us! He grabbed at Kala, but Eloy swung her sword, blocking his claws. Stop! You are all dying today! All you puny pinkies! Killing us forever! Now it's your turn! You want to just slaughter us all in cold blood? You think that fixes everything? You happy doing it before? Remember Primus Band? You cut his throat while he crying for mercy. Like you said, two hands. Never stop making them pay. <sighs> Heloe wiped the tears from her face. A hundred emotions boiled inside of her, screaming to be let out. She set her jaw, stared at Meek, and chose anger. Touch my mother and I'll never stop making you pay. The Hulk stared at them, smelling the hate boiling in the air. Fine, we'll do it your way. After the Green Scar stole the Stone Starship, the first Shadow Elder had nearly lost her position on the Council. But she had successfully argued that without the starship, the Green Scar would have had precious little chance of defeating the Red King, and thereby freeing the Shadow from a hateful treaty that had brought them more shame than a free people should bear. But now the Green Scar was king, and the First Elder's chances of remaining First Elder would depend on just what kind of king he might be. So on the second day of the Green King's reign, the First, Second, and Third Elders of the Shadow entered Crown City by the Southern Gates, which still hung blasted and broken on their hinges. Citizens and visitors streamed in and out with no guards to check their persons or papers. Accustomed to the open desert or the wide, cool council towers of the shadow, the elders flinched every time a pedestrian bumped into them. 
The first elder could run ten hours through the hottest desert sands without breaking a sweat. But the grime and bustle of Crown City exhausted her after ten minutes. After asking seven different civilians, each of whom gave a detailed and entirely misinformed answer based on the latest rumors circulating in the streets, they discovered that the Green Scar was holding court in the Great Arena. So they headed through the twisting, crowded streets, losing their way three times before finding the main entrance. We are the Elders of the Shadow. We come to hold council with the Green Scar. He's the Green King now, and you're gonna have to wait. We're a bit busy right now. The elders headed up the staircase the guard indicated. The first elder drew a sharp breath as she stepped out onto the upper deck and gazed down at the arena below. Meek stood on one side of the sand, flanked by his hivelings. Eloway stood on the other, backed up by a dozen red-skinned warriors. Hiroim and Korg stood between them, grim and grieving. Hundreds of spectators sat in the stands, watching intently. You've picked your opponents. Now you'll fight to the death, according to the customs of Imperial Sakaar. Iloe, Meek, this is your last chance. Drop your weapons and walk away. But neither Meek nor Iloe met his eye, nor said a word. They just stared at each other across the sand. So be it. This is Holku's new world? You were right about him, First Elder. So full of hate. The first elder just stared down at Heroin as he inclined his head in prayer, and she mouthed the words along with him. May the prophet forgive and embrace you. The spectators in the stands held their breath. Eloway and Meek circled each other in the sand, studying each other coldly, eyeing for weakness and picking their angles. Then Meek's foot caught on a rock, and Eloway lunged forward. Meek spun, barely parrying her blow. <laughs> The Shadow Elders turned in shock as a green blur flashed past them, and the green scar thundered from the Emperor's box to the floor of the arena. He swung a massive mace, knocking Eloe up into the air. Then he spun with his left fist, slamming Meek back to join her sprawling in the sand. As they scrambled to their feet, the Hulk charged them, swinging his mace. Fight me! Meek and Eloe crouched, staring at him in shock. Or die! No! Two hands! Meek leveled a spear. But the Hulk was upon them, running straight into Meek's spear, spilling green blood onto the sand. Meek's hivelings and Eloi's warriors charged, raising their swords and spears. The Hulk turned to face them, arms wide open, and grinned as they ran him through. Then he spun, wrenching away, twenty spears and blades jutting from his body. They fell back, shocked. He stared down at them grimly as blood pooled beneath him. This fight is over! He fell to his knees. Aleha all vines curled up from his blood, twined around his fingers and arms. We are all war-bound now! Embrace your brothers! Or I swear I'll kill you all myself. He cocked an eye at the people in the stands. All of you! Meek and Eloway stared at the Hulk in stunned silence. Then they turned to face each other. You never smelling like you again. I know. <sighs> I'm so sorry. And she was. She could never make it right. But she could fight to never make it wrong again. They would forever look upon each other with shadows of sadness and anger. But they were still warbound and also merely bound, as they all were, trying to share this world without killing each other quite so much. <sighs> so they embraced. The Imperials and Hivers on the battlefield stared at them, a little dazed, then slowly reached out to each other, touching fists and roughly clapping each other on the back. The First Elder gazed down, a small smile cracking her lips. New world indeed. Three hours later, the Hulk's wounds had healed enough for him to meet the Shadow Elders in the banquet room of the Imperial Palace. The Elders nodded to Korg, touched foreheads with Kaira and Heroim, and poured everyone present a finger of their ceremonial thornbush wine. Then they got down to business. You stole our starship the last time we met, Hulku. 
But after a review of the evidence, the council agrees that you put it to excellent use. The emperor's treaties died with him. So we come to establish a shadow treaty with you. The terms are simple. You guarantee our ancient lands and rights. We pledge mutual support in the case of domestic invasion. And we provide you with a shadow guard. Kyera the Old Strong was the Emperor's right hand. If you are agreeable, she could- No. No shadow guard. I want a queen. Kyera stood up, hands on the stone table, staring at some indeterminate location a bit below the horizon. Her skin crackled to stone, then back again. If she'll have me. Hook. She looked up at him. He extended his hand. She took it, and they walked from the room. Core guide Heroim and the Shadow Elders, his amber eyes twinkling. I believe we have ourselves a treaty. The oldest royal handmaid had a bad ankle, so she told the younger servants she was just too damn creaky to run when they saw the Red King's shattered body sail out over the city walls, but once the others had fled, she'd calmly opened the Red King's private liquor cabinets and drunk an entire bottle of Chilean White while lounging in his chair. Then she'd walked through the palace and smashed every buster carving she found of his sneering face. By her count, as she told everyone for many seasons thereafter with great satisfaction, there were 352. She'd always hated the Red King. He was an impulsive child who killed his enemies whenever he liked, even directly over the white Trizelskin rugs in the music room. The younger servants had accepted that as the way of the world, but the oldest royal handmaid had served under Angmo the Great, a big-hearted funny tyrant who gave his servants and slaves the day off on his birthday. Angmo only killed people in the torture room, with the laminated tiles and drain. When Korg discreetly asked the oldest royal handmaid about a chamber suitable for the new king and queen, she'd taken Kaira to the master bedroom. But the old strong didn't even enter the chamber. She just wrinkled her nose at the stale scent of sweat and perfume that rose from the silk sheets, then headed down the stairs of the tower. The oldest royal handmaid hobbled after her, suggesting alternate rooms along the way, each with lovely views. But the shadow only seemed to grow comfortable once she reached ground level. In the end, she descended into the basement and found a cool grain storage chamber carved into bedrock. She laid a palm on the smooth stone floor and smiled. Call my husband. When the Hulk entered the chamber, Kaira was kneeling on the floor, facing a small stone stand containing a crystalline orb that glowed with gentle blue fire. She turned to gaze up at him. Will you kneel with me as I kneel with you? The Hulk stared at her. He had knelt in the great arena, beaten down before the Red King. He had knelt at Primus Van's feet as the blaze of his obedience disc burned his brain. But tonight, for the first time he could remember, he knelt of his own free will. Kaira extended her hand over the blue flames rising from the orb. Will you burn with me as I burn with you? Pain ripped up his arm as he reached out, but he stared into her eyes holding her hand as the fire scorched them both. The flames became unbearable, searing him to the bone, but still he held on. And then the pain disappeared, and the fire flickered cool against their unharmed skin. And will you bear your true face and soul to me, as I bear mine to you? She gazed at him, probing and searching. There was no judgment or suspicion in her green and black eyes. But he knew she could tell he was hiding something. He fought the urge to grunt and look to the side. He couldn't lie to her, not now. So he just stared back at her, his eyes filling with doubt. Hulk who? I must know you. All of you. Show me. He took a breath and closed his eyes. In his mind's eye, he gazed inside himself, searching for the thing in the dark. The tiny, terrifying, terrified voice that was always screaming no. But all he heard was silence. And then he saw the thing kneeling quietly in the dark. 
It turned to gaze up at him. Its eyes showed no fear, no anger. It just gave him a quiet smile. Yes. All right. He squeezed Kaira's hand. <sighs> and his body turned strange and gray, then tan, and seemed to melt away, vanishing in layers like vapor, until he sat before her, puny and thin as a ghost. Who? <gasps> I'm... Bruce. You asked. So the Hulk let me out. He wanted you to see him. All of him. All of... us. He hesitated, then blinked and looked straight into her eyes, suddenly at peace. All... of me. She held her breath, terrified to be holding this creature's thin, fragile fingers. She gazed into his strange brown eyes, saw nothing she recognized, and her heart keened with despair. But then she closed her own eyes, reached out through the old power as she had so many times before, and listened. Through the stone, she heard his heart. So much quieter, so much fainter. But it beat as steady and true as ever. She opened her eyes and gazed into his, and saw that this ghost was a man, her man, forever and ever. She leaned in to kiss him. <sighs> And the vapor swirled, and his heart boomed, as he wrapped his great green arms around her. He is the Hulk, who became Holku. The Green Scar, who became the Green King. The monster, who became a hero. He wanted to be left alone. Now, he leads a nation. And every voice calls his name. Kaira awoke with a cool wind in her hair, but she felt her husband's arms around her, warm and strong. Then she opened her eyes and saw the clouds and the graceful amoebids drifting past. The Hulk smiled at her as they sailed through the sky. He held her tight as they descended to a ridge, and he flexed his legs to absorb the impact so that she barely felt it. He set her down, slid his arm around her waist, and together they gazed out over the steps cool blue and purple in the moonlight. What are we doing here, husband? He nodded toward the steps. You told me once this was a place of peace. That if I went in there, I'd never have to fight again. What are you saying, Hoku? Maybe... Maybe we should just go. She touched his chin, turning his face to hers. <sighs> She pressed her forehead against his. I hate kings. This whole thing is stupid. You don't have to fear yourself, husband. Never again. You don't understand. They call me the Sakarsan, the savior. But I know what I am. The world breaker? The destroyer of all? Look out over the steps, Hoku. We fought near this land, remember? You bled here. And now... The sun broke the horizon, and golden light spread over the valley. The plains where the Hulk had raged and bled now were a tangled forest of Aleha all vines, grown to the size of trees. Trizels grazed in the lush, verdant grass around the borders of the forest. Enterprising Imperial and Hiver gatherers, working side by side, waded through the undergrowth, picking fresh yellow gourds. You don't want to run away. You don't want to be left alone, because this is your home. Today you're the Green King. Tomorrow, who knows? But this is where you belong. With your people. Your wife. And all our children and our children's children. Until the day we die and the Earth takes us in. And we give ourselves to stone to rise again over the plains and crumble together to sand, and rise again together until the end of time. The Hulk didn't understand, but he understood. <sighs> On the seventh day after the Hulk first let the Spike Elders feed, 
the second and third assistants of the dearly departed science minister, finally repaired the launch system of the largest Spike starship. The Spike elders glided out over the Sea of Spores and flew into their ship, and their children followed. Meek and the Brood hovered together by the hatch to the ship, Keming with the Spike elders, passing on their thanks and benedictions to the Green King and his people. Heroim prayed on behalf of all those killed in the two Spike Wars, and thousands of assembled citizens wept for their lost loved ones. Eloi and her mother solemnly watched the ceremony together, thinking their own conflicted thoughts. They still couldn't look each other directly in the eye, but they stood close enough that when the fifth prefect caught sight of them across the field, he idly wondered whether they might be related. Then the Green Scar and Kyera climbed onto a floating disk and rose with a Spike starship as it launched into the air. They stayed with it until its second burners fired, and it rocketed up through the stratosphere and out toward a new home in the stars. The Hulk and Kyera floated through the clouds, gazing out over the landscape, hands touching side by side on the railing of the floating disk. Their work lay before them, etched in the land. Philia lay to the far north, still full of danger. The Wildabot still roamed the Chilene Plains. And somewhere in the wilds, in some forgotten cave or valley, a Hiver Queen was surely waiting. Then Kaira pointed. The great portal twisted in the sky on the horizon over the debris field, pulsing with strange new energy. She felt its pull like a magnet, and their floating disk scudded through the clouds, veering at a tilt, drawn closer and closer to the swirling vortex. The Hulk stared at the great portal with strange eyes. Kaira felt his heart surge, and heard the bending of metal as his fingers contracted around the railing of the floating disk. What is it, husband? He turned to gaze at her. She saw his fierce anger, righteous and true, and her heart surged with love for him, and fury for whoever had wronged him. He heard her heartbeat, steady and forever, ready for anything. He could have it all, he realized. He could embrace all that anger and revenge and blood. He could descend to Earth as a conquering emperor with his avenging wife at his side, shocking Amadeus and all the puny humans with righteous wrath beyond anything they could ever have imagined. Or... The Hulk gazed into Kaira's steady eyes. And he smiled. The great portal shuddered and warped, and its strange pull faded. The Hulk and Kaira leaned shoulder to shoulder, sharing their warmth with each other floating back through the pink clouds toward their people. I could tell you more, but every prophet knows if you spin a story long enough, everything falls apart and comes together and falls apart and back again. So today, your father held my hand and I held your father's heart. And the scroll ends here. Because this is the story of the Green Scar, the Eye of Anger, the World Breaker, the Hulk, and how he finally came home. This has been a graphic audio production of Marvel's Planet Hulk by Greg Pak. Copyright Marvel. Unauthorized download and or duplication is prohibited. Narrated by Richard Rowan and starring Bradley Smith as Bruce Banner, the Hulk, Ken Jackson as Meek, Kara Novak as Kyera, Scott McCormick as Korg, Bruce Allen Rauscher as Heroim the Shamed, Kimberly Gilbert as Elloway, Lolita Horn as Brood, Zeke Alton as the Red King, and Alejandro Ruiz as the Silver Surfer. With Peter Holdway, Jason B. McIntosh, Chris Gannabach, Lily Beacon, Terence Aselford, Jacob Yeh, Michael Glenn, Christopher Sheeran, David Jordan, Dylan Lynch, Evan Casey, Eric Messner, Thomas Keegan, Eva Wilhelm, Drew Kopas, Nora Ashradi, Katie Karkoff, Thomas Penny, Marnie Penning, Michael John Casey, Angie Cornette, Greg Pack, and Jeff Allen as Reed Richards. Directed and adapted for graphic audio by Scott McCormick. Produced by Rick Rowan, Dwayne Beeman, and Matt Webb. Executive producers James Cutting, Mary Cutting, and Angie Cornette. 
Dialogue editing and graphic audio sound design by Patrick Stratton and David Zitney. Planet Hulk theme composed by David Zitney. Special thanks to Jeff Reingold, Jeff Youngquist, Sarah Brunstad, Caitlin O'Connell, and David Gabriel. If you enjoyed listening to the audio presentation of Marvel's Planet Hulk, you can read it and other Marvel prose novels in print or ebook editions. Visit www.marvel.com for more information. Can't get enough of the Hulk? Be sure to check out Marvel's Secret Wars and Avengers, Everybody Wants to Rule the World, as well as over two dozen other great Marvel titles available in graphic audio at www.graphicaudio.net. Listen anytime, anywhere with the Graphic Audio Access app, available for all Android and Apple mobile devices. Google Play is a trademark of Google Incorporated. Apple, the Apple logo, iPad, iPhone, and iPod Touch are registered trademarks of Apple Incorporated. App Store is a service mark of Apple Incorporated. 